Lord of the Mysteries 2, Audiobook, Part 2 Chapter 26, Whistleblowing The lady nibbled on a croissant before answering Lumian's question. I do. She really knows. Lumian's heart leapt with hope. He deliberated over his words before asking, using honorifics to show his respect, may I offer to pay a certain price to commission your help in solving Kordu's problem? From his point of view, this mysterious lady woman was much stronger than Leah and her companions. If she agreed to help, the problem with Kordu would be solved, and he and his sister wouldn't have to risk their lives to escape. But he was worried that he couldn't afford the price. Lumian wasn't optimistic that the woman would agree to help. But he felt it was necessary to try. Even if he was rejected, he wouldn't be too embarrassed. He was not a stickler for such things. The woman turned to him and spoke calmly, I can indeed solve the problem here, but the corresponding price is that everything will be destroyed, including you. If you want a better outcome, you can only rely on yourselves. Lumian's eyes widened in disbelief. Could the problem with Korda be that serious? He searched the woman's face for any sign of jest, but found none. He wasn't surprised or disappointed that she refused to help. What shocked him was the severity of the problem. It could even lead to the destruction of the entire village. He was puzzled and alarmed by the situation. Since she can resolve it, why is it that the entire village will die? while us ordinary people and beyonders who aren't strong enough capable of producing a better outcome. If he didn't hear back from Novel Weekly by the day after tomorrow, he would urge his sister to leave Kordu immediately. He couldn't delay any longer even if it meant taking a huge risk. He had to act fast. What's the problem? Lumian pressed, his dignity never a priority. The lady smiled. Me telling you and you finding out through your investigations will give rise to completely different results. Lumian gritted his teeth instinctively. He didn't stand her behavior of always holding back something. For some reason, he sensed that peculiar feeling in the woman's eyes, something he couldn't quite put his finger on. Okay. Lumian paused for a moment, weighing his words carefully. Do you have any information about Madame Puali's? Is she a warlock, a, uh, a beyonder? The woman lifted her coffee cup to her lips and took a small sip before answering, yes, she is. Indeed. Lumian asked further, what pathway, which sequence? The lady's expression turned serious in an instant. It's not a normal pathway. What do you mean it's not a normal pathway, he pressed. The lady smiled. You'll find out later. I want to know now. Lumian struggled to keep his expression in check. Already standing and about to leave, Lumian suddenly remembered something crucial. Madam, how am I supposed to bring those supplementary ingredients into the dream? In the dream ruins, he could only find basic ingredients like red wine and basil in the dream ruins, but for the red chestnut flower and poplar leaf, he would have to collect them in reality. The task wasn't impossible, and Lumian had already thought of a way to borrow them but he knew it would all be for naught if he couldn't transfer them to his dream. The lady smiled and said, I'll offer you a little assistance again, free of charge. Find those materials in reality, put them on the table in your bedroom before you sleep. I'll help you send them into your dream. She can send those things into my dream? Lumian was first shocked before feeling a wave of relief wash over him. At least his problem was solved. He never thought he'd encounter someone else with the ability to enter the special dream world like he could. Lumian couldn't shake the feeling that his ability to enter dream ruins had something to do with the cryptic symbols etched onto his chest. As he gazed at the woman before him, he couldn't help but wonder if she was connected to those same markings or that bizarre and terrifying voice that had been echoing in his mind. Lumian had just left the old tavern and had plans to collect the red chestnut flower and poplar leaves. But as he turned the corner, he saw Ryan, Leah, and Valentine exiting the back door of the tavern. They were still dressed in the same clothes and outfits. Lumian's heart skipped a beat as he greeted them with a smile. Good morning, my cabbages. Leah turned her head and laughed amidst the tinkling sounds. You're early, too. 
Lumian tried to act sneaky and looked around before speaking in a hushed tone. I noticed something unusual yesterday. Ryan's expression turned serious as he exchanged glances with Valentine and Leah. What is it? Lumian's voice quivered slightly as he spoke. I suspect that Naroka's death is abnormal. You attended her funeral yesterday. Ryan gave Lumian an encouraging look to continue, and Lumian took a deep breath before proceeding with his suspicions. I told you about the funeral customs in the Dirige area, didn't I? After everyone went to the cemetery, Pons Benet entered Naroka's house without any objection from the owner. Isn't this destroying the influence of their family's horoscope and taking away the corresponding good luck? There must be something wrong. Pons Benet, the brother of the Padre? Ryan thought for a few seconds and asked. Lumian nodded heavily. As Lumian thought about the Padre's strange group and his impending departure from Cordu, he realized he had nothing to fear from speaking his mind. With a deep breath, he declared, the Padre is not a good man. Why do you say that? Leah asked with a grin, clearly unsurprised by Lumian's criticism of the Padre. Not one for formalities, Lumian launched into a detailed account of a villager who had snitched in Dirige and subsequently vanished. His focus was on the accusations against the Padre, and he held nothing back. Finally, he said, I really question how he's a clergyman of the church. One time, I said something that was deemed too real, and I had to hide temporarily in the cathedral. I was about to doze off behind the altar when the Padre walked in with Madame Puales. And let me tell you, they were doing the dirty deed right under the deity's gaze. In the conversation that followed the deed, the Padre even lamented to Madame Puales, saying, Why can't a man marry his sister? Madame Puales was appalled by his words and begged the Padre to repent. However, the Padre said, Many wealthy families lose their fortunes when their daughters marry and their sons start families. But if a son could marry his sister, these problems would disappear. Unfortunately, the law and morals don't allow it. Dot. The frigid Valentine's face contorted with anger at the news. Is he a servant of God or a servant of the demon? Ryan nodded as if in thought. No wonder Pons Benet hasn't been able to start a family despite being married after all these years. Leah surveyed Lumian as she chuckled. You knew about Madame Puales and the Padre's affair. You wanted to use us that day. Lumian's smile was uneasy, but his tone was resolute. As a believer of the eternal blazing sun, I cannot tolerate such a person in the cathedral. The cold Valentine's expression softened, and he nodded approvingly. If only Corda had more people like you. A few more like me? Lumian shuddered at the thought of Cordu Overrun with more people like him. He continued, that time, I overheard the Padre warning Madame Puales that he was planning something and might be targeted by the Inquisition. He told her to be careful and keep quiet. Ryan's expression turned solemn. Did he say anything more about it? No. Lumian didn't fabricate the matter. He couldn't risk saying more than that. If he did, trouble could erupt tonight. He wasn't even a beyonder yet. After bidding farewell to the trio of foreigners, Lumian spent hours gathering red chestnut flowers and poplar leaves. As the sun neared its apex, Lumian arrived at the village square and made his way to the two-story building where official business was conducted. Most of the villagers had already gathered, eagerly awaiting the selection of the spring elf, an important part of the upcoming Lenten celebration tomorrow. Squeezing through the crowd, Lumian spotted Raimund, Ava, and the others. Is Ava on the list? he asked. Ava remained silent, her agitation palpable. Raimund shook his head. We don't know. She must be on it, interjected Guillaume Berry, a frequent companion of Lumian and the others. Among the unmarried women in the village, other than your sister, she's the most beautiful. Your sister doesn't meet the age requirements. He was the Guillaume Jr. that Lumian and the others were talking about. He hung out with them frequently. Guillaume had curly brown hair and prominent freckles on his face. His blue eyes seemed to narrow because they weren't large enough. Ava's cousin, Azema, also stood nearby, looking much like Ava but smaller and less striking. She remained silent, 
but Lumian sensed her desire to be chosen as the Spring Elf as well. In the Dirige area, being chosen as the Spring Elf was a coveted honor that not only recognized a person's beauty and character but also came with hidden benefits. Upon hearing Guillaume Jr.'s words, Lumian grinned. If Ava's not on the list, I'll shout, I vote Ava, when the administrator finishes reading it. Ava blushed. You don't have to do that. It was a normal process for villagers to shout out additional candidates after the administrator finished reading the list of nominees for the Spring Elf. However, not many had the nerve to do so. Lumian, however, was not one to shy away from such things. He had no misgivings about this. Ava will be the one being embarrassed, not me. Shortly after, Administrator Beast appeared at a second-story window, looking far more put together than the Padre. His neatly combed brown hair, light blue eyes with black lines, straight nose bridge, thin lips, and well-groomed mustache conveyed his status, accentuated by his double-breasted flannel coat. He gazed down at the assembled villagers for a moment before speaking. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time. Those who are late will no longer have the right to vote. Next, I'll read the list of candidates for the Spring Elf. Ava Lizier. As Beast read out the list, Ava breathed a sigh of relief. Unsurprisingly, she received over 80% of the votes. After the voting, Lumian made an excuse about needing to go home and left without celebrating with his companions. Upon arriving home, he immediately asked his sister, Did we receive a reply? If they had, the telegrapher would have delivered it and collected a fee. Not yet, Aurora replied, shaking her head. She then said, the undercurrents have been turbulent lately. You can't let your guard down during combat practice. Speaking of which, we'll spar in the afternoon. Lumian winced, feeling sore all over. But then an idea struck him. He put on a pained expression and said, I don't know if it's because I've been training too hard but my whole body hurts today. Aurora, ah, uh, sister, can you give me a massage? You're the most skilled at it. Aurora nodded. Sure, I can do that. Under the skilled hands of his sister, Lumian's body finally began to recover that night. Before drifting off to sleep, Lumian placed three red chestnut flowers and some powdered poplar leaves in a bottle on the table in front of the window. He gazed at the bottle for a long moment, his heart beating with anticipation and nervousness, before finally crawling under the covers. Chapter 27 Five Changes As Lumian awoke in the gray fog, his first instinct was not to check his physical condition. Instead, he sat up abruptly and looked at the table by the window. There, bathed in the soft light that filtered through the thick fog, were the three red chestnut flowers and the glass bottle of poplar leaf powder. She really sent the supplementary ingredients in. Relief flooded Lumian. He got out of bed and stretched, delighted to discover that the pain in his neck and back had vanished, along with the general discomfort he had been feeling. Just as I hoped, I'm fine in the dream when I'm better in reality even though the injuries on both sides aren't equal at all. He quickly walked over to the wardrobe with the full-length mirror, took off his shirt, and examined himself. The five bloody finger marks, the bruises, and the blood clots were all gone. This made Lumian wonder if killing the Beyonder monster had been nothing more than a dream. Thankfully, the crimson object in the cloth bag, the slightly larger sum of money, and the shotgun next to his bed confirmed the reality of his experience. Lumian's heart eased. With the cloth bag containing the crimson item and a large amount of money, he left the bedroom and went straight to the first floor. Grabbing a bottle of red wine and a beer mug, he headed back up with some basil. He made sure to bring along a measuring cylinder and miniature scale that his sister Aurora had purchased for him. Looking at the desk filled with all the necessary items, Lumian felt both excited and nervous. With everything in place, all that remained was to concoct the potion. Potions were not beverages. They were more dangerous than alcohol, capable of killing or transforming the drinker into a monster with the slightest mistake. Lumian took a deep breath and exhaled slowly, his hands steady as he used the measuring cylinder to pour 80 milliliters of red wine into the beer mug. 
Next, he added 10 grams of basil, 5 grams of poplar leaf powder, and a single red chestnut flower. The process proceeded without incident. The red liquid in the mug had a few more dregs and a floating flower, but otherwise looked unremarkable. With the cloth bag of crimson substance at his side, Lumian watched intently as the object slid into the beer mug. Without a sound, the dark red blob seemed to dissolve rapidly, drawing in the surrounding liquid in the process. Bubbles erupted, and the entire mug turned a deep shade of red. The red chestnut flower had dissolved completely. This is the hunter potion? Lumian gulped and picked up his beer mug. The supernatural power he had sought for so long was finally within his grasp. Without hesitation, he took a deep breath and steeled himself for what was to come. Raising the mug to his lips, he drank the potion in one swift gulp. The pungent odor of blood filled his nostrils, and he started hearing things. As he set the mug down, a searing pain ripped through his body, so intense that Lumian wondered if he had swallowed a ball of fire. The flames seemed to burn through his esophagus, stomach, heart, lungs, intestines, and blood vessels all at once. At the same time, a strong scent of blood wafted up from his throat. Lumian fought to remain conscious, remembering the lady's warning that fainting would mean defeat. He knew the stakes were high, and the outcome was obvious if he failed. His head swam as he lowered it, gazing at the bright red veins protruding from the back of his hand. The pain and burning came in waves, but they quickly began to recede. But just as he thought it was over, a mysterious voice echoed in his mind, as if coming from both infinitely far away and right beside him. The sound was like steel thorns piercing his brain, stirring it forcefully. Suddenly, the near-death experience he had faced before returned, and the pain and burning flared up once more. Lumian gritted his teeth and clenched his fists, feeling as though something was trying to claw its way out of his flesh. The gray fog around him seemed to thicken. The terrifying sound that had filled his ears slowly faded away, and the writhing of his flesh and blood vanished like an illusion. The excruciating pain, the burning sensation, and the metallic scent of blood dissipated, leaving Lumian gasping for cold air as he regained control of his body. He bent over, hands on his knees, panting heavily as he realized the true dangers of pursuing supernatural powers, as his sister had warned him. A mere sequence nine potion had nearly claimed his life. Of course, it at first seemed manageable, dangerous, but manageable. But the mysterious voice that had been brought on by the symbol on his chest had almost caused him to collapse at the critical moment. Each breath he took seemed to restore some of his strength, and before long, he felt fully recovered. Bang! Lumian clenched his fist and swung it hard, striking out at the air with a force that caused a sonic boom. He had never imagined possessing such power before, and the realization filled him with excitement. In his small bedroom, he practiced a combat technique his sister had taught him, each punch producing a crisp sound. Bang! 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 Despite the commotion, Lumian moved with precision and control, not touching anything as he completed the set. To his surprise, he felt neither tired nor fatigued, but rather energetic and alive. He assessed his condition, on par with Aurora. In terms of strength, speed, reaction, or body control, they've all been greatly enhanced. It's a little inhuman. I possess the strength of a bear and the agility of a cat. It's slightly equivalent to the combination of the two. Without the potion, I might never be able to reach this level of power in my life. But before he could finish his inspection, Lumian caught the scent of blood, his heart tightening with fear. Instinctively, he sniffed the air and realized that he could determine the source of the blood, it came from his body. Lumian looked down and saw that the back of his hand was covered in blood-red spots. He came to the full-body mirror again and realized that his face was similarly stained. He wiped some of the blood away, but found no sign of any wounds. After a moment's thought, Lumian came to a realization. Did the potion cause the capillaries Aurora talked about to burst? And then they quickly healed after I absorbed the potion? The only explanation for his current condition was supernatural influence. Realizing he was not injured, Lumian pushed the matter aside and focused on his sense of smell, which seemed to have undergone a significant change. 
As he concentrated, the scents around him were decomposed and drilled into his nose in various forms. The smell of blood, the residual smell of alcohol, the fragrance of flowers, the smell of dust. Lumian began identifying the scents around him one by one, even the slightest ones not escaping his heightened senses. Simultaneously, he saw invisible footprints and the distribution of dust in the bedroom, heard the beating of his own heart and the breeze outside the house. The second change is that my sensory abilities have increased exponentially, surpassing the standards of ordinary humans. No wonder the monster he had encountered was so skilled at tracking. Lumian was delighted. More importantly, this improvement did not interfere with his daily life and only appeared when he focused. It only took the form of a weaker version. Through experimentation and self-examination, Lumian discovered two other changes brought on by the Hunter Potion. The third change allows me to accurately locate certain points in his environment, such as weak spots in a wall, enabling me to set traps more efficiently and kill my enemies, be they humans, beasts, or monsters, more effectively. The fourth change is that I have more knowledge about wild plants and animal organs, allowing me to survive better in the wilderness and quickly find hemostatic medicine when injured. I can even make poison to smear on weapons if needed. As he confirmed these newfound abilities, Lumian couldn't help but feel a sense of absurdity. I actually managed to kill that shotgun monster. The current me is much stronger than the previous me, and it was not much weaker than the current me. Lumian contemplated for a while and concluded two crucial points. Ability is important, but brains are equally important. Exploiting a good environment can effectively increase my strength. After some thought, Lumian added inwardly, also, I can't be careless and lose my patience at any time. He walked to the window and gazed at the dream ruins again. An indescribable sense of oppression, fear, and danger surged into his heart. This was something he had never felt before. Ah, the fifth change is some kind of intuition strengthening. Lumian nodded gently. He went to the washroom and washed his body with clean water. He changed into a fresh set of clothes and then lay back on the bed, with the money close. He wanted to get back to reality as soon as possible, eager to know if the hunter abilities would stay with him or if they would be weakened. In the dead of night, Kordu was eerily silent. The clouds shrouded the crimson moon and stars, leaving the darkness to reign supreme. Lumian surveyed the night scenery and felt an overwhelming sense of happiness. He was now a beyonder in the real world and his powers hadn't weakened at all compared to the dream realm. As an intuition struck him, Lumian unbuttoned his shirt and gazed down at his chest. The black symbol resembling a thorn chain was slowly fading away. It also appears in reality. Lumian muttered, feeling a twinge of unease. He noticed that the bluish-black symbol that had loomed over the thorny chain existed only in his dreams. Suddenly, Lumian's heart skipped a beat as he gazed up at the nearby elm tree. The legendary Owl of the Warlock was perched on a branch, observing him quietly. Chapter 28 Laws The brownish-yellow eyes of the owl glowed in the dark, fixating on Lumian as it perched on the branch. Lumian was no longer as intimidated as he was during their previous encounters. He yelled, what you looking at? Say something if you dare. Lumian didn't have to provoke the owl, but he hoped it would reveal the owl's true motive. He couldn't bear the thought of the creature lurking around and staring at him in the dead of night. To his surprise, the owl remained silent and didn't make a sound. After a few tense seconds, the owl spread its wings and flew off into the darkness. Crazy! Lumian let out a frustrated curse, but he didn't dare let his guard down. Lumian remained focused on scrutinizing the dark shadows outside, trying to detect any signs of danger. He recalled that the last time the owl had appeared, he had seen Naroka's figure and learned of her death the following day. I wonder if something similar will happen this time. But after careful observation, he didn't notice anything abnormal and breathed a sigh of relief. He drew the curtains and lay back on the bed. In the deep darkness, Lumian opened his eyes contemplating his next move. I wonder what this owl is trying to do. It's acting so strange and mysterious. It shouldn't be up to anything good. 
whatever. With the situation in the village, I have to leave with Aurora as soon as possible. I don't believe that it can follow us to try her. If I don't receive a reply tomorrow, we'll leave Kordu the morning after tomorrow. If there's a reply, we can leave Kordu openly from the village entrance. If not, we'll have to improvise. It's Lent tomorrow, and everyone will still be celebrating the day after tomorrow, so we won't attract too much attention. Aurora can borrow Madame Puali's pony and spend some time in the nearby alpine pastures. We don't need to go down the mountain, so it shouldn't attract the investigators' attention. When the time comes, we can use a dangerous trail to leave the mountain. The path is treacherous, with several broken parts in the middle. Even the shepherds don't think it's passable. However, with my newfound abilities and Aurora's witchcraft, allowing her to fly a distance, she'll have it easier than me. There's a good chance we can hoodwink the investigators. Becoming a hunter had allowed him to do what was previously impossible. It gave Lumian a newfound sense of confidence, allowing him to quickly formulate a plan. His heart became more certain, and he slept soundly. The next morning, Lumian rose early and got to work in the kitchen. His thoughts turned to how he had become a beyonder and how he was about to leave the abnormal village of Kordu with his sister. Lumian's mood brightened, and he even found himself eager to hum a tune. When Aurora came downstairs, there were already two bowls of minced meat noodles on the table. How did you know I was about to get up? she asked, pleased. I started cooking noodles when I heard movement in the washroom. Lumian grinned, inwardly noting, you are always in a groggy state after waking up. How did you realize this? Aurora nodded. As she sat at the dining table, she casually asked, that all flew over again in the middle of the night. That's right. Lumian knew that his sister had discovered him looking out the window, so the owl's appearance had been a fortunate distraction. Otherwise, he wasn't sure how to explain himself. He couldn't risk telling Aurora about his newfound beyonder abilities just yet, as he would be given a dressing down by her. However, Lumian planned to divulge the truth to his sister sooner than later. He wanted to avoid Aurora from having considerations that might hinder their escape. He planned to tell his sister about this the day after tomorrow when they escaped from Kordu to prevent her from diverting her attention to take care of him. By then, she wouldn't have the time to give him a dressing down. Aurora furrowed her brow in confusion. What a strange owl. She was still trying to decipher the bird's true intentions, all it did was come over to take a look. Lumian slurped up the last of his noodles, then turned to his sister. If there's a reply, we'll leave Korda this evening and take the usual path down the mountain. If not, borrow a pony from Madame Puali's tomorrow morning and we'll head to the nearest alpine ranch. I know of a trail that leads down the mountain, and the investigators won't be aware of it. Aurora fiddled with her hair, deep in thought. After a while, she grinned and said, sure, the probability of this plan succeeding is quite high. She clicked her tongue and added, my stupid brother has grown up. Lumian couldn't help but feel smug, basking in his sister's praise. After breakfast, Lumian made an excuse to go see if Ava was finished with her Spring Elf Blessings tour. He left the subterranean building and headed straight to Old Tavern. As a newly minted beyonder, Lumian was eager to gain more knowledge, and the lady had promised to share some with him. Not far from the tavern, Lumian spotted an old acquaintance walking towards him. It was Pons Benet, the younger brother of the local padre. He's alone. Lumian couldn't help but smile at the thought of how he had been chased by Pons and his thugs in the past. Having just obtained supernatural powers, he was already eager to test out his new supernatural powers. Hey, my illegitimate son, Lumian greeted him. How dare you go out alone without daddy's permission? Lumian hoped to provoke Pons and goad him into a fight instead of letting him run. Pons Benet looked in the direction of the voice and saw him. The villain's expression changed slightly. He turned to run away. Thud. 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 Lumian watched in disbelief as Pons sprinted away, disappearing at the intersection not far away. He sure ran fast. Quite an alert one. Lumian sighed silently. 
he knew, without a shadow of a doubt, that he could take down Pons Benet in a one-on-one -on -one scrap, even before he ascended to beyonder status. But it seemed likely that Pons Benet had the same notion. The two of them had never properly thrown down, but they both had confidence in their own abilities. So, it caught him off guard when Pons Benet bolted the second he caught sight of him today, like he'd come face to face with a bloodthirsty beast. It's impossible for him to know that I secretly became a beyonder last night. Is he so dense that he's developed animal instincts and can sniff out danger? Lumian slandered Pons Benet in his heart. He refrained from pursuing Pons Benet because he regretted the moment he greeted him. The village was riddled with aberrations, and the situation was perilous. Lumian knew better than to stir the pot before he left. If he had pummeled Pons Benet, the Padre and his goons might spring into action prematurely, thus jeopardizing his and Aurora's escape. It would be too late for regrets when that happened. Furthermore, the Padre's group was an enigma, and there could be something off about Pons Benet. Lumian suspected that if he engaged in fisticuffs with him, his Beyonder identity would be exposed, and that would spell trouble in the future. Being a Beyonder has made me too haughty and overconfident. I need to rein myself in, Lumian mused, reflecting on his behavior, as he entered Old Tavern. He had intended to head straight to the second floor, but his eyes landed on the lady seated in the corner. Today, the lady was garbed in a pearl gray dress and a light colored lady's bonnet. Lumian noticed that there wasn't any food in front of her. Have you had breakfast? he asked, taking a seat opposite her. The lady replied nonchalantly, Not yet. I'm meeting someone here, and I'm still waiting for her. Her? Not me. Lumian scanned the area but saw no one else except the tavern owner. He looked at the lady again and sincerely said, I've become a hunter. It's time for you to keep your promise and give me more common knowledge. The lady wasn't surprised at all. She remarked with a smile, it seems you're in pretty good shape. She spoke in a voice that sounded almost otherworldly, what you need to master now are two laws and one method. Why does it feel like I'm studying physics? Lumian didn't dare speak his thoughts aloud. The lady continued to speak, for most beyonders, this knowledge is incredibly valuable. They trade everything they have just to acquire it. But for you, fate has brought you here, and so I'll give it to you for free. Free things often come at the most hefty price. How will I pay the price? Lumian felt a weight settle on his shoulders. Ever since he became a hunter, his intuition and observation skills had improved significantly. He could sense a strange, indescribable emotion in the lady's eyes, much stronger than before, but he still couldn't put a finger on what it was. The lady straightened up. All supernatural powers come from the oldest one, the Creator. As a believer of the eternal blazing sun, you should know that his eyes became the sun. Dot. Yes. Lumian had heard the Padre's sermons about it before. That's a symbolic description, the lady clarified. In essence, the oldest one created this world and many deities. Eventually, he disintegrated himself and split into beyonder characteristics of different pathways. So that's why they're called the Paths of the Divine? Lumian connected the dots. The lady nodded slightly. Yes, every pathway sequence zero is equivalent to a true god. For instance, the Bard pathway sequence zero is known as the Sun, which is also the eternal blazing sun you believe in. Lumian was surprised and a little apprehensive. So every beyonder can become a god in the end? If he were a devout believer of the eternal blazing sun, he would have accused the lady of blasphemy. But he wasn't that kind of person. He was just a casual believer who didn't give it much thought. He even asked, what's the hunter pathway sequence zero? And what about the mystery prior pathway? Didn't I already tell you? It's the red priest, and the position is currently vacant, the lady replied with a chuckle. As for the mystery prior pathway, the sequence zero is known as the hermit, and it's currently occupied by an evil god called the Hidden Sage. He likes to impart knowledge to beyonders of the same pathway, earning him the nickname Knowledge Pursuer. Your sister's troubles stem from him. Is that so? Lumian felt a twinge of dislike towards the Hidden Sage. The woman redirected the conversation. 
since beyond our characteristics come from the oldest one, they won't disappear or increase. They only transform from one form to another, moving from one object to another. This is known as the law of beyond our characteristics indestructibility or the law of conservation. Chapter 29 Method Lumian put his physics knowledge to work and pondered for a moment. Why not just call it the law of conservation? That's another law, but don't worry about the details for now. The woman nodded in agreement. Essentially, it's the same as the law of indestructibility, but with additional prerequisites and specific elaborations. Is that so? Lumian considered for a moment before speaking. So, according to the law of indestructibility, if I want to obtain beyonder characteristics, I can target other beyonders, in addition to hunting the corresponding monsters? Since beyonder characteristics were indestructible, a beyonder's death would result in the appearance of the corresponding beyonder characteristics. The woman's face showed a certain amount of emotion. You're very perceptive. Therefore, this law isn't suitable for most beyonders to know. It would result in beyonders killing each other, and they won't be able to trust each other. Lumian didn't mind this. Even without this law, humans still kill each other. In the real world, there's plenty of suspicion, bullying, and murder. The woman replied with interest, but at least there's still a certain warmth and light of the human spirit. Lumian pondered for a while before speaking. Looking at it from another perspective, this law should become a consensus among beyonders. That way, the weak can be prepared in advance and not become easy prey for those who know. The lady nodded slightly. That does make some sense. Actually, if battles between beyonders happen frequently enough, people involved would likely be able to figure it out. She then introduced, the second law is called the law of beyonder characteristics convergence. Convergence. Lumian struggled to understand. He couldn't quite derive it from their earlier conversation. The woman's expression turned serious. As the creator of this world, even if the oldest one splits into beyonder characteristics of different pathways, it doesn't mean that he has completely withdrawn from the stage. His mind is scattered among the different beyonder characteristics and will never be obliterated unless this world completely perishes. These minds are similar to a brand but they have the instinct to reassemble and revive the oldest one. In other words, after you become a beyonder, you're more likely to encounter other beyonders than before. You're more likely to encounter beyonders of the same pathway or neighboring pathways than beyonders of other pathways. This is the convergence of fate. The higher the sequence, the more obvious this situation becomes. Lumian had many questions, but he decided to start with the most important one. So. Combined with the law of beyonder characteristics indestructibility, can I conclude that convergence leads to massacres? The lady once again revealed an approving expression. You're very perceptive on such matters. It's not a problem when your sequence is low, but at the demigod stage, especially after becoming an angel, you must find a way to weaken or avoid the effects of convergence. Demigod, angel? Lumian was surprised and intrigued upon hearing these terms even though he knew that every sequence could eventually become a true god. The lady casually explained, demigod is a term for beyonders from sequence 4 to sequence 1, meaning half god, half human. Among them, sequence 4 and sequence 3 are known as saints, while sequence 2 and sequence 1 are called angels. There are other names beyond that, but it's best if you not know them for now. Saints. Angels. Lumian thought of the saints and angels from different regions. They were real. The remains of a saint are the corpses of saints. There are beyonder characteristics left behind? Lumian asked, feeling a little afraid, so every beyonder characteristic has the mental imprint of the oldest one, and the higher the sequence, the more is left behind? Wouldn't the person who consumes the potion be affected in other ways? The lady confirmed with a smile, yes. Why do you think this path is filled with danger and madness? Losing control is one of the main reasons why consuming a potion can be so dangerous. To be specific, it's losing control of supernatural powers in one's own mind and transforming into a terrifying monster. Is there another reason? 
Lumian pressed. The lady tersely grunted. Firstly, the intensity of the mental imprint mainly depends on the level of the owners of the corresponding beyonder characteristics. Their obsession and madness before death also contribute to it. Secondly, consuming the potion in the wrong order or method can cause a huge conflict in the body. Thirdly, some existences can use the consumption of potions to exert influence. For example, every time the mystery prior pathway consumes a potion, they passively receive knowledge installation from the hidden sage. Similar to the voice I heard after drinking the hunter potion, Lumian deliberated for a moment before recounting his encounter truthfully. Which entity's influence is that? The next second, he saw the expression of the lady opposite him become a little odd. She said solemnly, some existences can corrupt and take control of you just by knowing of their existence. Unfortunately, the owner of that voice is one such existence. It's not suitable for you to know their honorific name at the moment. Lumian's mind raced with thoughts. That horrifying? A sequence zero true god? But most people in Intus and I know about the eternal blazing sun and the god of steam and machinery. There's nothing wrong with them. Could there be a difference between a true god and an evil god? But she mentioned the hidden sage, who is also a sequence zero. Is it possible she doesn't know who it is and is using vague terms to mask her ignorance? He gave up on the topic, considering his own strength, and asked about another intriguing term. What is a neighboring pathway? The woman's expression returned to normal as she explained, under normal circumstances, if you choose a pathway and consume the corresponding potion, you can only go down that path one step at a time. Otherwise, you will definitely lose control, or at the very least, half lose control. However, there are always exceptions. Every pathway has one or more neighboring pathways. You can jump over at a specific sequence, such as sequence 4, which divides between humans and demigods. Hunter's neighboring pathway is assassin. Assassin. Sounds cooler than hunter. Lumian asked with concern, which pathways neighbor mystery prior? Will one no longer be affected by the hidden sage after jumping to a neighboring pathway? The savant pathway. The current sequence zero is the god of steam and machinery, the woman replied calmly. After jumping over, one will still be affected by the hidden sage, but the degree will decrease significantly. However, the corresponding beyonder characteristics still exist unless one finds a way to expel them. How? Lumian asked, surprised. The easiest way is to have children. In mysticism, there's a high chance of transferring the corresponding beyonder characteristics to a child through heredity, the woman explained. Alternatively, you can use the special abilities of certain pathways, but there's a certain risk, and you have to pay a considerable price. Lumian nodded before raising another question. Can I switch only at a particular sequence? The chances of reaching sequence 4 and becoming a demigod were slim. The lady glanced at him. In theory, it's possible to switch at a lower sequence, but the risk of losing control is much higher. Unless there's no other way, it's best not to attempt it. The woman paused before saying, I've finished explaining the two laws. Now, I'll explain the method. This is one of the most important pieces of knowledge in the mystical world. Most important? Lumian instinctively straightened his back, feeling abnormally focused. The lady continued to speak, it's called the acting method. It's a way to help you digest the potion. By digesting the potion, the risk of losing control will be greatly reduced when consuming the next sequence potion. It's no wonder I can't drink the sequence 9 potion today and drink the sequence 8 potion tomorrow. I have to use the acting method to digest the previous potion. Lumian came to a realization. He did not interrupt her and listen attentively to her explanation. Remember, it's digestion, not control. What's the acting method? It involves acting according to the name of a sequence like an actor. By reconciling the differences between one's body and the remnant mental imprints of the beyonder characteristics, one can obtain the corresponding recognition. This allows them to bypass the barrier that originally existed and fuse the beyonder characteristics with themselves. So, I have to act like a hunter and hunt in the mountains every day? 
Lumian asked attentively. Lumian appeared as attentive as a student. The lady shook her head. That's just the most superficial form of acting. We not only have to understand the surface meaning of a sequence's name, but we also have to investigate its deeper meaning. For example, the city is also a jungle. Everyone is both prey and hunter. I'm familiar with this. Lumian was already familiar with this concept, which he had learned during his days as a vagrant. How can you be sure that you have digested the potion and can advance to the next sequence? Lumian asked curiously. The lady smiled. You will sense it when the potion is truly digested. All right. Lumian didn't continue the topic and asked in puzzlement, who named the different sequences? Why could he digest the potion just by acting them out? The lady's expression turned serious. The earliest sequence divisions came from the remnants of the oldest ones splintering. It was a stone slab filled with mystical knowledge. As it involves the secret of becoming a deity, it's called the Blasphemy Slate. In ancient times, during the end of the second epic and the entire third epic, a powerful deity close to the oldest one appeared. He was called the Ancient Sun God. After he perished, a second Blasphemy Slate was born from his remains. All the current sequence names and potion formulas came from it. That's not the second and third epic history I learned. Lumian muttered inwardly. The lady continued to speak, when Emperor Roselle was alive, he used the second blasphemy slate as a reference to create a cards of blasphemy set based on tarot cards. There are a total of 22 cards, and each card represents a pathway of the divine. Lumian was astonished. Emperor Roselle is also a beyonder. As an ordinary intision, it was difficult for him not to feel a certain amount of admiration for Emperor Roselle. The woman laughed. Otherwise? Lumian asked, was he powerful? Almost a deity, the lady said concisely. That amazing? Lumian was stunned but felt that it was only right. He thought for a moment and said, then, wouldn't the diary left behind by Emperor Roselle be very valuable? The lady nodded. Yes, but there are very, very few people who can decipher those strange writings. Lumian fell into deep thought. Aurora seems to have some of Emperor Roselle's diary transcripts in her collection. She seems to be able to decipher them. Could it be that a portion of her strength comes from there? Chapter 30, Lent Begins The woman turned her head to look out of Old Tavern's window. It's about time. I'll end this with giving you some pointers. Based on the law of beyonder characteristics indestructibility, we know that humans and beyonder characteristics combine to become beyonders. Similarly, creatures and beyonder characteristics combine to become beyonder creatures. But what about items that combine with beyonder characteristics, she asked, not giving Lumian a chance to answer. They are called mystical items. As items don't have will, spirit, and self-control, coupled with the combined effects of other factors, after they fuse with beyonder characteristics, they will not only display corresponding special abilities but also bring about very strong negative effects. The various churches tend to seal them and use suitable methods to activate them when needed. This is why mystical items are also called sealed artifacts. The mystical items that have been sealed by the various churches have their own serial numbers and are divided into four grades, 3, 2, 1, and 0. The smaller the prefix number, the higher the danger. Among them, there are a limited number of level 1 and 0 sealed artifacts that are extremely dangerous. The serial numbers are common to the various churches and won't be repeated. Lumian muttered, Level 0 sealed artifacts. Lumian had a deep impression that sequence 0 was equivalent to a true god. This led him to make a certain connection and ask, are these sealed artifacts formed by fallen deities or exterminated evil gods? He had noticed that there were 22 pathways with sequence zeros, but the number of deities clearly didn't add up. However, Lumian also recognized that his lack of understanding of evil gods and secret existences might have caused this confusion. Not all of them, the lady replied after thinking for a moment. Most of them are at the level of angels. Only a small number have the ability to kill gods. Lumian nodded. 
I understand. I won't underestimate the items in other people's hands. The woman added, you can't underestimate the negative effects of sealed artifacts either. In the future, you will definitely come across sealed artifacts. Oh, and there's another category of items in the field of mysticism called extraordinary items. They are made by beyonders of corresponding sequences using their abilities, spirituality, or with the help of the spirit world or deities. They don't contain beyonder characteristics, but they have a certain level of supernatural effects. However, their strength will gradually dissipate over time. Charms, lotions, and other items can only be used once. In comparison, beyonder weapons are more stable and can be used for years. As a hunter, you lack the ability to deal with spirit body ghost type creatures before sequence 7. If you have the chance in the future, consider obtaining the corresponding sealed artifacts or beyonder items. Lumian listened carefully and asked, the spirit world? He had seen this term in Hidden Veil, but it did not provide sufficient explanation. The woman quickly explained, from a mystical point of view, this world is divided into three levels, the real world, the spirit world, and the astral world. The rest are formed by attaching to one of these three, like the underworld. I don't need to explain much about the real world, you already know it very well. The spirit world is a place where spirits reside, and many concepts of reality no longer exist there. You will gradually understand it in the future. As for the astral world, it originally referred to the world of gods, but now, the entire cosmos needs to be included in that definition. Lumian was just asking casually, but after obtaining a preliminary answer, he immediately returned to the previous topic. Can a hunter create beyonder items? He asked, thinking that warlocks could probably do it. The lady shook her head before saying, hunters can't rely on their own sequence, but because their spirituality has been enhanced, they can learn ritualistic magic and pray to a deity or a hidden existence. They can use their responses to create charms, weapons, and other beyonder items. However, I have to remind you that most hidden existences are very dangerous. It's best not to attempt praying to them. Otherwise, death would be the best outcome. And the seven orthodox gods basically won't respond to you unless you join the corresponding church and become an official beyonder. In other words, it's impossible for a hunter to create a beyonder item? Lumian asked, feeling somewhat disappointed. The lady smiled and said, not really. On the one hand, you can use the blood and saliva of certain beyonder creatures to create poisonous weapons. In a sense, this can be considered a beyonder item. On the other hand, after you unlock the secret of the dream, I'll tell you the honorific name of a great existence. You can pray to him. Lumian was shocked and suspicious. This was the first time she had used the word great as an adjective. He had never heard her use it to describe the eternal blazing sun or the hidden sage. Who could this great existence be? Was it safe to pray to him? The more he learned about mysticism, the more he realized how little he knew. Lumian tersely acknowledged her answer and asked, What are the corresponding sequences 8 and 7 for hunters? The woman replied indifferently, Sequence 8 of the hunter pathway is called Provoker, and Sequence 7 is Pyromaniac. All right, that's all for today, she said as she stood up and walked towards the entrance to the second floor. After a few steps, she stopped and said over her shoulder, I forgot to remind you. Remember, you're just acting. Just acting. Lumian mulled over her words and thoughtfully asked, What if you take the role seriously? You will become less and less like yourself until one day. The woman smiled and closed her mouth before turning around walking to the stairs, and disappearing. She didn't finish her sentence again. Lumian muttered silently. He sensed that forgetting he was only acting would have serious consequences. Lumian sat quietly in a corner of Old Tavern, reviewing the general knowledge the woman had just taught him to prevent forgetting anything. The more he thought about it, the more he realized the importance of the two laws and one method. They are like the main framework of mysticism. Everything else is derived from them. I wonder if Aurora knows. After leaving Cordu, I'll discuss this problem with her. Ah, uh, I wonder if that lady will allow me to inform Aurora of all these directly. 
As Lumian left Old Tavern, he looked back and muttered to himself, why haven't those three foreigners taken action yet? It's already Lent today. He continued to ponder as he made his way to the village square. After he finished asking if there was any reply, he saw Ava, Raimund, and the others approaching. Ava was wearing a long white dress with a round headdress made of branches and flowers on her head, and a huge necklace hung around her neck. Brown branches and green leaves adorned her back, arms, waist, and legs, making her look like a fairy in the forest. She was the main character of Lent, the spring elf. Raimund and the other lads surrounded Ava, each carrying a basket woven from tree branches filled with grass, soil, rocks, leaves, and other items. Lumian, the blessing tour is about to begin. Ava exclaimed when her aqua blue eyes saw him. Her face was filled with joy. Raimund and the others also looked happy. Come on, let's go get the contributions. Since Novel Weekly had not yet replied, Lumian had nothing to do for the time being, so he decided to join the procession. The young lads began singing loudly as they surrounded Ava and walked out of the square. After about ten meters, they stopped in front of the first building. Lumian walked to the door and banged on it. The spring elf is here. The door creaked open and Naisley appeared in front of them. She was the other female head of the family in the village, in her forties with the prefix na, her black hair was tied up, and her blue eyes were smiling. As the door opened, Ava took two steps forward, spread her arms, and began singing. I'm the elf of spring, with a sweet face and a joyful ring, bringing happiness to everything, in this season so charming. Come and sing, come and dance, let's celebrate this time of chance, for this is the only way, to bless the land and make it stay. After the song, Ava took a clump of soil from Raimund's basket and handed it to Naisley. Thank you, Spring Elf, Naisley said, receiving it with a smile and handing a piece of cloth to Ava. Bumper harvest. Bumper harvest. Lumian and the other lads replied in unison. This was a blessing ritual. The Spring Elf used singing and the giving of soil grass, rocks, and other natural things to the villagers to bless them with a bumper harvest this year. The villagers needed to give something back as a contribution, or the blessing would become a curse. After Raimund received the cloth, Ava sang another song enthusiastically. Only then did they bid farewell to Naisley and head to the next house. A portion of the dedications received during the blessing tour would be thrown into the river in the waterside ritual, and the rest would be placed in the final ritual. After Lent was over, the girl who was the embodiment of the spring elf had the right to choose some to take away. This was a considerable gain. If Corda really experienced a bumper harvest this year, Ava, as the embodiment of the spring elf, would be widely believed to have received the love of the elves and blessings of spring. Whoever married her would have bumper harvests all the time. In that case, she had a chance of marrying someone from a good family. The blessing procession sang all the way to Lumian's house, where Aurora opened the door. She had changed into a light-colored pleated dress with a straight collar and had bunned her blonde hair. Ava walked over and sang the same song again. I'm the elf of spring. Aurora listened with a smile and handed Ava a small pottery jar. Thank you, spring elf. Lumian glanced at the jar of animal lard and felt that his sister was too generous. They had no farmland except for a small vegetable field at the back of their house and did not need to worry about the harvest at all. Chapter 31 Celebration Despite feeling the usual pinch, Lumian didn't stop his sister as Ava, Raimund, and the others turned around and walked towards the nearby buildings. He deliberately fell behind and whispered to Aurora, Call me if you hear back from Novel Weekly. Don't worry, I'll keep you updated, Aurora replied, giving Lumian a reassuring look. The festive and joyous blessing tour continued with songs as they knocked on the villagers' doors in Cordu. Finally, they arrived at the administrator's residence, which was modified from a castle from the Sauron royal era. It was located on a hill at the edge of Cordu, dark in color with two towering towers. The outer walls surrounding the building had long been torn down. Lumian and company passed through the garden specially created by the Beast couple and arrived at the entrance. 
The door was four or five meters tall, a brownish-green color like trees, and looked very heavy. However, it was divided into upper and lower parts and only needed to open the two-meter-tall part below unless welcoming esteemed guests. The spring elf was the embodiment of spring and the messenger of the harvest, so she deserved the most honorable treatment. At this moment, the heavy door was completely opened, and Madame Puali stood there in a light green corset. Her lady's maid, Kathy, stood to the side with a basket woven from tree branches, half a step behind. Ava walked over and sang a song of blessings. Madame Puali's listened quietly with a smile on her face, which made her look noble and reserved. The young men who followed the spring elf didn't dare to look at her, but Lumian, who had listened to the other party and the padre doing the deed, scoffed inwardly when he saw this. As the song ended, Ava exchanged the seeds of a tree for a basket of eggs. The blessing tour was over, and Lumian, Raimund, and the other lads escorted Ava, the spring elf, to the mountain river not far from the village for the second segment of Lent, the waterside ritual. Arriving at the place where geese were usually herded, Ava approached the clear river and did a simple dance, repeating the song from before. Meanwhile, Lumian and the other lads stood still, seven to eight meters away from the spring elf. After the dance, Ava took out a chopped turnip from a basket beside her feet, given by a particular villager, and threw it into the river. As she threw, she sang, A Bumper Harvest. A Bumper Harvest. When Ava was done, Lumian stepped on the ground and ran over in a few steps. He bent down and took out the cut turnips from the basket and threw them into the river. A bumper harvest. A bumper harvest, he shouted. The remaining lads were a tad slower than Lumian, but they rushed towards Ava, afraid of falling behind. They took out turnips and radishes from the basket and threw them at different parts of the river while shouting bumper harvest. Raimon failed to take the initiative and couldn't beat the others, so he was the last to complete the ritual. The next second, he saw the malicious smiles of Lumian, Guillaume Jr., and the others. They lifted Raimon up, shouting bumper harvest, and threw him into the water with a splash. Raimon was drenched from head to toe. The people on the shore even picked up soil and branches and threw them at him. This was part of the waterside ritual, the person who completed the last prayer would be thrown into the river and not allowed to go ashore. They could only swim a little further down and quietly return home to hide until it was dark. Raimund wiped the water droplets off his face and struggled for a few seconds before heading downstream. Only then did the team escort Ava to the eternal blazing sun cathedral at the edge of Cordus Square. It was almost noon. Most of the villagers, including Lumian's sister Aurora, had gathered at the cathedral, which was not as grand as those in the city. The tallest one was only eleven to twelve meters, with a dome and an arc that looked like an onion from the outside. Looking up from the inside, a dazzling sun mural greeted their eyes. The entire cathedral was golden in color and looked very bright, which was also the common style of all the eternal blazing sun cathedrals. The altar was located in the east, and all kinds of sunflowers surrounded a huge sacred emblem. On the surface of the sacred emblem, the golden ball and the lines representing light formed a symbol filled with mysticism, the symbol of the eternal blazing sun. High up on the wall behind the altar, there were two pure glass windows inlaid with gold foil. Every day, when the sun rose, the light would shine from here onto the sacred emblem. On the west side of the cathedral, there were two similar glass windows to take in the glow of the setting sun. As this was not a formal ritual of the church but a traditional celebration of the people, Padre Guillaume Benet did not appear. Instead, Administrator Beast hosted the celebration with Ava, who was still dressed as a spring elf, standing next to him. Musical instruments such as flutes and lyres sounded, and the villagers sang songs that praised spring and prayed for a bumper harvest. They hadn't rehearsed, so the singing wasn't uniform, and some people even sang and danced, making the scene lively. Lumian's mouth opened and closed, but he didn't make a sound, he was simply going through the motions. On the other hand, Aurora, who was beside him, was engrossed in her singing, taking the opportunity to have fun and raise her voice. As he was only going through the motions, Lumian had time to look around. He didn't notice any abnormalities in the villagers' behavior. 
he subconsciously looked up at the golden sun mural on the dome. Then he saw it, the thing he couldn't quite put his finger on. The villagers weren't praising the sun. For a village that worshipped the eternal blazing sun, this was strange. Words like praise the sun and my god, my father were staples of daily life, but Lumian realized he hadn't heard them in a while. As a quasi-believer in having skipped activities in the cathedral since crossing the Padre, Lumian hadn't thought much of it before. But something about the solemn and golden atmosphere of the cathedral made him realize that this was not normal. And then he remembered the letter of help that he had reconstructed, the urgent plea for assistance from someone in the village, we need help as soon as possible. The people around us are getting weirder. The people around us are getting weirder. At that moment, Lumian gained a deeper understanding and agreement with this sentence. Lumian's heart raced as he looked around, searching for Leah and the other foreigners. But they were nowhere to be found at this Lenten celebration. Seriously, they don't appear when they're needed. Lumian muttered inwardly. Lumian forced himself to join in the chorus, pretending not to notice anything out of the ordinary. Finally, the singing died down, and the celebration ended. Lumian whispered to Aurora, his voice urgent, go home first. I have something to tell you later. He knew he couldn't leave yet, as an escort for the spring elf, he had to participate in the final part of the ritual. He couldn't force his way out of the cathedral, risking an anomalous eruption. Aurora nodded thoughtfully. Okay. She didn't ask further and left the cathedral with Madame Puales and the other villagers, leaving Lumian behind. The cathedral was empty, save for Lumian and a handful of lads who had participated in the blessing tour. Ava, the embodiment of the spring elf, stood in the center of the room, surrounded by the contributions, symbolic items that hadn't been thrown into the river, herbs, axes, shovels, whips, and goose sticks. Lumian and his companions had to wait for someone to come in from outside and announce the departure of the spring elf before they could take off her crown, necklace, branches, and leaves. During this process, they needed to leave a gap for the spring elf to leave Ava's body. In just twenty to thirty seconds, footsteps echoed from the cathedral's entrance. Lumian instinctively looked up. Two figures entered the cathedral. The thin shepherd Pierre Barry had rushed back to attend Lent. His eyes were sunken, and he wore a dark brown long coat with a hood. He had tied a rope around his waist and was sporting new black leather shoes. But what caught Lumian's attention was that his greasy black hair was now clean and smooth. Even his messy beard had been tidied, and it was now neater and shorter than before. As usual, there was a faint smile in his blue eyes. The other man was Padre Guillaume Benet, adorned in a white robe with gold threads, befitting of his role as a clergyman. He had sparse black hair and a slightly hooked nose, but he exuded a dignified aura. Despite standing at less than 1.7 meters tall, he still seemed to tower over Shepherd Pierre Barry. The Padre. Why did he come? Lumian was surprised and puzzled. As a clergyman of the Eternal Blazing Sun Church, he had no business being here, at a folk celebration that didn't include a segment to praise the sun. Lumian's mind jolted as he recognized that the Padre and his group were previously up to something sinister, especially considering his past conflict with them. He quickly retreated to the side of the stained glass, moving slowly and silently to avoid drawing attention to himself. The group hadn't yet surrounded Ava, the spring elf, so they were standing in different places, making Lumian's actions inconspicuous. Ava was surprised to see the Padre, but she quickly remembered his importance in the village. It made sense for him to announce the end of the Lent celebration. She smiled once again. Padre Guillaume Benet and Shepherd Pierre Barry approached Ava, and the former spoke in a deep voice. Send the spring elf off. Other than Lumian, people rushed forward to surround Ava. Send the spring elf off. Shepherd Pierre Belly shouted as he bent his back with a smile. Not good. Lumian's heart raced as he stepped forward, his body reacting before his mind could catch up. But it was too late. Shepherd Pierre Barry picked up an axe from the pile of symbolic items, and with a tight grip and a powerful swing, the axe came cleaving down. Blood spurted from Ava's neck, forming a thick red mist. 
thud. Lumian watched in horror as Ava's head fell to the ground and rolled a few times in the blood, finally stopping, head facing up. She still had a look of joy in her eyes. Having just taken two steps in her direction, Lumian's heart sank. He immediately turned around and turned to flee towards the stained glass. Chapter 32 Anomaly The cloth, jars, and eggs that were splattered with blood, along with the sickening stench, failed to elicit a reaction from Padre Guillaume Benet. He turned his body and locked his gaze on a particular spot in the cathedral where Lumian's figure was reflected in his blue eyes. The color of the Padre's eyes shifted, turning so ethereal that they appeared transparent. Lumian was surrounded by complicated silver symbols that coiled around him like small rivers. He ran through an illusory river that was formed from these symbols, with blurry tributaries ahead of him. Guillaume Benet reached out his right hand and grabbed a mercury-colored symbol that encircled Lumian. Lumian stomped his right foot, preparing to hurl himself through the stained glass and out of the cathedral. But he slipped and couldn't muster enough strength, and his body was sent flying. With a loud bang, whoosh, and cracking sound, Lumian shattered the stained glass depicting Saint Sith, but he failed to break through it and instead crashed back into the cathedral. His body was covered in cuts, and blood flowed freely. Shepherd Pierre Barry, who had earlier decapitated Ava with an axe, locked onto Lumian. His gentle smile belied the ferocity in his blue eyes, as if a seal inside him had been undone, revealing his true nature. Pierre Barry charged at Lumian with the axe, his body seeming to grow taller and stronger with every step. Lumian leaned against the broken stained glass window, his back facing the ruthless shepherd. Lumian struggled to free himself from the pain of being stabbed as he fell heavily to the ground. As he propped himself up with his hands to roll out of the cathedral, an abnormal sense of danger washed over him. Someone's behind me, he realized. Ignoring the pain and blood, he continued pressing down on the broken glass window frame and pretended to roll out, using it as a cover to quickly retract his body and fall back instead of moving forward. Bang! Suddenly, an axe smashed into the window frame, sending it flying out of the cathedral with a loud bang. Lumian rolled backward, narrowly avoiding Pierre Barry's violent attack as he lunged past his feet. But he didn't feel relieved. Pierre Barry had blocked his only escape route, forcing him back into the cathedral. Despite having read countless novels, Lumian knew he couldn't rely on simply rolling to avoid getting hit. As he brushed past Pierre Barry, he quickly propped himself up with his elbow, exerted strength from his waist, and bounced up. He surveyed the scene and realized that, besides Guillaume Jr. and a few others, all the lads had lost their minds and turned deranged. They ignored Ava's headless corpse and the blood that stained the ground, shouting excitedly, Send the spring elf off! Send the spring elf off! Guillaume Jr. and a few others stood in shock, staring at Ava's wide, smiling eyes without moving. Fear, panic, and disbelief etched their faces, as if trapped in an unbreakable nightmare. Pierre Barry loomed over Lumian, appearing taller than the cathedral dome. His axe missed, but he quickly retracted it and swung at Lumian again. Lumian deftly dodged the attack and ran off despite not even finding his footing. Thud thud thud. Lumian fully utilized a hunter's speed and agility as he ran in an arc. Target, the Padre. He knew he had to deal with the leader, no matter how the others attacked him. He put on a fierce stance, determined to either let them allow him to flee or die trying with him. Only in this way could a miracle be created in a very unfavorable situation. Shepherd Pierre Barry didn't pursue Lumian. He stood in front of the broken window frame, holding his blood-stained axe and extending his left hand towards Lumian's direction. The cathedral plunged into darkness, and Lumian's surroundings grew even more ominous. Seemingly coming to life, the abyss swayed gently, like a curtain behind which pale white, pitch black, and strange arms were poised to strike. Padre Guillaume Benet's eyes were nearly transparent, with Lumian's figure submerged in an illusory river formed by shimmering mercury symbols. In front of him, he saw something similar but more surreal, as if representing the future or a tributary. 
After experimenting, Guillaume Benet's right hand finally grasped the key pattern formed by multiple symbols. With a single move, he could rewrite Lomian's future and render all his efforts futile. But suddenly, the Padre's eyes froze, and he let out a scream. His eyes shut tightly as blood and turbid tears streamed down his face. Amidst his scream, his body expanded like a balloon being filled with gas, and his white robe with golden threads cracked under the strain. His skin turned nearly transparent, revealing the bizarre mark that had been hidden beneath his clothes. The black marks that resembled a seal connected to an indescribable world. The terrifying aura they emitted filled the cathedral, leaving the lads who were still sending off the spring elf in a state of extreme terror. They either ran around the offerings, knelt on the ground, or prostrated themselves on the floor, afraid to look up. Guillaume Jr. and a few others fainted from fear, leaving pools of urine and a foul stench. Shepherd Pierre Barry was about to use his mystic arts to grab Lumian when he threw away his axe and knelt on one knee, bowing his head and ceasing all movement. Lumian was the only one who remained unaffected in the entire cathedral. Although he felt an abnormal pain in his head, it was nothing compared to the mysterious voice that had nearly killed him. He also felt a burning sensation in his chest, suspecting that the black thorny chain symbol had appeared, along with the bluish-black symbol resembling an eye and worms. However, he had no time to check his physical condition or understand why he suddenly had the upper hand. He continued to run towards Padre Guillaume Benet, determined not to let any opportunity slip by. As he got closer, Lumian could clearly see the unique black marks resembling seals made up of strange symbols and words. His gaze quickly swept around and he noticed something familiar, black symbols resembling thorns that drilled out of the left chest of Padre Guillaume Bennett and circled behind him. It was identical to Lumian's chest, but much lighter. He has one too. Lumian's heart trembled. Is this the root cause of the abnormality in the village? Why do I have it? When did I get it? Thoughts quickly surfaced in Lumian's mind, but he didn't let them distract him from his movements. He ran towards Guillaume Benet, stretched out his right arm, and wrapped it around the enemy's head. Without pausing, he forcefully circled behind the Padre, and with a snap, Guillaume Benet's head turned and faced his spine. Phew! Lumian breathed a sigh of relief, knowing that the biggest problem had been resolved. He had to hurry home and escape with his sister, leaving the rest to the three foreigners to deal with. But just as Lumian turned to leave, Guillaume Benet, who was supposed to be dead, opened his eyes. They were bloodshot, and a sharp buzz split Lumian's head in half, the intense pain preventing him from screaming. Everything shattered before his eyes, and he was engulfed in darkness as he lost consciousness. Painful. How painful. Lumian suddenly sat up, opened his eyes, and rubbed his head. He saw the familiar surroundings of his bedroom, the wooden table, the reclining chair, and the wardrobe and small bookshelves on both sides. I was saved by Grande, sir. How long was I out? How is the situation in the cathedral? Lumian didn't have the time to think through it. Without wasting any time, Lumian got off the bed, held his head, and rushed out. He found Aurora in the kitchen on the first floor, wearing a light blue dress and preparing dinner. Lumian shouted, Aurora. Grande, sir, we need to run. The Padre and many people in the village have gone crazy. They killed Ava at the end of the celebration. He wasn't sure if his sister knew about the incident, so he got straight to the point. After all, there were many ways to be saved, and it did not mean that she had to be at the scene. Aurora turned around, looking confused, and asked, Celebration? The Lent celebration? Yes. Lumian nodded vigorously. Aurora smiled. That was one hell of a story. Two sentences and you've got me feeling all kinds of scared. But listen, you gotta be more careful with your tales. Lent's still a few days away. Dot. Lumian was stunned. Chapter 33 Confirmation Lumian gazed into Aurora's eyes for a moment before slowly asking, How many days until Lent? He suspected his sister was trying to prank him, but he had never known her to be flippant about important matters. 
this was a crucial moment that would impact the whole village, and possibly even their survival. Aurora sized him up and quipped, Did you not take an afternoon nap? Are you still not fully awake? It's March 29th, 1358. We still have a few days before Lent. March 29th. Lumian ruminated the date for a moment and wondered if he was dreaming. He had vividly experienced Lent, a period of merriment that ended in a bloodbath. He had witnessed Shepherd Pierre Barry hack off Ava's head with an axe and blood spurt everywhere. Was he dreaming now, or had his past experience been a dream? Regardless of which one it was, they both seemed too real. Lumian couldn't detect any signs of deceit on his sister's face. Sure, Aurora could be an excellent actress, but Lumian believed she was not that kind of person. They had spent five years together, and he knew every detail of her personality. There was no way she could have fooled him. Lumian was perplexed as he considered the possibilities of his sister Aurora lying to him about the date. Either she was being controlled by the Padre or some secret entity or everything had been resolved and she was just messing with him. If neither of these options was true, then it was likely that Aurora was telling the truth. Time had rewound to March 29th, a few days before Lent. With Lumian's understanding of the world, this was clearly impossible and shouldn't have happened. However, his sister's attitude left him at a loss. I have to think of a way to confirm it. Lumian tried to recall everything that had happened during that time period and realized he could easily remember most of the details. Aurora was wearing a light blue dress on that day on the March 29th corresponding to the successful celebration of Lent. He also remembered meeting Leah, Ryan, and Valentine that night before taking them to the cathedral to catch the Padre in the act. What's wrong? Aurora stretched out her right hand and waved it in front of her stunned brother. Lumian quickly gathered his thoughts and said, Aurora, I just remembered something. I need to go out for a while. I'll be back soon. Lumian realized that the only way to confirm if time had really returned to March 29th was to find Ava. If she was still alive, he would have to come to terms with this unbelievable change. He didn't wait for Aurora's response and hurried to the door, bypassing her. Call me Grande, sir. Don't be late for dinner. Aurora shouted after him. As he ran towards Ava Lizier's house, Lumian feared that if he were even a second slower, he would be caught in an indescribable nightmare and completely devoured. Along the way, many villagers noticed him, but they were afraid it was a prank directed by him and didn't stop to ask for a reason. Finally, Lumian reached his destination. Guillaume Lizier, Ava's father, was a famous shoemaker in the village of Cordu and the surrounding mountains. Although they weren't particularly rich, they weren't too bad either. They lived in a subterranean grayish-blue two-story building with an empty space at the back where grass and firewood were piled up, and a goose house was repaired. It was almost dinner time when Lumian arrived, and several figures were busy in the kitchen of the Lizier's household. Lumian walked through the open door and immediately saw Ava. This brown-haired girl with aqua-blue eyes was wearing a gray-white dress and preparing dinner for her mother. Her hands and feet were nimble, and her eyes were lively. Lumian could tell just by looking at her that she was alive. She's really not dead. Lumian thought to himself as he looked at Ava's neck, trying to find signs of stitches. In one of Aurora's horror novels, there was a scene where a corpse was stitched up to act as a living person. But Ava's neck was long and smooth, without a single scar. Guillaume Lizier, the shoemaker, noticed Lumian standing in the doorway and asked, Lumian, what's the matter? He stood up from his kitchen chair and faced Lumian, his brown hair disheveled, and a slightly greasy brownish-white apron hanging in front of him. Ava, who had been busy in the kitchen, turned around in surprise and looked at Lumian. She saw Lumian standing there in a daze. What's the matter? she asked. Lumian was momentarily stunned but quickly regained his composure and planned to make up a random reason to explain his visit. However, Guillaume Lizier inspired him with a question. He deliberated for a moment and asked, Monsieur, did Pierre of Berry order a pair of leather shoes from you? 
he remembered that he and Raimund were supposed to meet Shepherd Pierre Barry the next morning and were surprised when he had abandoned his flock to rush back to participate in the Lenten celebration despite the dangers of the long and difficult journey. By that time, Pierre Barry had already put on a new pair of soft leather shoes. Unless he went to a shoe shop in Dariche that sold finished products, it would take time to make a pair of leather shoes. This meant that Pierre Barry had been back in the village for at least two or three days. Guillaume Lizier was surprised by Lumian's question and said, Pierre Barry came back a few days ago, but not many people in the village know about it. He also told me not to tell anyone else. As expected. Lumian made up a reason and said, I saw someone who looked very much like him and thought I was hallucinating. Because the man was wearing new leather shoes, I came to confirm it with you. It's him. Guillaume Lizier gave an affirmative answer. He was still herding three or four sheep that he claimed his employer had given him. Don't they only let the sheep return to the village in early May to shear and milk them? How are they to be grazed if a few sheep are brought back now? Grazing in the highland pastures is still prohibited. The more Lumian thought about it, the more he felt that Shepherd Pierre Barry's behavior was extremely abnormal. And his performance at the end of the celebration proved Lumian's judgment. However, he had no idea what he, the Padre, and the others wanted to do, or what they had already done. Lumian smiled at Guillaume Lizier and Ava and said, I'm relieved that it's really him. I thought I was having problems with my brain and eyes because I drink too much. He then waved at the Lizier's and said, Goodbye. As Lumian left the Lizier's house, the smile on his face disappeared quickly. He was now very confident that today was really March 29th. Did I go back in time, or did I have a precognitive dream? Dreams can't be that real. They're so real that every detail is there. Lumian thought hard as he walked. Either way, it was something he had only read about in Aurora's novels and never imagined would happen in reality. On his way home, Lumian circled the square and came to the side of the eternal blazing sun cathedral. The stained glass window, which should have been completely shattered, was perfectly embedded in the wall, and the St. Sith missionary illustration on the surface shone brightly under the sunset. Lumian watched this scene with mixed feelings. Many thoughts threatened to emit smoke from all the friction against each other in his mind. On his way back to the square, Lumian saw a familiar figure walk out of the cathedral's main entrance. It was the Padre, Guillaume Benet, who had a slightly hooked nose and a dignified aura, and he was wearing a white robe with golden threads. Lumian's heart tightened, and he arched his body slightly, preparing himself for an attack or to flee. Guillaume Benet glanced at him and nodded expressionlessly. Come again tomorrow for prayers. Ah. Uh, that's right. He hasn't been caught red-handed by me during the early evening of March 29th. He hasn't fallen out with me, nor is there any worry that his secret plot is about to be exposed. With this in mind, Lumian instinctively reacted. He stood up straight and spread his arms. Praise the sun. Praise the sun. Guillaume Benet replied with the same pose. After leaving the village square, Lumian habitually recalled what had just happened. Suddenly, he discovered a point that he had neglected previously because he was shocked by time reversal. He still had his superpowers. He was still a hunter. He had not needed to catch his breath from running all the way to the Lizier's, and he had immediately put on the best posture when facing the Padre. This meant that his physique and corresponding condition far exceeded the time before he consumed the potion. From this, Lumian made a judgment that the previous experience was not a precognitive dream, and he was already a sequence nine beyond her. I'll try entering that special dream at night to see if I can still enter and if there are any changes. Lumian quickly came up with the next step of his plan. After returning home, Lumian pretended as if nothing had happened and had dinner with his sister, Aurora. As he often acted this way because he didn't want her to help clean up the mess every time he got into trouble, Aurora didn't ask any further despite sensing that something was off. After washing the cutlery and cleaning the kitchen, Lumian informed his sister and went straight to Old Tavern. He wanted to confirm if the foreigners who didn't hail from Cordu would appear. After entering Old Tavern, Lumian sat at the bar counter and greeted the boss and bartender, Maurice Benet, 
and the thin middle-aged man, Pierre Guillaume. A glass of whiskey sour, he said with great familiarity. Whiskey sour referred to low-quality alcohol brewed from apples. It was only more expensive than some beer in taverns. People often hawked it on the streets of the city. Maurice Benet nagged, stingy brat, don't you like the pain of absinthe? Lumian said the familiar words, is it on the house? This made his mind feel a little adrift. Maurice Benet immediately stopped talking and poured a glass of whiskey sour for Lumian. Lumian sipped his drink as he waited. Not long after, he heard tinkling sounds. He turned around to see Ryan wearing a rough dark bowler hat, a drab duffel coat, and pale yellow strides. Leah attracted the attention of almost all the men in Old Tavern with her white pleated cashmere dress, off-white coat, Marcelin boots, and small silver bells tied to her boots and veil. Similarly, Valentine wore a white vest, a blue tweed jacket, and black trousers, with his blonde hair covered in a little powder. The three of them walked to the bar counter under everyone's gazes and sat down beside Lumian. Lumian didn't look up as he thought to himself, a glass of Dirige red wine, a glass of rye beer, and a glass of carapace. Ryan took off his top hat and put it aside. Then, he said to Maurice Benet, a glass of Dirige red wine, a glass of rye beer, and a glass of carapace. Lumian let out a long sigh, and Ryan asked, What's wrong? Lumian took a sip of his whiskey sour and said in a deep voice, I'm a nobody, with no time to notice the brightness of the sun. Dot. Chapter 34 Sayings Lumian intended to observe, so he went through the entire process of getting to know Leah and her companions until they arrived outside the Cathedral of the Eternal Blazing Sun. He confirmed that these three foreigners really didn't know him and weren't on guard against his corresponding prank. As time really rewound, Lumian was momentarily in a daze. Valentine said his lines as he looked at the magnificent building in front of him that had blended into the night. We've been here before. There's no one here. Lumian composed himself and stopped following the procedure. He said directly, That's because the Padre doesn't want to bother with you. He planned on leaving the impression on these three foreigners, who were suspected to be official beyonders, that he liked to joke but meant no harm. Leah thought of several possibilities and asked, You're saying that the Padre is in the cathedral but isn't responding to the knocks due to certain matters? Lumian smiled. It's not suitable to have others see you having an affair in the cathedral. After saying this, he instinctively muttered in his heart, Unfortunately, I can't hear the classic line you've ruined the Holy Church's plans, this time. Of course, after learning more about Madame Puales, he felt that what the Padres said was not entirely unreasonable. Perhaps Padres could be like the main characters in Aurora's spy novels, who were willing to endure temporary humiliation and betray their bodies to infiltrate the evil forces represented by Madame Puales to complete an important mission. Valentine's cold attitude changed as he asked anxiously, having an affair in the cathedral? Lumian spread his hands. What's the problem? The Padre does this every day. Relax. Isn't there a saying that goes, throughout the ages, it has remained unchanged, men will always pursue women? Valentine snapped, but this is a cathedral. Lumian thought for a moment and asked curiously, so, as long as the clergyman doesn't have the affair in the cathedral, it's acceptable? This is blasphemy against God. Valentine was on the verge of exploding. Ryan placated him with a pat on the shoulder, and the most composed foreigner in the group asked, Do you know who the Padre is having an affair with tonight? Lumian shook his head. There are too many possibilities. His mistresses include Madame Puales, Madonna Benet, Philippa Guillaume, and Sybil Berry. Madonna Benet? She has the same last name as the Padre? Leah interjected. Lumian nodded. She and the Padre are cousins twice removed. Dot. Valentine was stunned for a moment. He gritted his teeth and asked, Is Guillaume Benet a servant of God or a servant of the demon? Do you only know this line? Why don't I see you blowing up his head? Lumian deliberately defended the Padre, It's actually nothing. In Dirige, we have a saying, Distant cousins, feel free to sleep together. 
Leah laughed, tinkling the silver bell on her head. Why do you have so many sayings? Lumian spread his hands again. That's just how it is in the countryside. Ryan interjected thoughtfully, how do you know that we're not from Darij? You wouldn't have said, in Darij, there's a saying. You told me this yourself. Lumian had been quick to shoot off his tongue and actually treated what had happened previously as information that he already knew. He had no choice but to make up a reason. You don't look like Darij locals. He pointed to the road leading to the village and said, I've already helped you find the Padre. I have to go home now. Leah smiled faintly and said, I thought you'd follow us. I don't dare offend the Padre, Lumian casually mentioned. The villager who snitched on him previously has been missing for a long time. Without waiting for Ryan and the others to respond, he waved his hand and ran to the other side of the square, saying, Remember to keep my secret, my cabbages. Lumian walked along a starlit country road, the crimson moon obscured by clouds. He pondered recent events, his hands in pocket. As he neared his home, he looked up at the roof of the semi-subterranean two-story building. As expected, Aurora sat there, hugging her knees and gazing at the cosmos. In the darkness, she seemed lonely and distant. It has really repeated. Is there a possibility that what happened previously is real and undreaming now? Lumian had just come up with a new guess when he suddenly realized the difference between the two March 29 THS. He realized that the woman who had given him the wand card and taught him mysticism knowledge was absent from Old Tavern, preventing him from determining if he was dreaming or not. I'll do a confirmation tomorrow. Lumian composed himself, walked to his house, and pushed the door open. Just like last time, Lumian climbed to the roof using the ladder on the second floor and sat beside Aurora. What's so interesting about this view? Lumian said deliberately. Aurora turned her head and sighed. Just as she was about to speak, Lumian added, I mean, what does the cosmos mean to you? Aurora sized him up. You're being rather direct today. She then looked at the cosmos and said faintly, As you know, I'm not from Kordu or Darij. I don't know if you've ever heard the saying that home is where you can't return to. Lumian didn't joke as he looked into the cosmos. Aurora proceeded to fly into her bedroom and write a letter to her pen pal. Lumian didn't reveal his newfound beyonder status. He returned to the second floor, chatted with her sister about her pen pal, then closed Aurora's door and returned to his bedroom. Upon seeing the white four-piece bed, Lumian's heart skipped a beat. He lifted the pillow and found the minor arcana tarot card representing the Seven of Wands. Looking at the man in verdant attire with a determined expression on his face, his hand holding a wand, poised for battle his enemies, Lumian remembered the woman's interpretation of the card, crisis, challenge, confrontation, courage. The more Lumian thought about it, the more he felt that these four words truly revealed his current situation. Before drawing the card, there was a high chance that he would enter a crisis and face challenges. What I need to do next is to muster my courage and confront the problem? Wait, hasn't time already turned back? I haven't even met that lady or drawn the card. Why is it here? Lumian was alarmed. He wasn't too confident about his previous guesses. All kinds of thoughts and deductions quickly emerged in his mind, like bubbles bubbling in boiling water. This made Lumian's head hurt, he felt like he was about to go crazy. In the end, Lumian decided to treat the woman and the item she gave him as an exception for the time being. With that lady's mysteriousness and uniqueness, it was considered normal for her to be unaffected by time reversal. If I can find her tomorrow and she still knows me, it means that there's nothing wrong with my deduction. Lumian exhaled, feeling mentally exhausted. He went to the washroom to wash up and went to bed early. Lumian woke up in the familiar, faint gray fog and sat up, seeing the wooden table and chair in front of the window. He had once again entered the special dream. Upon discovering that the wand card still existed, Lumian knew he could enter. Lumian subconsciously touched the inner pocket of his clothes, and his expression froze. The gold coins were gone. All the gold coins were gone. Lumian hurriedly jumped off the bed and searched his entire body in the spot where he had been lying, but couldn't find them. 
he didn't even have one copet worth of copper coins. Time has reversed here, too. Lumian suddenly had such a guess. He looked around and didn't see the shotgun, axe, or pitchfork that should have been there. He calmed himself and walked down to the first floor, where he found the pitchfork and hand axe in their original locations, identical to his first exploration of the dream ruins. Similarly, the bucket of corn oil had not been placed beside the stove. As for the shotgun, Lumian searched everywhere but didn't find it. Lumian believed more and more that time had turned back in the dream. I'll check the ruins and see if the two monsters are still there. Lumian muttered to himself silently. He picked up his axe and opened the door. Not long after, he passed through the wilderness filled with crevices and weeds and arrived at the edge of the ruins. Unlike the first time he explored this place, as a hunter, he noticed many traces left behind by living creatures, including two that often appeared in the area when he put his mind to it. He followed one set of footprints to the half-collapsed house. If I had such superpowers in the past, how could I have nearly been ambushed during my first exploration? Lumian carried his axe and entered the building. He went straight to his destination and arrived in front of the shattered pottery jar. A sliver of gold seeped out from inside. Lumian bent over and picked up the Lewis door. It was the same lustrous color as the first time Lumian picked it up. Indeed, time has reversed. With very few exceptions, everything has returned to the original state. Lumian sighed. Suddenly, he took two quick steps forward, twisted his waist, and half turned to the right. As he exerted his strength, the axe in his hand cleaved out. The skinless blood-colored monster lost sight of its target just as it pounced from the roof. What greeted it was an axe. Pfft. Its head flew out, and its headless body fell heavily to the ground amidst the blood and pus. Chapter 35 Differences It's about as strong as the last time. Lumian muttered to himself as he looked at the corpse of the skinless monster. Before the time reversal, he had been evenly matched with the monster, relying on his intelligence to defeat it. Now, as a beyonder, he only needed one swing of his axe to finish it off. Of course, he had the advantage of already experiencing the same sequence of events and knowing the monster's attack strategy. This allowed him to anticipate its moves. The contrast between before and after made Lumian feel that he had undergone a significant improvement after becoming a beyonder. After pondering for a moment, he moved the monster's corpse and head to a corner but did not hide it under rocks, wood, and mud, leaving it exposed along with the blood on the ground. Lumian then quickly searched the half-collapsed building and found the remaining 197 Verldor and 25 Coppet, categorizing them into different pockets. He flipped through the lever blue again but found nothing out of the ordinary. Once he had completed his search, he snuck deeper into the ruins. However, after only 20 to 30 meters, he changed course and returned to his starting point. Following the path the skinless monster had taken while alive, he nimbly climbed onto the half-collapsed roof. After making the necessary preparations, he hid himself. Minute by minute, Lumian waited patiently like an experienced hunter. After an unknown period of time, a figure emerged from the ruins. It was the same monster that had previously given Lumian a hunter beyonder characteristic, with its half human, half beast appearance, bent knees, greasy black hair, and shotgun on its back. The shotgun monster approached cautiously, as if on a daily patrol. Suddenly it sniffed the air and detected the blood in the distance. It quickly changed direction and headed towards the half collapsed, burnt building. Following the trail of blood, the monster found the skinless monster's corpse and head. It squatted down to examine it carefully. On the half-collapsed roof, Lumian shook his head and muttered to himself, You can't even smell me from such a distance? Even with the smell of blood, you shouldn't have missed me. As he muttered, he raised his axe and struck hard at the crevice in the stone beside him that he had prepared earlier. Crash! The half-collapsed roof shook, and heavy rocks crashed down. The shotgun monster reacted quickly, twisting its waist, kicking its feet, and lunging towards an uncollapsed area. Lumian smiled and swooped down from the intact roof like an eagle grabbing its prey in midair. 
In the midst of the howling wind, Lumian and the shotgun monster clashed in the air. Lumian raised his axe with one hand while the monster desperately tried to turn around and block. Lumian clenched his left hand into a fist and punched down. As the monster extended its arm to block, Lumian opened his palm and reduced his strength, grabbing the monster's arm. As Lumian pulled back with his left hand, he suddenly cleaved down with his axe in his right hand. The blade struck the monster, and they both fell to the ground in a pool of blood. Lumian, who had a buffer pad, was not affected by the impact. He raised his hand and cleaved the monster's head from its body with his axe once again. Despite its unwillingness, the head rolled twice and separated from the body. Standing up, Lumian looked at the monster and sneered, You've weakened. All you have is a terrifying shell, nothing more than a stuffed scarecrow inside. As a hunter, he was confident in dealing with the shotgun monster again, but he hadn't expected it to be so easy. Looking at the corpse on the ground, Lumian patiently waited for the Beyonder characteristic to appear. However, after waiting for a long time, he saw no sign of the dark red light. Nothing? Lumian muttered to himself in puzzlement. He wasn't surprised, though. Last time, he had obtained the shotgun monster's Beyonder characteristic and turned it into a potion that he had already consumed. Since the time reversal didn't turn me back into an ordinary person, and the Beyonder characteristic in my body hasn't disappeared, it means that there's one less hunter Beyonder characteristic here. The shotgun monster is only back in its living state, but it essentially lacks what's important. The question now is, why am I still the same before the time reversal? He couldn't come up with an answer, so he decided to loot the copper coins from the shotgun monster and leave the ruins. The next morning, Lumian didn't feign a headache in front of his sister like he had on March 30th. Instead, he got up early and prepared breakfast, including toast, fried poached eggs, sliced bacon, and more. Aurora was surprised to see Lumian's diligence. Oh, you're so diligent. I thought you wouldn't be able to get up this morning after drinking so much yesterday. Lumian casually replied, just a glass of apple whiskey sour and a glass of absinthe. How is that too much? Aurora shook her head and smiled. What's there to be proud of? Other than wine, other alcoholic beverages are unhealthy and affect our brains. No wonder you're becoming more and more stupid, my drunkard brother. Lumian, who couldn't argue with his sister, muttered to himself, why is wine an exception? Because I like it, Aurora replied, challenging Lumian to retort. Lumian had no response. After breakfast, he stayed home and kneaded dough instead of going out. Aurora clicked her tongue in wonder. Did you cause any trouble? You're so obedient. Tell me, I won't beat you up. At most, I'll give you an additional combat class. Nothing. Lumian deflected the question and said, I find things in the village getting weirder and weirder. Some people are acting more and more abnormally. Aurora, do you feel that way? Lumian had observed that his sister didn't have any memories related to the time reversal, but the abnormality in the village had to have started before March 29th. As a mystery prior, Aurora might have sensed it but didn't pay enough attention to it. Aurora's expression turned serious. Even you can sense that something is amiss? Tell me, who are the ones who made you feel this way? As expected, Aurora knew that there was something wrong with some people, but she didn't expect the problem to be so serious. Lumian washed his hands and thought before responding, Madame Puales, the Padre, Pons Benet, and the Shepherd, Pierre Berry, who returned to the village early. There is indeed something wrong with Madame Puales. I knew something was off about her when she came to Cordu with the administrator, but she was very restrained. Apart from constantly having extramarital relationships, there was nothing evil about her. I saw something on her. Aurora stopped herself, not wanting to drag Lumian into the supernatural world. Constantly having extramarital affairs? Before Lumian found out that Madame Puales was having an affair with the Padre, he found Madame Puales a decent lady. He was surprised to learn that Madame Puales had affairs with men other than the Padre. Of course, this was in line with Lumian's stereotypical view of Madame Puales. As for the Padre, 
He has the same strong desire for superpowers as you, but he has never received the blessings of the eternal blazing sun church, Aurora continued. A guy like Pons Benet, whose brain is nothing but muscle, can't do anything strange. As for the shepherd, Pierre Barry, rushing back a few sheep seems a little off, but I can't tell what's wrong, and I don't dare to look deeper. As one would expect from a sequence 7 of the mystery prior pathway. Before the time reversal, I hadn't conversed much with Grande Sir about such topics. In fact, I overlooked the crucial hint that there could be an issue with Pierre Barry's sheep. Yes, I didn't suspect Pierre Barry much back then. I just thought it was a bit odd for him to hurry back early to take part in Lent. Just as Lumian was about to speak, there was a tinkling sound at the door. The doorbell rang. Lumian walked over to the door and asked, Who is it? A telegram for Aurora, the person outside replied loudly. A telegram? Aurora was confused. Who would send me a telegram? There's nothing urgent recently. Lumian was also puzzled. They hadn't received any telegrams before the time reversal on March 30th. Wait, Lumian thought. I went to the village square early on March 30th to wait for Raimund. Perhaps Grande Sir received a telegram but didn't tell me. Lumian quickly opened the door. Outside stood Bertrand, the administrator's subordinate in charge of telegrams. He handed a piece of paper to Lumian and said, One Vril door. The brown haired, brown eyed Bertrand was not from Cordu and had come here with the administrator from Darish. He looked warm on the outside but was actually quite greedy. Lumian tossed a silver coin worth one vril door to Bertrand and looked at the telegram. The contents were simple. Lumian quickly browsed through it. The author Salon mentioned before is in June. If you're willing, Miss Aurora, you can set off for Trier now. Leave enough time for a tour. We guarantee that this will be a very beautiful journey. It was signed by the editorial department of Novel Weekly. W.H. Lumian's eyes widened. Was this a reply from Novel Weekly? When did I say I wanted to attend the author's salon? Aurora leaned over and read the telegram. What's wrong with the editorial department of Novel Weekly? It's annoying having to meet so many people at once. Bertrand was well away from the door by now. Lumian was stunned and suddenly had a bold guess. The telegram in his hand was indeed a reply from Novel Weekly, but it was a reply to the telegram he would send in a few days. To be more precise, the telegram he had sent before going back in time had received a reply after the time reversal, and in his current experience, that telegram had yet to be sent out. Chapter 36 Meeting Again Lumian reached a conclusion that if his guess was true, Cordu and the surrounding area were the only places affected by the time reversal. Other places were not affected. Lumian's thoughts raced, wondering if leaving this place would allow him to return to his normal life. He turned to Aurora and pretended to be guilty. Well, ah, uh, this telegram is my doing. You? Aurora was both angry and amused, but, more importantly, at a loss. She wondered if her brother had pranked her. This was akin to being pecked in the eye by an eagle despite being an experienced hunter. Lumian explained sincerely, here's the thing. Haven't I always wanted to go to Trier to take a look? So, two days ago, I secretly sent a telegram to Novel Weekly at the Telegraph office. I wrote it in your style to ask when the nearest author salon is. As expected, they warmly sent an invitation. Aurora showed a look of enlightenment, as though the mystery was finally solved. So that's how it is. The next second, she picked up a wooden stick beside her and gritted her teeth. So the child has grown up. Lumian quickly added, Aurora, no, grande sir, listen to my excuses. No, listen to my explanation. He didn't panic and even deliberately joked. Fine, go ahead, Aurora said as she held onto the wooden stick. I've always made sure that others accept any punishment with my best conduct. How can I convict someone without listening to the suspect's statement? Even if you are to die. I'll make sure you die knowing why. Lumian quickly said, In Intus, Trier has the most and best universities. 
I'm going to take the college entrance examination soon, and I want to visit them to decide which three to apply for. Aurora nodded slightly, indicating for Lumian to continue. Lumian praised his sister sincerely. I believe that as long as I make this legitimate request, you will definitely take me to try her. However, you will have to spend your money. If Novel Weekly sends an invitation, not only will the steam locomotive ticket and hotel accommodation fees be reimbursed, but also various entertainment expenses and trier. I know you don't need the money, but all the writing you've done was painstaking work, word after word. I won't let a way of saving money go to waste. Aurora's expression eased. At least you care about me. But have you considered that I don't want to attend an author salon? I hate interacting with so many strangers. Lumian smiled. Aurora, ah, uh, grande sir, have you thought that Novel Weekly invited you so warmly not to let you attend the salon, but to build a good relationship with you? You're a famous best-selling author. The salon isn't important, what's important is you. You can find a reason to reject the salon if you're willing to accept the invitation to visit Trier. The people at Novel Weekly will be glad that you accepted the first part of the invitation. Aurora sized up Lumian. You're getting better at reading people. She exhaled and said, All right, I'll handle some matters and pack our luggage. We'll leave for Trier in two days. Send a telegram to Novel Weekly before we leave and ask them to pick us up at the Trier train station. All right. Lumian couldn't hide his joy. Although he suspected that it was impossible for him and Aurora to simply walk out of Cordu and find the corresponding source of the time reversal, he had to try. He couldn't trap himself in one place. Having such thoughts, he had tried to convince Aurora. Lumian didn't plan on telling Aurora about the time reversal because she had lost her corresponding memories. Lumian knew that it was unlikely that she would believe such a delusional speculation unless Lumian kept making prophecies that were eventually verified. However, he still pretended that he wasn't aware of the time reversal. He didn't plan on making prophecies for the time being to see if he could discover any clues. Using reading as an excuse, Lumian returned to the second floor and entered the study. He sat down and casually flipped open a book to confirm if he had it the right way up. Then he sank into his own thoughts, hoping to make further sense of the current situation through the various details he discovered last night and today. As his gaze shifted across the empty space, Lumian saw the lever blue on the table. His heart skipped a beat, and he retracted his thoughts. He stretched out his palm and took the lever blue, flipping through it quickly. The pages that were missing some words and had corresponding holes appeared before his eyes. That letter. Lumian muttered silently. He combined the late reply from Novel Weekly with the letter of help that Leah, Ryan, and the others had received, and he had a new guess. Perhaps that letter was really written by me. I'm the murderer. Time reversal might have happened more than once. According to the definition in Aurora's novel, this should be called a time loop. In a previous cycle, I discovered a certain abnormality through certain exploratory actions and decided to seek help from the outside world by sending an anonymous letter without implicating Aurora. By the time officials realized the seriousness of the problem and sent Ryan and the others to deal with it, Cordu had already begun a new cycle. Like Aurora now, I lost all my corresponding memories and returned to my initial state. Now, that begs the question. Why are words still missing from this lever blue? Logically speaking, it should have returned to its initial state, just like the food I ate in the previous cycle. There are two possibilities. Firstly, if I discover an abnormality and ask for help before time starts to loop, then the relevant memories shouldn't be reset. Could there be another reason that caused me to lose a portion of my memories? This is getting more and more complicated. Secondly, I had found a way to keep something from being affected by the loop during that particular cycle. What could it be? If there is, why don't I just find a piece of paper and write down what I found? Lumian felt like he had cleared away a layer of fog and reconstructed the general situation, only to fall into even more confusion. He believed that he had already experienced many time loops. However, in the previous cycles, his memories and physical condition would reset once he started from the beginning, so he did not notice it at all. 
The reason why he could retain his memories and the Hunter Beyonder characteristic this time was that he had met the lady and obtained the wand card. He had entered the dream ruins and activated the special trait in him. Since the special trait brought about by the two symbols allowed Lumian to bring his Beyonder state in the dream to reality, it was completely possible for them to save his complete physical condition to the starting point of the cycle. Therefore, even after the shotgun monster's condition reset, it still failed to retrieve the Hunter Beyonder characteristic. Lumian leaned back in his chair and looked at the ceiling as he slowly exhaled. He then laughed self-deprecatingly. I've just become a Beyonder, but I have to face such abnormal things. I don't even get the time to develop. Ah, uh, I can't confirm that the request for help was created by me. It might have been Aurora and Madame Puales is also a suspect. As Beyonders, they might have sensed something amiss during a certain cycle and tried to save themselves. With their mysticism knowledge, it's easier for them to find a way to preserve some traces than I can. Nonetheless, a time loop is indeed the best guess for the current situation. As he pondered, Lumian realized a way to confirm the source of the letter. The solution was simple. He would enter the dream ruins and flip through the same lever blue at home. If the lever blue also had missing words, it meant that Lumian had created the letter of help himself. The home in the special dream was formed by his subconscious projection onto the mixed ruins. Everything he subconsciously knew would appear there. If not, then it was most likely done by Aurora or Madame Puales. Lumian's subconscious wouldn't know about this and wouldn't be responsible for it. Lumian wasn't in a hurry to catch up on his sleep. Seeing that it was about time, he sneaked out of the house and headed straight for Old Tavern. In the corner of Old Tavern, he spotted a familiar figure. It was the lady who had given him the wand card and potion formula. She was wearing a long orange pleated dress with a flounce collar and a light-colored frilly hat. Lumian heaved a sigh of relief, feeling like a drowning person who had finally caught a life buoy. He quickly walked over and noticed that there were not breakfast items on the table in front of the lady, but three stacks of tarot cards. Do you need me to draw a card? Lumian probed. You've already drawn it. The woman shuffled the three stacks of tarot cards without looking up. Lumian felt tears welling up in his eyes. As expected, she was not affected by the time loop. Without beating around the bush, Lumian sat down and asked directly, I as well as the entire court of village, have fallen into a time loop? The lady looked up and replied with a smile, Yes, you're one of the circle inhabitants. Lumian repeated the term circle inhabitants to himself and asked in confusion, What does that refer to? People caught in a time loop? The lady smiled and said, There are two explanations. The first refers to people that obtained a special power equivalent to sequence 4 after praying to a certain existence. The second refers to your current situation. You can obtain strength by praying to a hidden existence? Lumian was very surprised by the first explanation of circle inhabitants. Wasn't it the case that all 22 Beyonder pathways relied on consuming potions to advance? The lady nodded slightly and said, In theory, the eternal blazing sun can also bestow the gift of Beyonder powers without the need for a potion. However, it is a burden to him. It can only be used as a temporary measure. The more people who need a blessing, the greater the burden. It might even affect his state. There are also disadvantages to those who are bestowed. They will slowly become closer to the eternal blazing sun, be it in body, mind, or spirit. Moreover, as it is a gift from a superior being, they can take it back at any time unless you possess the unique power of certain pathways and secretly complete a certain level of stealing while still having the gift. Chapter 37 Dangerous Forest Lumian paused for a moment and then said, So the body, mind, and spirit will approach the bestower because the power of the gift carries a corresponding brand? He made this inference from the Beyonder characteristics left behind by the oldest one and the previous owners. Although the bestowment was pure strength and didn't contain any characteristics, it was also likely to have been tainted with all the previous owners' quirks. The lady held the tarot cards and nodded in agreement. Your logical ability is impressive. 
you should thank Aurora for giving you enough basic education. Lumian muttered inwardly, no need for your reminder. The lady continued, even if the bestower doesn't wish to affect the bestowed, it's difficult to prevent the other party from approaching them physically, mentally, and spiritually. This is because if the power bestowed doesn't contain the bestower's will, it will be challenging for the bestowed to control it, and it will quickly dissipate. Therefore, the blessings of the orthodox gods in this aspect are basically temporary and limited to a certain extent. And the evil gods don't care what happens to the bestowed. Lumian nodded thoughtfully and asked curiously, Beyonders, what I mean is, can people with Beyonder characteristics still accept gifts? Will the two conflict and cause them to lose control? The lady smiled and shook her head, there may be some conflict, but not much. Think about it. The power of the gift will transform your body to match that of the bestower, but your body has already adapted to your Beyonder characteristics. So, there will be a conflict until you find a new balance. However, this conflict won't affect your mind or spirit, so you won't lose control unless you're on the brink of collapse. The only problem is that you might have to get used to seeing a third eye and a fourth hand growing on your body. Of course, the prerequisite is that the power bestowed on you will last for a long time. The corresponding level has to be very high as well. Otherwise, the little changes in your body can be ignored. Lumian acknowledged the information in a terse manner. What if the gift is from the same or a neighboring pathway, he asked. The lady nodded. It won't cause any conflict. She then chuckled. But that doesn't mean there won't be physical changes. What does this mean? Lumian was confused and was about to ask for clarification when the lady interrupted him with a chuckle. I thought you'd be more interested in the time loop after learning about circle inhabitants. It's surprising that you're paying attention to this knowledge that may not be useful to you in the future. That's not like you. Lumian revealed a self-deprecating smile. I wanted to ask if you could help us break the time loop, he said. But then I remembered what you said before. You claim that the price for resolving the corresponding problem would be the complete destruction of Kordu. Everyone would die. If I wanted to achieve a better outcome, I could only rely on myself. I didn't understand it at the time, but now I can guess the reason. If you want to break the cycle and you're not a circle inhabitant, the only way is to destroy everything? The lady nodded in agreement. That's correct. Lumian was confused and asked, then why didn't you make it clear before? It's not like it's something that would lead to destruction. Or was this lady used to speaking in a half-concealed manner? The lady immediately laughed. Would you have believed me if I had told you that the whole village was caught up in a time loop? Lumian thought about it for a moment and replied, probably not. It was difficult to believe such an absurd story without experiencing it firsthand. The lady smiled and said, that's why I didn't make it clear. I didn't want to spend a lot of time explaining it to you. Dot. Lumian fell silent for a moment before seizing the opportunity to ask, do you know what the key is to breaking this cycle? In what direction should I focus my efforts? The lady shook her head. Divination on certain matters is very dangerous here. Huh. Lumian was confused. The woman could only add, if I knew the key, I would tell you, the lady said. The sooner I solve this, the sooner I can end this journey. She sighed. When can I have a work-free vacation? Work? Lumian couldn't obtain any inspiration from the mysterious lady, so he probed, if the padre isn't killed, will time stop repeating itself? No, the lady replied accurately. There are many trigger points in the loop, including time reaching the twelfth night. You can figure out the rest yourself. Twelfth night. There's still quite a bit of time to investigate. Lumian thought for a moment and said, because I triggered the specialness in my body, I can maintain my memories and beyonder characteristics every time I loop, right? Seeing the lady nod, he further asked, so, as long as I'm alive and continue to investigate, I'll be able to find the key to end everything sooner or later? This was an application of the exhaustive method that Aurora had mentioned. In theory, that's right. The woman's emotive eyes, which puzzled Lumi and couldn't put his finger on, surfaced again. 
but you should have realized that only Kordu and the surrounding area are in a time loop. Time is passing normally in the outside world, and the date is completely different from Kordu's. The three investigators will send telegrams to describe their situation and the village, and the officials will sense the abnormality here once they mention the date. Even if the investigators fail to send a telegram before the cycle restarts or they don't mention the date, as time passes, the officials will discover the problem. What do you think they will do to resolve the time loop in Kordu? Lumian fell silent for a moment before replying, they'll destroy it directly, just like your alternative choice. The lady nodded with mixed emotions. That can effectively prevent the abnormality from spreading and affecting others, she said. If you have the chance to go to the Sonia Sea in the future, you can ask about Bansi Harbor. It was destroyed by the Church of Storms due to some kind of corruption. No one escaped. Lumian felt a renewed determination to find the key point of the loop on his own. He mocked himself, saying, looks like I don't have much time left. He knew he only had three or four more cycles, and he couldn't have it looped to the twelfth night every time. The lady stood up and calmly said, at least you still have a chance. Some people don't even have that. After leaving Old Tavern, Lumian stood on the road and looked at the few pedestrians and houses around him. Everything in Korda village seemed normal on the surface. The villagers had the same emotions as people everywhere, joy and anger, desire and longing. However, beneath the peaceful and noisy facade, this village hid an unimaginable horror. Everyone here had fallen into a loop and lived the same few days over and over again. Aside from a few people like Padre Guillaume Benet, Shepherd Pierre Berry, Pons Benet, and Ava Lizier, Lumian was temporarily unable to determine who was innocent. He wasn't even 100% sure that Raimund Gregg, who was usually rather dim and unscheming, was fine. The Padre's superpower may have influenced the lad's strange behavior at the end of Lent, instead of them having issues beforehand. For a moment, Lumian felt that Kordu was like a primitive forest, rife with unseen dangers. He couldn't tell who was the prey and who was the hunter. Caution and patience were most important to survive in such an environment. Ability, courage, wisdom, and experience had to take a back seat. This was somewhat similar to his vagrant days, yet clearly different. As these thoughts surfaced, he felt the hunter potion showing signs of digestion. This is the first step of the acting method? That's pretty fast. I thought it would take a month or two to start. He became excited at the possibility of digesting the hunter potion. Can I digest the hunter potion in one or two cycles? With the help of Dream Ruins Hunting, he might quickly become a Sequence 8 Provoker and increase his chances of solving the time loop problem. Lumian pondered as he walked forward. Soon, he arrived at the village square. His current plan was to chat with the Padre to test him for abnormalities and obtain any clues. As he looked around, he saw a figure walking towards the cathedral. The figure was wearing a dark brown long coat with a hood, a rope tied around his waist, and a pair of brand new soft leather shoes. It was Shepherd Pierre Barry. It's him. Lumian quickly approached Pierre and deliberately asked, Pierre, why are you back? Pierre's black curly hair was greasy, and he hadn't shaved for a long time. He happily replied, Isn't Len almost here? I haven't celebrated it in years. I can't miss it this year no matter what. His blue eyes were filled with a gentle smile, and he seemed completely different from the shepherd who had traumatized Lumian before. Ah, the answer will be somewhat different from the previous cycle in a different place with a different questioner. Although the essence doesn't change, certain words will be different. Lumian listened carefully and looked at Pierre's new shoes before asking, Did you make it rich? Not really. I can only say that my current boss is not too shabby. He gave me quite a bit of things. Drinks are on me tonight. Pierre's joy was evident. All right. Lumian agreed and pointed at the cathedral. Are you going to pray? Pierre sighed and said, Yes, it's been too long since I prayed to God in a cathedral. Though the sentence didn't seem significant, the more Lumian listened, the more he sensed that something was off. Shepherds weren't entirely isolated from human settlements. Numerous villages were scattered around the plains and pastures. 
high mountain meadows might be desolate, but shepherds would occasionally descend the mountain to resupply. How could he not find a cathedral? Indeed, if Pierre Berry had ventured to Fainapotter or Lenberg, locating the Cathedral of the Eternal Blazing Sun would be a fruitless endeavor. However, Lumian couldn't shake the feeling that there was something amiss in every word Pierre Berry uttered. Instead, Pierre Berry inquired, Are you headed to the cathedral as well? No, Lumian replied, shaking his head. I thought there'd be people chatting in the square, but it was empty. He then waved his hand. I'm going home. See you tonight, Pierre Barry responded, waving back. After watching the shepherd head towards the cathedral, Lumian made his way back to the village. He decided against having a chat with the padre. His next destination, the home of shepherd Pierre Barry. Chapter 38 Sheep over a dozen members of the Barry family were crammed into a ramshackle two-story house. Lumian seemed unfazed by the open door and carefully maneuvered around it to the vacant area enclosed by wooden fences at the back. Piles of hay and firewood were scattered near the eaves of the clearing, and three filthy, white sheep, muddied with dirt, were lingering there. Lumian remembered Aurora mentioning that the sheep Pierre had hurried back with seemed peculiar, but she couldn't quite pinpoint what was unusual about them. That's why Lumian had taken advantage of the shepherd's absence during prayer at the cathedral to inspect the sheep. Although he had never herded sheep himself, he had lived near the highland pastures in Cordu, so he had at least encountered seventy to eighty sheep. He was by no means unfamiliar with them. After observing closely for some time, Lumian couldn't discern any differences between the three sheep before him and others of their kind. All he could do was mutter under his breath, can't see any issues with my naked eye, do I need some superpower? Sadly, hunters didn't possess such abilities. Lumian had already utilized his enhanced vision, sense of smell, and understanding of various clues, but he still couldn't identify any problems. The only oddity he noticed was that the sheep's droppings were piled in one corner rather than scattered everywhere. Of course, there was a high probability that the Berry family regularly cleaned the area to use the feces more efficiently. After several more seconds of observation, Lumian murmured softly, looks like just looking and sniffing isn't enough. Do I need to get hands on? Without any hesitation, he placed his hand on the fence and flipped over it, as if he was right at home. The three sheep turned their heads simultaneously to look at Lumian, who greeted them with a grin. Come on, time for a checkup. He wasn't concerned that their owner would discover his actions since he had done similar things more than once. Every family in the village knew that this guy enjoyed playing pranks in various ways. Using sheep as props was just part of his antics. In Lumian's own words, when your reputation is already tarnished, there are some perks to being infamous. With the title of Prankster King, anything he did in Cordo Village wouldn't arouse too much suspicion. Even if those who were clearly abnormal caught him red-handed, they wouldn't be able to confirm that something was amiss with him. Of course, under such circumstances, Padre Guillaume and Shepherd Pierre might try to silence him as a precautionary measure. As such, he needed to exercise caution when necessary. Bah! 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 As if sensing Lumian's ill intentions, the three sheep hid behind the haystack, their cries barely audible. But how could they escape a hunter? Lumian grabbed a sheep and patted its side while forcefully examining its teeth. No issues here either, he whispered. Seeing the sheep look at him, he added with a wicked grin, you're in excellent health. You'd probably make a delicious mutton stew with peas. He deliberately said this to test the intelligence of the three sheep. When there were no problems with the target's body, he could only start from this angle. The sheep's eyes glazed over momentarily. Lumian chuckled. Pretty smart, huh? Do you understand what I'm saying? The sheep's eyes returned to normal as it turned its head and began eating hay. Ignoring me? Lumian stroked his chin. I'll buy you from Pierre Berry later and have you for dinner tonight. The sheep remained unresponsive. It bit off a piece of hay and yanked it out. The haystack suddenly collapsed, and Lumian's sharp hunter's eyes caught a glimpse of something. 
his expression darkened as he walked over and squatted down for a closer inspection. It was a bundle of black hair containing a few severed fingernails. Why would this be outside the house? Lumian muttered in surprise. As a native of Kordu, he was well aware of the burial customs of the Darij region. When someone died at home, their hair and nails had to be cut and hidden somewhere inside the house to maintain their horoscope and good fortune. How could such an item appear in an outdoor haystack? Lumian picked up the bundle of hair and nails, weighing it as he examined it. It looks quite fresh, as if it had been cut only recently. He quickly made a judgment. However, no one had died in Korda village lately. Lumian could only suspect that this was some form of witchcraft similar to the funeral customs. He planned to consult his sister about it later. To avoid arousing suspicion, he stuffed the nails and black hair back into the haystack and restored the messy scene. Having completed that task, he walked towards the wooden fence. As Lumian took a few steps forward, he turned to look back at the three sheep. With a hopeful attitude, he muttered to himself, Pierre Barry seems off. He's back in the village before May. Did he commit a crime outside? As a good citizen of Intus and a devout believer of God, should I visit Darij and inquire around? The three sheep just stared at him, unresponsive and unchanged. Lumian sighed inwardly, feeling disappointed. These sheep aren't particularly intelligent, he thought. He then raised his hands, thumbs pointing up, index fingers pointing down, making a gesture of disdain. What's wrong with mocking the sheep when I'm in a bad mood? Suddenly, the sheep that Lumian had examined took a few steps forward, looking hopeful. It raised its hoof and started drawing on the mud. Lumian was momentarily stunned, but soon approached the sheep to see what it was drawing. The sheep seemed to be drawing letters on the ground. Lumian found them familiar but didn't recognize them. He frowned and speculated, this language should have the same origin as the Intus language. But I only know Intus and some ancient Faisak languages. At that moment, Lumian realized the significance of Aurora's words, knowledge equals power. The sheep finished drawing and took a step back, looking at Lumian with sincerity in its eyes. The other two sheep also had a similar emotional change and bleated softly. Lumian looked at the word on the ground and fell into deep thought, wondering what it meant and how he should respond. In just a second or two, he had an idea and nodded solemnly at the three sheep. He stretched out his right foot and wiped away the word on the soil. He may not understand, but he could pretend to understand it. He would trick the sheep for now and ask his sister for guidance later. Without waiting for the sheep to respond, he nodded slowly with a heavy and thoughtful expression as he walked towards the fence, as if saying, Be patient, I'll figure something out. After leaving the sheep pen, Lumian didn't waste any time and went straight home. He found Aurora reading on a recliner in the study. Grande, sir, he called out anxiously, there's something. Aurora immediately raised her guard. Calling me Grande, sir. What kind of trouble did you get into this time? Lumian took a deep breath and organized his thoughts. Remember when you said there was something off about Shepherd Pierre Barry's three sheep? Well, I went to the back of his house to take a look while he was praying in the cathedral. And guess what I found? Aurora's expression turned serious. If you're going to do something like that, you need to tell me in advance. It's dangerous now, and no one will protect you. Lumian felt touched by his sister's concern but complained, if I told you in advance, you probably wouldn't have let me go. I'll keep it in mind for next time, he promised sincerely. He had said similar words dozens of times. Aurora understood the urgency of the situation and nodded, indicating that Lumian could tell her what he had discovered. Lumian quickly recounted his experience in the sheep pen. The more Aurora listened, the more serious she became. Write down that word, she said, getting up from the recliner and finding a pen and paper to hand to Lumian. Lumian had memorized the word, so he quickly wrote it down on the paper. Aurora took a quick glance and said solemnly, This is a big problem. I know. Lumian responded inwardly. Moreover, he believed the problem was even bigger than his sister had imagined. What's the problem? he asked. Aurora pointed at the word and said, 
This is Highlander, the official language of the Fainapotter kingdom. Like Intus, it comes from ancient Faisak. It means. Aurora paused for a moment, then spoke in a deep voice, Help! Help! Lumian blurted out in surprise. The sheep are asking us for help. Aurora tersely acknowledged, I suspect they're not really sheep. They were probably humans. Humans? Lumian asked in shock. This was beyond the scope of what he knew. Before, Lumian had only thought that the three sheep were intelligent and had human-like emotions. They also seemed to have mastered some human language, but he had never thought of them as actual humans. To him, turning into a sheep only happened in imaginative stories. Just as he said that, Lumian was no longer shocked. He realized that a time loop had already happened. What was so strange about people turning into sheep? In the world of mysticism, there were plenty of bizarre and absurd things. Aurora solemnly nodded at her brother's confusion and said, I'm not sure if there's a secret art that can turn a person into a sheep, but all the details now point to that possibility. Indeed, Lumian echoed. The more he thought about it, the more he felt that the three sheep were probably humans. Did this mean that the shepherd, Pierre Berry, was actually grazing humans? Lumian then asked, why were those nails and hair hidden outside the house? Aurora pursed her lips and said, This is one of the funerary customs of the Dirige region. However, it's not used under normal circumstances. Many people have forgotten about it. As a warlock, I've studied this aspect to see if I could obtain some useful knowledge. She then explained, When a family member commits suicide or is murdered by a relative, or if they had a bad character while alive and exerted a negative influence on the entire family, the hair and nails that are cut after death have to be hidden outside the house to prevent the family's horoscope from being affected and bringing them bad luck. Suicide or murder by a relative? Lumian suddenly thought of something. During the last cycle, Pons Benet entered Naroka's house without adhering to the funeral customs. Could he have gone to take away Naroka's hair and nails? Chapter 39, Sick If Pons Benet had really entered Naroka's house to take away her hair and nails, there's a high chance that Naroka had been murdered by a relative. After all, Naroka had a good reputation and was the pillar of the entire family. Furthermore, she was relatively healthy, both physically and mentally, so it was unlikely that she had committed suicide. Lumian quickly came up with a series of speculations. But if Naroka had really been murdered by a relative, what was the reason? Seeing that her brother was deep in thought and hadn't spoken for a long time, Aurora thought that he was frightened by the idea of humans turning into sheep and someone from the Barry family dying from murder. So she comforted him gently. Although the matter is serious, it doesn't affect us yet. I need to reflect on such matters. It's easy for you to panic when you encounter something similar if you're always prohibited from coming into contact with real mysticism. Hmm, the frequency of supernatural events has been increasing in recent years, and I can't be by your side at all times. You'll grow up and have your own life. Lumian inwardly retorted that he had never heard of someone having to leave the family when they grew up. He could feel that Aurora's attitude toward him coming into contact with mysticism had loosened up due to the matter of humans turning into sheep. If I work harder, I can directly tell her that I've become a beyonder. Lumian thought, but before he could speak, Aurora had already made her decision. Go pack your bags now. We'll leave Cordu immediately using Novel Weekly's invitation. We're really lucky. They sent us a telegram at the critical moment so that we can leave openly without being suspected. When we're on our journey, I'll teach you some true mysticism, but don't even think about becoming a beyonder. It's too dangerous. Lumian silently muttered to himself, we're not lucky. I sent the telegram because I discovered the problem. We only received a reply in this cycle. But he was pleased that his sister was still the same decisive person. Although he didn't think they could successfully leave Korda village or escape the loop, he had to try. Ah, uh, are we going to save those three sheep, three people? Lumian asked. Aurora shook her head. This could trigger a conflict between us and Pierre Barry, and I'm not sure how strong he is or how many helpers he has. 
it's too dangerous to save others without knowing anything. It's better to let the officials do it. This is their duty. When we reach Dirige and buy steam locomotive tickets, we'll send an anonymous letter to the officials and let them handle it. But what if they don't believe us? Lumian deliberately pressed. Aurora smiled. In terms of mysticism, you are indeed illiterate. In the letter, we'll describe the matter of turning people into sheep clearly. They will naturally find professionals to perform divination. Even if they don't obtain any detailed revelations, they will discover that there's something abnormal about Cordu. Got it, Lumian said, and he went upstairs to pack his bags. Not long after, the siblings each came down with a brown suitcase. Aurora looked out the door and said, Let's go to Madame Puali's and borrow her carriage to reach Dariche as quickly as possible. An ordinary person had to walk an entire afternoon from Cordu village to Dariche. As a hunter, Lumian didn't need to, but in Aurora's eyes, he wasn't a beyonder yet. After hesitating whether he should take the opportunity to confess to his sister, he realized that it was impossible for him to escape from Cordu. He might as well take the opportunity to search Madame Puali's house for clues. Lumian tersely acknowledged, will do, and reached out to take his sister's suitcase. With two pieces of luggage in hand, he headed for the door. Aurora nodded in satisfaction and relief, but then she said in puzzlement, your strength has increased. You're carrying it so easily. She subconsciously wanted to raise her right hand and rub the sides of her eyes, but Lumian had already left. She could only give up and quickly follow. On the way to the administrator's residence, many villagers saw Aurora leaving with her luggage and asked about the situation curiously. Aurora, who had a valid reason, was very calm about this. On the other hand, Lumian came up with seven or eight stories to deal with the different villagers, something about Aurora getting the Intus Legion of Honor medal and going to Trier to be honored, something about him being specially recruited by Trier Normal College and being able to be matriculated, or something about Aurora going bankrupt from investing in stocks with her creditors about to come knocking on her door, leaving her with no choice but to flee to other places. The ignorant villagers were stunned when they heard this, but thanks to Lumian's reputation, they chose not to believe him after coming back to their senses. Not long after, the siblings arrived in front of the black building that had been transformed from an ancient castle. Looking up at the two tall towers, Lumian smiled and said, I wonder what's inside. Aurora, have you ever been inside? Why would I wander around someone else's house? Aurora rolled her eyes at her brother. Lumian muttered softly, I thought Madame Puali's would invite you to tour the castle. Don't people like them like to show their guests their big houses and precious collections? What's there to see? Aurora's voice became softer and softer as she thought about how this would be of great help to her description of a castle in her works. Sigh, let's talk about it in the future. I wonder if we can still return to Cordu. She then led Lumian through the colorful garden towards the castle door. After taking a few steps, Aurora slowed down and looked around. She remarked in puzzlement, the flowers in this garden bloomed very early. Cordu village was in the mountains and there was a highlander pasture nearby. Normally, the first wave of spring flowers would only appear in mid to late April. Perhaps Madame Puali's gardener has a special method, Lumian said. He recalled that Madame Puali's was a beyonder of an abnormal pathway and suspected that this was related to some supernatural phenomenon, but he couldn't say it out loud. Aurora was just making an offhand remark, so she didn't think too deeply about it. They arrived at the castle and received a warm welcome from Madame Puali's. The lady was wearing a blue corset dress today, and there was still a diamond necklace inlaid with gold hanging over her chest. Her long brown hair was half tied up, the rest cascading down, making her look even younger than usual. She sat on an armchair in the small living room and quietly listened to Aurora's request. She smiled and said, You don't have to be so polite. We're friends. Lumian mocked in his heart. Who would introduce crappy marriage partners to a friend? But he quickly saw Madame Puali's looking at him with a smile in her bright brown eyes. He suddenly recalled their previous conversation and felt uncomfortable. All right, Aurora said helplessly. 
Every time she borrowed a carriage, she would offer to pay for it, but Madame Puales would always refuse. So she would usually bring some gifts for the lady on the way back, which were neither expensive nor cheap, and also give the carriage driver a tip. While waiting for the carriage driver to prepare, Madame Puales invited the siblings to taste some desserts made by her own chef. Lumian tasted a muffin and looked around. Where's Mr. Lund? Louis Lund was Administrator Beast's butler. He had followed him from Dirige to Corda Village. Lumian had evidence that he had an affair with a woman in the village and had sold some of the castle's items secretly. This was how he got the news that Madame Puales was the mistress of the Padre. Chancing upon the Padre and Madame Puales having an affair in the cathedral? That was a lie for the foreigners. At this moment, Lumian was looking for Louis Lund to curse him, saying, You son of a bitch, why didn't you tell me that Madame Puales is a warlock? Madame Puales sighed. Louis is sick. He's resting in his room. Sick? For some reason, Lumian felt that there might be a problem. While his sister was chatting with Madame Puales, he excused himself to go to the washroom, walked out of the living room, and went straight to the stairs. This castle was huge, and the couple didn't bring many servants with them. It looked empty everywhere, and one could even hear echoes when walking in certain places. This gave Lumian better conditions to infiltrate. Relying on his powerful senses, he easily dodged a valet and a maid. With light footsteps, he arrived at the second floor and found Louis Lund's room. He was in no hurry to knock. He turned his head and pressed his ear to the wood. Ah! Ah! Sounds of a man screaming in pain came from the room. Is he really sick? It sounds quite serious. Lumian thought for a moment and walked to the side. He opened the door of the other servants, Administrator Beast and Madame Puales lived on the third floor. After darting into the room, he gently closed the wooden door, took a few steps to the other side, and pushed open the glass window. Lumian looked down and saw that no one was around. He immediately propped himself up with both hands and nimbly flipped over, hanging on the outer wall of the castle. Then, he leaped lightly like a wild cat and silently landed on Butler Louis Lund's windowsill. Lumian stood at the edge of the glass window, turned his body, and secretly looked into the room. He saw Louis Lund lying naked on the bed, his belly bulging, giving the impression that he might burst at any moment. Seeing that the butler's black hair was drenched in sweat and his face was grimacing with pain, Lumian couldn't help but frown when he heard his tragic cries from time to time. What kind of illness is this? It looks scary. A stomach can actually grow so big. At this moment, a woman in her forties stood beside Louis Lund's bed. She had brown hair and brown eyes. She was pretty and didn't have many wrinkles. She wore a grayish-white dress and was shouting excitedly at Louis Lund. Soon, soon. What's happening soon? Just as this thought flashed through Lomian's mind, he heard a scream and saw something holding up Louis Lund's stomach. In the blink of an eye, that spot had burst open. Louis Lund's stomach had burst. A small, bloody hand reached out. It's born! It's born! The woman shouted happily. She then leaned down and took out a wrinkled, dirty, and bloody baby from Louis Lund's stomach. Lumian was stunned. Dot. Chapter 40 On the Carriage Compared to the time loop and humans becoming sheep, the scene in front of him was no less shocking. It made Lumian feel as though his eyes, mind, and spirit had been severely tainted. If he had known beforehand that he would witness such a thing, he would definitely have abandoned his actions. What the fuck is going on? Louis Lund is clearly still a man. Whose child is he carrying? The administrators? Or Madame Puales? Is this the world of mysticism? Aurora didn't let me come into contact with this for my own good. For a moment, Lumian's thoughts were disordered, and his mind was in a state of chaos. He wished he could dig out his eyes and forcefully forget what he had seen. Wah! 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 The baby that Louis Lund had given birth to cried out, 
making the filthy delivery room instantly have a holy aura. This was the beauty of a new life. Lumian, who was hiding outside the window, directly experienced the joy of human origins. Of course, besides that, the strange, absurd, dirty, and disharmonious feeling became even more obvious. Lumian finally came back to his senses and subconsciously looked into the room again. The baby had already been placed on a white silk cloth beside Louis Lund by the woman in the grayish white dress. The baby was a boy, and there was more blood than milky white fat, but other than that, there was nothing abnormal. He looked like an ordinary newborn. Lumian observed for another two seconds and realized that the baby boy's ten fingers were bent. His nails were very long like the claws of a bird. Just now, he had used these hands to rip open Louis Lund's stomach. Louis Lund, on the other hand, lay in a semi-conscious state. The wound on Louis Lund's stomach had yet to be stitched up, and blood kept seeping out. One could vaguely see the intestines pressed to the side and a strange, bird's nest-like thing covered in a flesh-colored membrane. As the woman wrapped the baby in silk, she picked up a sewing needle and catgut, and began chanting as she sewed the groaning Louis Lund's wound, This was quite easy for you. The last time I gave birth to quadruplets, that was considered painful. Lumian's facial muscles twitched slightly. He felt that after his eyes, brain, mind, and spirit were affected, his ears were also tainted. He retracted his gaze. He had to get out of there, fast. He leaped back to the window he had come from and flipped into the room. After closing the window, he rushed out the door and headed straight for the stairs. After dodging a male servant, Lumian tiptoed and quickly returned to the hall. Where did you go? Suddenly, a slightly magnetic and gentle voice sounded in his ears. Even with Lumian's hunter senses, he didn't sense that someone was standing beside the staircase entrance. He turned around to see Madame Poalis in a blue corset, her hair half-tied, and her bright brown eyes reflecting his figure. The Madame no longer had a smile on her face. Her eyes reflected Lumian's figure with a piercing intensity. Lumian's mind tensed up. He was terrified, but prepared to fight if necessary. Aurora appeared from a side room and asked, Where did you go? The carriage has been waiting at the entrance. Having been in a similar situation, the experienced Lumian said half-truthfully, didn't Madame Puali say that Mr. Lund is sick? I had drinks with Mr. Lund and wanted to visit him, but this castle is too big. I couldn't find his room. Aurora nodded and said, you could have asked Madame Puali's directly. You don't have to hide it from us. It's not a bad thing. My bad. I'm sorry. Lumian looked at Madame Puali's sincerely. After seeing the scene upstairs, Lumian was more afraid of this lady than disgusted. He was relieved when she finally smiled, no longer as serious as before. Let me thank you on behalf of Lund for your kindness, but he isn't in the best of health. He isn't willing to appear in front of others in that unseemly manner. It's indeed unseemly. Lumian silently echoed her thoughts. Shall we board the carriage? Thank you so much, Aurora said to Madame Poalis. Lumian watched Madame Poalis closely, afraid she would find a way to make them stay longer. If she did, it could mean that she sensed something had happened with Louis Lund. Although Lumian felt that their combined forces could fight against Madame Poalis after he rendezvoused with his sister, this was her castle after all, surrounded by her servants. It was the worst hunting environment for a hunter. Madame Puales nodded and smiled at Aurora. I look forward to the gifts you bring back from Trier. I always yearn for what's trending there. I hope I can give you a surprise, Aurora replied, though she wasn't sure she'd ever be able to return to Corda Village. She just needed to keep up appearances. Madame Puales walked the siblings to the door with her lady's maid, Kathy, and watched them get into the four-seater carriage. The burly, Brown-bearded carriage driver wore dark red clothes, yellow pants, and a waxed hat. He looked almost like a professional coachman in the city, except that he didn't wear a tie. This was a mandatory request from Administrator Beast. Aurora apologized to the driver. Sorry to trouble you, she said politely before closing the door. 
The driver's name was Sewell, and he had the most common blue eyes in the Intus Republic. He was delighted by Aurora's politeness and looked forward to the tip he'd receive when they arrived in Dirige. Madam, Monsieur, sit tight. He raised his whip, and the horses started to speed up. As the carriage passed through Corda Village, it suddenly stopped. Lumian's heart skipped a beat, knowing that their journey wouldn't be smooth and easy. What's wrong? he asked the driver, Sewell. Sewell explained, Madam promised to send Naroka to Junak Village yesterday. I'm worried I won't be able to return in time after going to Darish, so I thought of picking her up on the way. Don't worry, it won't cause any delays. Junak Village was closer to Darish than Korda Village. Going there first really didn't affect the estimated time of arrival for Aurora and Lumian. Aurora had no right to object since this wasn't her carriage, so she didn't. Lumian was more concerned about Naroka's safety. In the previous cycle, she had died under suspicious circumstances, possibly at the hands of a relative. It was related to the Padres group. Sewell went into Naroka's house before helping her out. Naroka was different from usual. She was dressed in a long black dress with exquisite patterns and a dark bonnet. Her sparse, pale hair was carefully combed. Hey, my little cabbages, where are you going? Naroka asked happily as she got into the carriage. Her pockmarked and wrinkled face was filled with unconcealable joy, and her previously slightly turbid eyes were much more energetic. Aurora told her the truth. I'm going to try her to attend an author's salon and also bring Lumian to check out the universities there. Aurora asked Naroka, did you receive some invitation? While it was normal for Naroka to wear black clothes as a widow, she only wore this dress during festivals, banquets, and the anniversary of her late husband's death. Naroka looked expectant. Yeah, to meet some people. Lumian quietly observed Naroka, trying to see if he could detect anything from her. The carriage started moving again, leaving Kordu village behind. Aurora chatted with Naroka intermittently, keeping an eye on the outside of the carriage. Aurora worried that their sudden departure might arouse suspicion. As they continued on, Lumian sensed a change in Naroka's demeanor. She looked much paler than before, and her eyes lacked their usual liveliness. She only spoke when spoken to. This was very similar to the Naroka Lumian had seen in the middle of the night during the previous cycle. Lumian discreetly tugged on Aurora's hand to get her attention. Aurora turned to him, silently asking what was wrong. Lumian discreetly pointed at Naroka and drew a cross on her palm, a symbol Aurora often used to indicate an error in her scripts. He used it to refer to Naroka's concerning state. Aurora was momentarily stunned but quickly understood what Lumian meant. She turned her attention to Naroka, sensing that something was wrong. Aurora raised her hand to massage her temples, causing her light blue eyes to darken and become deeper. With just a glance, Aurora's golden brows furrowed, and she leaned back slightly as if she had been hit by something. She closed her eyes and rubbed her temples, as if she was feeling tired and in pain. When she opened her eyes again, Aurora turned to Lumian and said, When we reach Darish, you must stay close to me. No matter what happens, don't leave my side. Her tone was serious, and Lumian understood immediately. He knew that if something happened, he had to follow his sister closely. She would take care of it. He nodded solemnly and decided to tell Aurora about his recent beyond her powers later. Aurora turned her attention back to Naroka and asked, Are you really going to Junak or somewhere else? She was worried that an unexpected stop might make things more complicated. It was better to anticipate any developments and not fight in an environment the other party was expecting. Naroka's gaze was vacant as she replied in a deep voice, No, I'm not going to Junak. I want to go to Permitha. As she spoke, Lumian noticed the outside of the carriage window darkening abnormally. Chapter 41, Undead What's Permitha? Lumian was alarmed as he quickly turned to look out the window. But what he saw outside was not what he expected. Instead of mountains, pastures, and trees, he was greeted by a desolate wilderness. The pale white clouds in the sky blocked out all the sunlight, 
casting everything in shadow. In the wilderness, strange figures roamed about. Most of them wore white linen clothes, with pale blue faces, empty eyes, and agape mouths, looking anything but normal. Lumian watched in horror as some of the figures ran crazily towards the edge of the wilderness, while others stumbled towards them from the other side. It was as if they would never stop, doomed to wander aimlessly forever. At the edge of the wilderness, near a cliff, he could make out dark monsters with long horns and humanoid bodies, grabbing the white-clad figures and throwing them over the edge. Suddenly, a blood-curdling scream pierced the air, right into Lumian's and Aurora's ears. The sound of hooves echoed through the wilderness as a tall figure in full black armor rode a white horse. The horse was so thin that it looked like it had only skin and bones left. The rider moved slowly at times and galloped back and forth at others, as if shepherding sheep. Lumian's eyesight was sharp, and he could see the rider clearly from afar. Inside the helmet that shone with a metallic luster, two deep red rays of light flickered like flames. A hideous wound on the rider's neck extended all the way to their navel, almost splitting them in half and dragging out their pale white intestines. Without any need for further evidence, Lumian knew who it was, a death knight. It was a creature that often appeared in Antisian folklore. Suddenly, the carriage they were in came to a stop. Naroka silently opened the door and stepped out. Her pale face, empty eyes, and numb expression were starting to resemble the figures in white linen clothes that Lumian had seen earlier. Aurora turned to him and said in a deep voice, This place is filled with undead. You must stay by my side at all times. As she spoke, she took out a gold brooch and fastened it to her clothing. Aurora took out a handful of grayish-black powder from her pocket with her other hand. Lumian leaned forward to look at the carriage driver and realized that Sewell had become like Naroka, pale-faced and empty-eyed, slowly walking deeper into the wilderness as if he had been dead for a long time. He said quickly to Aurora, Grande sir, I'm already a beyonder. You deal with these undead. I'll drive the carriage and get us out of here as soon as possible. He knew he couldn't fight the undead so he could only be a temporary carriage driver. But if the Death Knight showed up, he would do his best to block it. Aurora was taken aback by Lumian's sudden transformation, but quickly regained her composure. She reminded him, check the horse's condition. Lumian looked ahead and saw that the horses were motionless, with their flesh and blood seemingly extracted, leaving only withered fur and skin wrapped around their bones. The horses are dead, he reported back to Aurora. Suddenly, the undead caught a whiff of the living and rushed towards the carriage, trying to enter. Triple X. Aurora uttered a word in a language Lumian didn't understand. As soon as Aurora spoke the word, the golden brooch in front of her lit up with a violent but not stimulating golden light. The grayish-black powder in her left hand burned, emitting a flow of light that resembled water, spreading in all directions. The undead screamed as soon as they came into contact with the light, and cyan smoke rose from their bodies. They wanted to retreat, but more undead surged forward, squeezing around the carriage, evaporating and disappearing. Lumian watched enviously and solemnly, wishing he could do something to help. He yearned to advance in sequence and gain more abilities. But the powder in Aurora's hand was about to run out, and the undead were still coming, ignoring the ones that had already been destroyed. Lumian knew they couldn't stay there forever. We can't stay here. Let's make a run for it. No matter how many materials his sister had prepared, she couldn't deal with so many undead. The Death Knight and the creatures that looked like demons were still out there. Their best chance was to use what resources they had left to escape from the wilderness known as Permitha. Aurora nodded and said simply, follow me. The moment she finished speaking, the grayish-black powder in her palm vanished into thin air, and the desolate surroundings were engulfed by the undead. Aurora wasted no time and retrieved another handful of materials, igniting them with the golden brooch before her. The materials combusted, creating a dazzling golden light that decimated the approaching undead. Their agonizing shrieks echoed through the wilderness before they disintegrated into nothingness. Aurora leaped off the carriage with Lumian hot on her heels, sprinting towards the nearest edge of the wilderness. Suddenly, a hand jutted out from the golden blaze, snatching Lumian's arm. 
Lumian's instincts kicked in, alerting him of the imminent threat. He pivoted his forearm and delivered a swift blow to the hand. Pa! It felt like he had punched a block of solid ice. A shiver ran through his body, rendering him immobile for a moment. Lumian's teeth clattered as he caught sight of the hand's owner. It was another undead clad in white linen, but it donned a mask made of white paper over its face. The figure disintegrated slowly under the golden light. The peculiar undead lunged towards Lumian, but before it could make contact, a beam of pure, holy light descended upon it. The masked undead halted in its tracks, burning fiercely before dissolving into black vapor. Keep moving! Aurora shouted, withdrawing her hand from the golden brooch and darting forward. Lumian shook off the cold and picked up his pace to follow his sister. The duo relied on the grayish-black powder and warlock spells to traverse the wilderness. The golden light eradicated countless undead garbed in white linen. Unfortunately, Aurora couldn't simply rely on one material to stuff every bag. As a warlock, she had to anticipate various scenarios. Before long, the bag containing the sunflower powder was empty, and they were still hundreds of meters away from the wilderness's edge. The undead horde seemed never-ending. What frightened them even more was the Death Knight's approach. The horse-mounted knight had sensed the turmoil and was galloping towards them. Aurora's expression changed several times in the golden light. She slowed down, gritted her teeth, and spoke urgently to Lumian. When I shout three, run towards the edge of the wilderness and don't look back. Lumian opened his mouth to protest, but Aurora cut him off. Don't worry, I'll follow you. If you stay, you'll only interfere with my use of a powerful spell and slow us down when we try to escape. As she spoke, Aurora removed the golden brooch from her chest and handed it to Lumian, giving him instructions. Focus your spirituality and extend it to this brooch. Repeat this word when you're running, triple X. Lumian didn't understand the word, but he committed the pronunciation to memory. As soon as he took hold of the golden brooch, he felt a warm light envelop his body, banishing his dark thoughts and slowing down his racing mind. Instinctively donning the brooch, Lumian concentrated his thoughts according to his sister's directions, extending his spiritual energy. Seeing that the grayish-black powder in her hand was running low, Aurora retrieved another material and shouted out, One, two, three. In order to avoid slowing down his sister, Lumian sprinted wildly towards the edge of the wilderness, shouting the word Aurora had given him with all his might. Triple X. The golden brooch emitted a golden, radiant glow, illuminating Lumian as though a miniature sun was hanging on his chest. The undead in his path instinctively avoided him. Thud thud thud. As he ran, Lumian couldn't shake his worry for his sister. He cast a glance back at Aurora, who remained in her spot surrounded by a cloud of black gas. The undead were drawn to the gas, abandoning Lumian to swarm towards her. Lumian wasn't a fool. When he saw this scene, he understood that his sister was lying when she said that she would follow him. Aurora! He shouted, halted abruptly and spun around, running back towards his sister. Aurora looked back and saw that he had stopped. She hurriedly shouted, Are you stupid? Run! Lumian didn't say anything and ran towards Aurora. The undead parted before him, clearing a path under the golden light of the brooch. Seeing this, Aurora lowered her head and cursed softly, What an idiot! She then took out another iron-black substance and sprinkled it on Lumian, causing him to be pushed to the edge of the wilderness by an invisible force. He struggled to break free, but he was in midair with no point of leverage. My stupid brother, live well. Aurora whispered with a melancholic smile before the black aura consumed her completely. She was directly exposed to countless figures in the death night. Aurora! Lumian's eyes bulged with terror, his skin and eyes turning red with blood vessels. However, he was still pushed to the edge of the wilderness. But suddenly, all the undead stopped in their tracks. Something was happening in the distance. Aurora sensed the shift and looked up in shock. She saw an open carriage passing by, pulled not by horses, but by two demonic creatures with goat horns. 
the carriage was a deep red color, resembling a conch or a cradle, and a woman resembling Madame Puali's wearing a flower crown and green dress sat inside. But unlike Madame Puali's, she was very dignified. The death knight abandoned his target and turned his horse towards the carriage. All the undead followed suit, clustering around the carriage as it headed towards the hazy mountain range beyond the wilderness. Chapter 42 Madam Knight Lumian was stunned by the carriage pulled by the demon and the undead's reactions. He forgot to struggle and got pushed by the invisible palm for over ten seconds before coming to a stop. Although the carriage was getting farther away, he could still see the woman's face clearly with his eagle-like vision. Her long brown hair was tied up high, and her brown eyes were beautiful and bright. She had light eyebrows and wore a fresh green dress and a laurel crown made of flowers. She had an elegant and dignified aura. Madame Puali's Lumian's first thought was that the woman on the carriage was Madame Puali's, the administrator's wife and the padre's mistress. However, on closer inspection, he noticed an obvious difference between the two. Not only was there a vast disparity in their aura, but there was also a distinct difference in their looks. The lady in the car had softer and more mature facial features. If Lumian had to make a comparison, he would describe the lady in the car as Madame Puali's older sister by seven or eight years. At the moment, the lady sat in an open carriage pulled by the demon. Surrounded by countless undead and the death knight, she traveled towards the distant forest as if she was on some kind of magical patrol. Aurora retracted her gaze and ran towards Lumian. As she ran, she shouted, Take this opportunity to escape from here. Lumian snapped out of his daze and waited for his sister to catch up before taking large strides and fleeing to the edge of the nearest wilderness. Before long, they felt as though they had passed through an illusory curtain or a thick layer of water. The scene before them changed. The wilderness dissipated like bubbles. The clear river, new grass on both sides, and green trees all entered their view at once. To Lumian and Aurora, this scene was so familiar that they didn't need to identify it to make a judgment. They were still near Corda village. This was where Ava Lizier used to tend to her geese. We're back. Lumian wasn't surprised or disappointed. Instead, he looked around, having confirmed his suspicion. Aurora panted and said, whether Madame Puali's made a mistake on purpose or not, we can't go back to the village now. Let's head to Darish. Lumian suggested immediately. Then let's go to the nearest pasture. There's a dangerous path down the hill. With our abilities, we'll be fine, Lumian added. Okay. Aurora turned around and started running. Having borrowed the pony from Madame Puali's from time to time, she was familiar with the highland pastures around Cordu. Lumian followed his sister closely, both glad and terrified at what had just happened. He didn't expect Madame Puali's to be so powerful that she could have so many undead, the demon, and the death knight chase after her. Of course, it might not be Madame Puali's. As she ran, Aurora slowed down. Her breathing became heavier, and her gasping became more and more pronounced. What's wrong? Lumian still had plenty of energy. This was one of the benefits of being a hunter. Aurora stopped and panted heavily. I'm exhausted. The spellcasting took up a lot of my energy. Lumian said without hesitation, then I'll carry you. I'm not tired yet. They were in a dire situation, and time was of the essence. Aurora nodded, went behind the squatting Lumian, and leaned on him. Lumian first took off the brooch in front of him and returned it to his sister. Then, he straightened his body and ran again. Is this a mystical item? Lumian still had the energy to ask. Aurora was taken aback for a moment before she chuckled. Looks like you know quite a bit. This is indeed a mystical item. I call it the integrity brooch. It can create holy sunlight or help me ignite materials to help me use a mystic technique to deal with ghost-type creatures. However, wearing it for too long will cause people to become fanatical. And as long as you wear it, you will lose some thoughts. As you know, immoral methods in battle might be more useful, but you get limited by it. 
Aurora paused and asked in a deep voice, where did you get the Beyonder characteristic? As Lumian ran, he replied intermittently, didn't that wand card allow me to stay awake in the dream? What wand card? Aurora was confused. Oh, this is something from the previous cycle. Lumian reorganized his words. I was at Old Tavern and met a mysterious lady. She gave me a wand card. With that card, I stayed lucid in my dream and entered a strange space. There, I encountered some monsters and obtained a Hunter Beyonder characteristic. Hunter. Aurora was familiar with this sequence commonly seen in Intus. As she muttered to herself, she suddenly chuckled, seeming to have thought of something. What are you laughing at? Lumian was baffled. Aurora asked again, then who gave you the formula? That mysterious lady? Yeah. Lumian nodded as he ran. Aurora sighed and said, my stupid brother has his own secrets now. I can't confirm if what you said is true or not. I'll just take it at face value. Lumian couldn't bear to see his sister disappointed, so he quickly changed the topic. Was that Madame Puali's on the carriage? They look alike, but they're not the same, Aurora said, contradicting herself. After a few seconds of deliberation, she said, since you're already a beyonder, I'll tell you directly. My companions, ah, uh, my pen pals, once mentioned something. They said that in the past few years, there have been many strange phenomena similar to what happened just now in the southern parts of Loan, the southern parts of Entis, and the Fainapotter Kingdom. Women ride carriages pulled by demons, patrol the wilderness and have hordes of undead following them. Some beyonders who have grasped the corresponding mystic arts will let their spirits leave their bodies and follow the carriage for a period of time to experience something wonderful and obtain mystic knowledge. One of my companions obtained one of the Beyonders' notebooks. It mentioned that the lady's name is Madame Knight. The owner of the notebook obtained a secret medicine production method from his experience following a carriage, which can create an invisibility potion from a baby's corpse. According to the investigation, the women in different places exhibit similar phenomena, but things happen at night. Lumian said in surprise, but it's daytime now. Could the anomaly in Cordo Village have brought about a change? That's why I'm not sure, Aurora said after thinking for a moment. Perhaps sending Naroka to Permitha made a difference. Perhaps that wilderness is Permitha, where Madame Knights patrol in the day and appear in the human world at night. Yes, combined with the fact that the lady resembles Puali's, I'm inclined to the previous guess. Lumian didn't know much about mysticism but he instinctively felt that his sister's suspicion was right. He ran in silence for a distance before finally asking, why did you sacrifice yourself to save me? I wish you were more selfish. I'm very selfish, Aurora said with a smile. I considered abandoning you and escaping on my own. Then, I would avenge you when I became stronger. However, after careful consideration, I realized that even if I gave you the integrity brooch and taught you how to use it, you wouldn't be able to help me attract most of the undead to give me a chance to escape. Only a warlock like me could do it. It was a choice between us dying together or at least you being able to live. I don't have to tell you the choice I made, right? Making such a choice isn't as easy as how you make it sound. Lumian could accept it rationally, but not emotionally. He said gloomily, we might as well die together. You can't die. Who'll bring me back if you're gone? Anything's possible in the world of mysticism, lectured Aurora to her brother. That's why I said all those sappy lines. So you'll remember to work hard and bring me back. That's true. Lumian gradually agreed with his sister's choice. After running for a while, they saw the nearest highland pasture. Lumian, who had been carrying Aurora, clearly felt tired, but he didn't stop to rest. He mustered his remaining strength and rushed to the hill covered in green grass. There were many livestock pens and shacks here. The former was surrounded by rocks and tree branches. The ground was compacted soil and flattened feces. There was a long and narrow exit at one end that could only allow one sheep to pass through. The latter was similar to a primitive tent. Stones were first used to build a circle of low walls, leaving a door and a smoke vent. Then, a row of grates were built against the low walls. 
the bottom half of the grates was buried in the soil, and the upper end supported a wooden structure. On the wooden structure was a roof made of grass and mud. This was where the shepherds lived. The environment was very harsh. Lumian no longer carried Aurora and led her all the way to the other side of the hill. The dangerous path was hidden below. Looking at the path that required her to jump seven to eight meters off a cliff, Aurora said to Lumian, Although you can climb this now, don't waste time. I'll fly you down. All right. Lumian wanted to see what kind of changes would happen if he left Kordu. Aurora grabbed Lumian's arm with one hand and sprinkled silver dust with the other. The two of them floated up at the same time and slowly flew down the cliff. In midair, Lumian suddenly felt a pain in his head, as if someone had hit him heavily. Aurora had a similar reaction. Lumian's vision quickly turned black as he felt everything shatter. Lumian jolted awake and saw the familiar sights of the table, chair, bookshelf, and wardrobe. Back to square one. He got off the bed thoughtfully and went downstairs. As expected, he found Aurora in a light blue dress, preparing dinner. Aurora, what's the date today? Lumian asked. Aurora glared at him. Call me Grande, sir. Are you still not fully awake? It's the 29th today. Chapter 43, Frank As expected, the loop has repeated. Lumian wasn't surprised to hear Aurora's answer. This was the third cycle he could recall. Combined with his own experience and the mysterious lady's pointers, he had a preliminary conclusion, the time limit for the loop is until the twelfth night. The spatial range of the loop is Korda Village and its surroundings. Characters in the loop are restricted from killing the Padre. These are the three key points of the loop. At this thought, Lumian looked at Aurora and asked thoughtfully, Grande sir, if you wrote a novel about a time loop, where would you put the key to undoing it? Aurora looked Lumian up and down in confusion. You suddenly asked such a question and even called me Grande sir obediently. Did you come up with a new story to deceive others? I guess so, Lumian replied sincerely. Aurora frowned and thought for a while before saying, from a novelist's perspective, or rather, from the perspective of normal logic, the most critical part of the cycle is definitely the final scene. This is because it is both the end of this cycle and the beginning of the next cycle. It is the button that connects the end and the beginning. Without it, there is no way to turn the flow of time in a straight line into a closed circle. Think about it. The loop reverses, so there will always be a first time. Something must have happened at the last moment to cause time to restart. Twelfth night? Lumian agreed with his sister's guess about the twelfth night. He nodded and asked, then why can't the most critical part be the first day of the loop? Shouldn't we ask why the loop starts at this moment? Aurora chuckled and said, making a short story to deceive a few people temporarily is your forte, but when it involves this kind of content that requires strict logic and rich knowledge, you aren't capable of it. The reason why the first day of the loop is the first day is perhaps due to the power or energy that causes the loop. Proceeding past the last day will end up overlapping this day. This is like why a loop probably doesn't cover the entire world, but some localized area. It's not that it doesn't want to, but it's incapable of doing so. Lumian had actually considered this possibility. He just hoped that his knowledgeable sister would come up with a different answer. Aurora thought for a moment and added, if the loop is not a completely closed circle, where there is still interaction between those inside and outside the loop, for example, information inside can be transmitted, and people outside can enter but not leave, the first day of the loop might start from the day the outsiders happen to enter, so that when the loop is repeated, they don't have a position. Of course, it can also compel the outsiders to do something they will do subsequently on the originally eventless first day. There are too many ways to make up similar stories. Lumian's eyes lit up when he heard that. He wanted to praise his sister loudly. He suspected that the entry of Leah, Ryan, and Valentine caused the cycle to start on the afternoon of March 29th. If that was the case, the twelfth night might have already turned into the tenth or ninth night. 
Of course, it might also have originally been the thirteenth night that turned into the twelfth night due to the intrusion of the outsiders. These were all possibilities that Lumian needed to verify himself. He completely agreed with his sister's deduction. He believed that something must have happened on the twelfth night to cause the loop to happen. Only by figuring out what happened at that time could he find the key to undoing the loop. Therefore, Lumian decided not to trigger any abnormalities in this cycle. He also found an excuse not to join the procession and stay until the twelfth night. But he couldn't do nothing. Time wouldn't allow it. Unless Lumian broke out of the cycle after experiencing the twelfth night, he would have to make the best use of time for the next cycle. A complete cycle lasted twelve days. After that, the probability of the outside world discovering any abnormalities in Kordu would increase exponentially. Lumian had, at best, one complete cycle or less to resolve the problem. If he wanted to stop the abnormality in one cycle, he needed to have enough information and a sufficient understanding of the entire village. Lumian couldn't help but mock himself. Not only do I have to avoid triggering the abnormality, but I also have to investigate the problem. What was the difference between this and a clown walking on a tightrope at the edge of a cliff? Wanting both wasn't something good. Aurora saw that he didn't speak for a few seconds and seemed to be making up a story. She waved her hand and said, I almost forgot to make dinner. Wait a minute, Lumian said with a solemn expression. Aurora immediately clicked her tongue. I smell mischief. Lumian said bluntly, Aurora, ah, uh, grande sir, actually, we've already fallen into a loop. Heh, you've just learned the trick and you're already using it on me? Aurora was both angry and amused. I guess people need to be trustworthy at times. Lumian sighed silently. Can you at least listen to the story I made up first? Why don't you score me while we're at it? Aurora looked outside at the bright sky. That works too. Lumian began from the time he met Leah and the other outsiders. He spoke as if he had a general outline, claiming that he had maintained his consciousness in the dream and entered a unique ruin. Through hunting monsters, he obtained a beyonder characteristic and became a hunter. He didn't hide the matter about the thorn ring pattern that sealed his chest because it might involve the key to the time loop. He had seen the same symbol on the Padre, and killing the Padre had caused time to restart. At first, Aurora was still smiling, thinking that her brother had come up with a creative story. But as she listened, her expression turned serious. There was a lot of knowledge that Lumian shouldn't have known. When Lumian said that he had become a beyonder, Aurora raised her right hand and massaged her temples. Her light blue eyes instantly became deep, but there was no figure reflected in them. She looked at Lumian for a while and nodded slightly. Your ether body has undergone a huge change. Your life force and physical state are much stronger than ordinary people. Your astral projection has changed to a certain extent, but not much. As expected of a hunter who's better at hand-to-hand -hand combat than spellcasting. I can't see the symbol and the related changes, and I don't dare to look deeper. Aurora pouted and asked in confusion, Don't tell me you deliberately made up such a ridiculous story to make me accept your becoming a beyonder. This was a typical Lumian modus operandi. Lumian didn't explain and directly talked about the mysticism knowledge that the lady had imparted to him. Of course, he only briefly mentioned the name and did not elaborate. This was not because he was very moral and principled about not telling his sister before obtaining the lady's permission. Instead, the other party was clearly very powerful. If he leaked precious knowledge and angered her, the time loop might be resolved, but they would die. Indestructible Law Law of Convergence Acting Method Aurora was dumbfounded. Aurora was stunned that her illiterate brother in the field of mysticism had grasped such incomparably precious knowledge. It had been more than five years since she became a beyonder. At first, she had relied on Emperor Roselle's diary to join that organization. Her pathway was a symbol of knowledge in the field of mysticism. From time to time, she would be pursued by knowledge, allowing her to master the acting method, the law of beyonder characteristics indestructibility and the law of beyonder characteristics conservation, the three cornerstones of the beyonder world. 
Therefore, she thought of herself as a beyonder with insufficient experience but sufficient knowledge, miles ahead of most of her peers. Now, her brother, who had never come into contact with mysticism, could actually mention such terms. Furthermore, he knew about a law of convergence of beyonder characteristics that she didn't know about. This eliminated the possibility that Lumian had peeked at her witchcraft notebook. As a beyonder of the mystery prior pathway, Aurora suppressed her desire to know the specifics of the law of convergence as she looked at her brother. She asked in puzzlement, surprise, and worry, what did you pay for that lady to teach you this knowledge? The potion formula was even free of charge. She sized up Lumian again, from top to bottom, then from bottom to top, trying to find out what was missing from him. Nothing, Lumian laughed self-deprecatingly. That's why it's terrifying. I don't even know what price I'll have to pay in the future. Yes, I suspect that it has something to do with the symbol on my chest and the dream ruin. That lady probably wants me to unravel the corresponding secret. Aurora tersely acknowledged, continue. She waited for the rest of the story with a serious attitude. Lumian talked about the owl, the anomaly during Lent, and the siblings' experiences during the second cycle. He also talked about how the cycle would restart the moment they attempted to leave Cordu. Aurora listened carefully and muttered to herself in disbelief, either I've been hypnotized by you and told you everything, or time has really entered a loop. She began to believe Lumian because she had named her integrity brooch herself, and there was no record anywhere. Unless she told her brother herself, it was impossible for Lumian to know, and she had no impression of it. Lumian struck while the iron was hot. I can also prophesy that the three foreigners will appear at the old tavern at night. I can also prophesy that the Padre is having an affair with Madame Puales tonight. I can also prophesy that the shepherd, Pierre Barry, has returned to the village. There's something wrong with the three sheep he brought with him. The more Aurora listened, the more serious she became. After a while, she said, the three foreigners entered the village in the afternoon while we were practicing combat. After that, we rested and didn't go out at all. Yes, in the combat class in the afternoon, you were still an ordinary person. She accepted Lumian's time loop theory. If it were anyone else, Lumian would have laughed and said, You believed it. Ha! Ah, you believe such a ridiculous story. But in front of Aurora, he was very restrained. He then suggested, I'll go around the village now and see if I can gather more information. Aurora nodded. I'll also use my eyes to look around, but there are huge restrictions, and it's very dangerous. I'm not sure I'll gain anything. Lumian waved his hand, indicating that he understood, and walked out the door. As Lumian took a few steps, he looked back at Aurora's figure standing in the kitchen. He immediately thought of the scene of Aurora pushing him to safety among the countless undead and felt an inexplicable pain of separation. He subconsciously asked, Grande sir, why did you adopt me in the first place? Aurora grumpily replied, I didn't want to either. I was just kind enough to give you some food, but you kept following me. I couldn't shake you off, and you even obediently helped me do all kinds of things. My heart softened for a moment, and... Who knew that you would grow into this? Do you know how hard it was for a young girl to raise a child like you? Lumian wanted to thank and praise her, but the words were stuck in his mouth, as if they wanted to rush to his eyes and nose. He turned his head and walked back into the village. Chapter 44 Eavesdropping Lumian had to investigate, but he couldn't activate any abnormalities, causing the cycle to restart ahead of time. He had to consider starting from the peripheral problems and edge in one step at a time. His initial idea was to find the Padre's mistresses this afternoon and use eavesdropping and other methods to see if they knew anything. If he didn't gain anything or lack the opportunity for the time being, he would go to the cathedral to see if he could meet the Padre and chat with him about daily life in the village. Lumian's first target was Sybil Berry, the mistress of the Padre Guillaume Bennett and the sister of the shepherd, Pierre Berry. She had a close relationship with the two abnormal figures, so perhaps she knew something. Lumian's friend Guillaume Jr., Guillaume Barry, was a distant cousin of Pierre Barry. Even his hair color was different, 
and they didn't live together. Sybil Berry was 24 years old and married to Gene Morey, a middle-aged man in his late 40s. He had been single for more than 30 years. The reason why he could marry Sybil Berry was because he did not have any requirements for dowry. Lumian suspected that the reason why she married him using only a small amount of assets was that she had already become the Padre's mistress at that time and needed a husband to be her illegitimate son's father. The Padre had secretly promised something. Although Intus was open-minded, and illegitimate children were common, many husbands or wives were still willing to take their spouse's illegitimate children under their wing despite being angry when they found out. After all, this was equivalent to having an additional free manservant or maid in the future. Furthermore, they didn't have the right to inherit any of the assets, but clergymen of the Eternal Blazing Sun Church weren't allowed to get married and have children. They often found fathers for their illegitimate children. Lumian arrived at Jean Morey's house, a grayish white short house at the edge of Cordu with only one floor. Behind the kitchen was the bedroom, and the other side was connected to the basement, serving as a living room and dining room. There was no washroom, they only built a shed at the back of the house. Lumian entered without knocking, quietly coming to the side of the house and squatting under the bedroom window. At that moment, someone was sitting inside. Lumian could hear their breathing and determined their corresponding height. Not long after, light footsteps came from the kitchen to the bedroom. There was no need to calculate. As a hunter, Lumian naturally had the approximate weight of the owner of the footsteps in his mind. It was likely a woman, probably Sybil Berry. Lumian's impression of Sybil Berry was a woman with soft and smooth black hair who didn't like to tie it up like other women. She left it flowing down or tied it into a ponytail, giving off the feeling that she was still a young unmarried girl. Her facial features were not outstanding, but they were soft and round, very fleshy. At this moment, Jean Morey, who had been sitting silently in the bedroom, spoke gloomily. The Padre came this afternoon. His voice was just like him, rather stuffy. He was the kind of person who usually chatted under the elm tree in the village square, replying one in every four or five sentences. In addition, he was often too lazy to comb his black hair. His brown eyes were lifeless, and his beard was not shaved clean. He looked gloomy. He was here. Sybil Berry's voice was still a little girlish. She was born like this. Jean Morey fell silent for a moment before asking, Did you do it? We did, Sybil answered frankly. Jean Morey fell silent again. When Sybil walked to the kitchen, he said, I don't have much to say about the Padre, but you watch out for other men, especially Pato Russell. Pato Russell was Madonna Benet's husband. His wife was also the Padre's mistress. Lumian, who was outside the window, was secretly speechless. This relationship was really messed up. He gained a higher opinion of the Padre. He had come to Sybil Berry in the afternoon, and he was having a date with Madame Puales at night. He could be said to be a model worker in the field of cheating. If he could allocate more energy in this area to the church's matters and combine it with his scheming and machinations, he could have long advanced in clerical rank and become a beyonder. The clerical rank was the rank of a clergyman of the Church of the Eternal Blazing Sun. Starting from the first rank, it was ostiary, reader, chanter, acolyte, subdeacon, deacon, also known as a priest or padre, bishop, archbishop, and cardinal. The pope was not in the ranks of the clergy. Among them, the sixth rank and above made them senior clergymen. In Aurora's words, it was possible that they possessed superpowers. As for the lowest three ranks, they mainly handled cathedral chores and ritual support. In the past few centuries, they were only glorified titles and were not treated as true clergymen. The fourth-rank acolytes were usually students who had just graduated from the seminary. The fifth-rank subdeacon could represent a true priest to preside over a cathedral in a rural area. The situation in Cordu was the same. A fifth-rank subdeacon was the padre, a fourth-rank acolyte was the deputy padre, and they were staffed with a few servants. Guillaume Benet only needed to advance one more rank to become a true priest. I understand, Sybil Berry simply responded to her husband's exhortations. Jean Morey changed the topic. 
Is your brother Pierre back from hurting? Yes, there's an important ritual that requires his help, Sybil casually explained. A ritual? Lumian's eyelids twitched when he heard that. Jean Mori asked, the Lent festival? No, it's a ritual of God, Sybil impatiently replied. Don't ask too much. You'll know when the time comes. Jean Mori tersely acknowledged and said, Praise the sun. Sybil didn't respond and left the bedroom to walk into the kitchen. Lumian instantly made a judgment. Sybil had a certain understanding of the secret dealings between the Padre and Shepherd Pierre Barry, but her husband, Jean Mori, was completely unaware. The ritual she was talking about wasn't the sacrificial ceremony at the feast. It was likely related to Twelfth Night. Having gained something, Lumian left Mori's house and rushed to the two-story building where Pado Russell and Madonna Benet lived. Unlike Sybil, Madonna Benet was married off with her share of the inheritance. Pado Russell also received his share from his original home, so they could build a decent house and entrust more than twenty sheep to the shepherds for grazing. Lumian didn't know when Madonna became the Padre's mistress. He only knew that in the past year, before he hooked up with Madame Puales, the Padre often visited Madonna. Perhaps the taboo from his identity sparked some kind of flame. At this moment, Pado Russell, who had a gentleman's beard, was pacing in the kitchen. He asked Madonna, who was busy commanding the lady's maid, when will you invite the Padre over as a guest again? He had a fervent expression, hoping to cling to the person with real power in Cordu. Madonna glanced at Pado's father's illegitimate daughter, who was also the servant cooking, and said in a subtle tone, I don't know. It depends on his mood. In his physical condition, I suppose. Lumian, who was eavesdropping outside, silently muttered. Don't you often go to the cathedral to pray recently? You can ask him while you're at it, Pado Russell refused to give up. Often go to the cathedral? Lumian frowned. The Padre's group is planning something in secret in the cathedral? He really doesn't give a damn about the eternal blazing sun and Saint Sith. After listening for a while, Lumian walked from Russell's house to the cathedral at the edge of the village square, hoping to have a face-to-face -face chat with the Padre. However, when he arrived at the cathedral, Guillaume Benet was no longer there. Only the deputy Padre, Michel Garriga, stood in front of the altar. This foreigner from Dariche had graduated from Bigor Theological Seminary. Last year, he was sent to Cordu on the bishop's orders to be Guillaume Benet's deputy. He was usually ostracized and was only in charge of the registration of funerals, marriages, and newborns. During the last cycle, Lumian had arrived at the cathedral and happened to encounter the Padre leaving. The latter had asked him to pray the next day, not giving Michel a chance to listen to the prayers and confessions of the believers. Michel was taller than Lumian. Lumian felt that he had grown two to three centimeters taller after consuming the hunter potion. He was almost 1.8 meters tall. He was a young lad with curly brown hair. Looking at Michel Garriga, who was wearing a white robe with golden threads, Lumian spread his arms. Praise the sun! After bowing, he stared at Michel, wanting to see how this deputy padre would react to the Church of the Eternal Blazing Sun's etiquette. If there was a certain amount of hesitation, Lumian would be able to determine that he had been implicated by the Padre's group. But Michel Garriga immediately returned with the same posture. Praise the sun! He did not hesitate at all. His brown eyes were filled with joy and anticipation. From Madonna Benet's words, the Padre's group often discussed matters here. As a deputy Padre, Michel should have noticed something, right? Lumian didn't ask directly. He looked around and asked, The Padre isn't here? He's been gone for a while, Michel replied. Three foreigners came here about fifteen minutes ago, to no avail. The deputy Padre's eyes were passionate, as if he was asking if Lumian would make a confession while here. Considering that the Padre might have taken a detour and hid back in the cathedral, waiting for Madame Puales to bring dinner over and was eavesdropping on his conversation with Michel, Lumian deliberately sighed. Then forget it. I'll pray again tomorrow. Michel's eyes lost their luster. Lumian turned around and left the cathedral. 
he planned on sneaking to Michelle's residence when the night deepened to see if he could get any useful information. Seeing that the sun was about to set, he returned home and asked Aurora, Did you find anything? Aurora nodded slightly. In addition to the abnormalities you mentioned, I also discovered that there's something wrong with the deputy padre, Michel Garriga. Huh. Lumian didn't hide his surprise. Chapter 45 Makeup Lesson Lumian had just confirmed that Michel Garriga should not have been implicated by Guillaume Benet and the others. He planned to visit the deputy padre late at night, but when he returned home, he heard his sister say that there was something amiss about him. Aurora glanced at Lumian and smiled. My clueless brother was standing right in front of him when I realized that something was off about him. Seems like you didn't notice. She appeared quite delighted, to the point that she had to raise her right hand to cover her mouth. After all, her younger brother, who was clearly ignorant of mysticism, had suddenly become a beyonder. He had grasped a wealth of advanced knowledge and discovered that Cordu was stuck in a time loop. Not only had she been useless as a sister, but she also found herself outmatched in mysticism knowledge. This made her a tad unhappy. Now, she had finally regained her dignity as an elder sister. Lumian looked at his sister's smile and nodded. I didn't see anything unusual in his behavior. Aurora tersely acknowledged, his astral projection, how can I put it? Simply put, it's brighter than a normal person's, and he's not a beyonder. He hasn't been training his body systematically for a long time. Maybe he was born with a good physique? Lumian guessed before asking in puzzlement, what's an astral projection? Aurora asked in surprise, you don't know? No. Lumian shook his head. Aurora grinned again and said with a hint of disbelief, that woman taught you divine paths, the law of beyond her characteristics indestructibility, and the acting method, but she didn't tell you basic concepts like astral projection? She was in a hurry, so she only focused on the main points. Lumian defended the mysterious woman. Aurora smiled even more happily. Perhaps this basic mysticism knowledge is useless to unofficial hunters. You just need to track, set traps, and fight. She struggled to describe her brother's current state. To say he was ignorant of mysticism wasn't entirely accurate since he knew a great deal. The things he had learned were all formidable. To say that his knowledge surpassed most beyonders wasn't right either. He didn't even know what an astral projection was. Aurora sighed and said seriously, I can only complete your mysticism education. Remember, in mysticism, the external parts of the human body are divided into four levels. The innermost layer, which is also the core, is the soul body. It's almost equivalent to the concept of a spirit. It's the spirituality of everything, what gets strengthened. You could say it's the essence of building a soul. To a mystery prior, the potion mainly upgrades the soul body. The astral projection is located outside the soul body. It's the latter's manifestation in the real and spirit worlds. Moreover, it's closely related to your will and current emotions. So, do you understand? When I said the deputy padre's astral projection was brighter than a normal person's, I meant that his soul body or spirit had an issue. This is reflected in his astral projection. It has nothing to do with his natural physique. Of course, it could be because his spirituality is naturally strong. Through the astral projection, we can still grasp the target's true emotions. For example, red signifies passion and excitement. Orange represents warmth and satisfaction. Yellow indicates happiness and extroversion. Green conveys calmness and peace. Blue suggests coldness and introspection. White denotes brightness and eagerness to improve. Dark colors symbolize worry, sorrow, and silence. Purple implies that spirituality is taking control, coldness, and estrangement. It's very difficult to fake these colors, but they're relatively generic. It's impossible for us to distinguish subtle emotions and delicate feelings. Lumian listened attentively, as if he wanted to take out a fountain pen and jot everything down. Just listen. Aurora felt a little worn out from talking. She sat down at the dining table. 
I'll give you my first witchcraft notebook later. It's filled with such basic knowledge. All right, all right. Lumian sat down and nodded obediently. What's outside the astral projection? Aurora picked up her carved glass cup and took a sip. Beyond that is the body of heart and mind. From this point on, spirit and flesh merge. The body of heart and mind involves the mind. It relates to one's reasoning, thinking, insight, and ability to understand things. Some potions mainly improve this, but there are also many spells targeting it. The outermost layer is the ether body. It's a manifestation of life force and physical state, so I can tell at a glance that your body has improved greatly. Yes, through the thickness, brightness, and color of different parts of the ether body, I can also determine the target's health. As a Sequence 7 Mystery Prior, I can even determine the target's lifespan from the specific situation of the ether body. As for how to differentiate them, read the notebook later. Lumian was enlightened. The Hunter Potion mainly targets the ether body? You're wrong. It targets the body and life force, and ether body is the straightforward manifestation of both. Lumian nodded as he revised, gaining a preliminary understanding of such mysticism knowledge. He recalled his sister's words and asked curiously, Aurora, how did you observe the deputy padre? Why didn't I sense you nearby? Aurora smiled. Actually, I've been staying at home all this while, using the mystery prior pathway's special trait. What's special? Lumian asked with the mentality that it didn't matter if his sister didn't answer. Aurora pointed at her eyes. The most unique ability of a mystery prior is called the eyes of mystery prying. Although I need to reach a higher sequence before I can activate the complete eyes of mystery prying, allowing it to not only be of use to me, but it can also be placed on the surface of other objects to help me monitor matters remotely, this doesn't mean that Mystery Prior's eyes aren't special before this. From Sequence 9 onwards, a Mystery Prior has seen more than most Sequence Beyonders of the same pathway. The simplest example is that a hunter can only see an ether body before they undergo a qualitative change in their godhood. Furthermore, it's in a less detailed manner. And now, I can examine the various details of the astral projection. In addition, I can also see things around me that aren't normally visible. Aurora glanced at the kitchen. This made Lumian inexplicably shocked. There was clearly nothing in that direction, but he felt that there might be something invisible that he could not see. Aurora continued, of course, this might not be a good thing. It's very easy for something to happen when you see something you shouldn't see. Therefore, I've been restraining myself. I don't look at things I shouldn't see, but as my sequence increases, it's not up to you not to look. Lumian thought for a moment and asked in confusion, didn't you say that only higher sequences can project out the eyes of mystery prying? Why can you observe the people in the cathedral from home? Aurora raised her right hand and pointed with her index finger. I've always told you that knowledge equals power, but you didn't believe me. Under normal circumstances, it's true that I can't observe things hundreds of meters away from home, but humans can use tools, and I have two assistants. As she spoke, she took out two items from a hidden pocket in her blue dress. One was a brass telescope that could shrink and lengthen, and the other was a miniature version of a dark ink bottle, this was more like a child's toy. Look, the telescope can help me see people a few hundred meters away clearly. Once the visual range is closed, I can observe the target's astral projection, ether body, and body of heart and mind state, Aurora introduced with a smile. This is suitable for open spaces without obstacles. Lumian was a little dumbfounded. That works too? They were clearly discussing mysticism. Why did his sister take out a telescope? What about this? He pointed at the pocket ink bottle. Aurora didn't answer. She massaged her temples and opened the bottle cap. Lumian suddenly felt a little cold. A cool breeze seemed to blow in through the window. It's a unique spirit world creature, Aurora introduced. It? Where is it? Lumian looked around. Aurora was rather surprised. You still don't know how to activate spirit vision? But didn't you say you saw a lot of undead in the wilderness? 
Lumian had read about the term spirit vision and psychic and knew what it meant. However, he was completely at a loss as to how to activate spirit vision. He looked at his sister and slowly shook his head. I don't know. Then, he guessed, maybe ordinary people can see ghosts and undead directly when entering the so-called Permitha. Aurora thought seriously and asked, So, you don't know Hermes, ancient Hermes, Elvish, Dragonese, or Jotun? What are those? Lumian fully displayed what it meant to be illiterate in the field of mysticism. Aurora couldn't help but facepalm. What exactly did that lady teach you? Law of beyond her characteristics indestructibility, law of convergence, acting method, paths of the divine, sequence zero, sealed artifacts. Lumian answered honestly. Dot. Aurora felt like he was flaunting. I think you want a beating. She sighed for a few seconds before regaining her composure. Then I'll combine it with my contracted creature to teach you how to activate spirit vision, how to carry out ritualistic magic, and how to use language with supernatural powers. This is only a rough explanation. If you really want to completely master it, especially those few languages, it will take at least a year or two. Of course, this is also a problem with your sequence pathway. Hunters probably don't have their learning abilities improved, nor do they have any enhancements in mysticism. Back then, I relied on diligence and indoctrination to master all of them in less than half a year. Her right hand gently stroked the void in front of her, as if she was stroking a transparent kitten. It's very simple for Beyonders to activate their spirit vision, but it's not completely dark yet. Let's talk about something else first. I call it white paper. It's a very weak spirit world creature. As long as you have an accurate description, you can hold a ritual and summon it in your name. Other than the fact that spirit world creatures are difficult to see, it only has one use. That is to carry a certain supernatural ability of the contractor, but it can't be too complicated or too powerful. Chapter 46 Ritualistic Magic Lumian gazed at the invisible spirit world creature and contemplated for a moment. How complicated can it get? How strong can it be? Heh, I thought you'd ask how to summon or perform ritualistic magic, but you just want to know how to use it. Aurora teased. That might be a characteristic of the hunter pathway. You don't need to fully understand the principles, only consider how to apply them. Not waiting for Lumian's response, she pondered and said, I've tried. Not too complicated means it can only perform one action. Not too powerful means it can't surpass a mystery prior sequence 7 warlock spell. It's nice discussing this with Aurora. She has a habit of analyzing things both qualitatively and quantitatively, unlike someone who prefers vague descriptions. Lumian felt emotional hearing that. As he mulled it over, he stood up and helped his sister bring the food to the dining table. As they ate, he asked, but I remember your spells often require materials. You can't carry white paper, right? Yes, that's inconvenient. Aurora grabbed a piece of fried trout and stuffed it into her mouth. After chewing and swallowing, she said, moreover, a warlock's spells can't be completed in one move. Even the simplest has three steps. First is concentrating spirituality. The second is outlining the symbol of the corresponding spell in the mind. This can also be replaced by reciting the incantation aloud. The third is using materials to cast the spell. The materials serve either as a medium or part of the spell. This does sound a little complicated. It isn't something the single-celled white paper can do. Lumian knew he couldn't do it anytime soon. He'd need extensive training before he could cast spells proficiently. Aurora glanced at him. Don't even think about it. It's impossible for you to be like me. First, you're limited by your sequence, and your spirituality is insufficient. Second, using materials to help cast spells is a unique ability only warlocks have. Yes, perhaps certain sequences of certain pathways can do it. I don't know enough to make a definite judgment. However, once a hunter reaches sequence 7 and becomes a pyromaniac, they can use many fire-related spells. Furthermore, they don't need materials, 
nor do they need to outline symbols or recite incantations in their minds. In terms of actual combat, it's faster, more convenient, and might even be stronger. As for warlocks, their main advantage lies in their versatility. The more knowledge they acquire, the more comprehensive and powerful they become. Lumian said with anticipation, I don't know when I can become a pyromaniac. He planned to explore the dream ruins again tonight. Firstly, he wanted to use hunting to help digest the potion, and secondly, he wanted to find clues about the main ingredient of Sequence 8 Provoker. As for the corresponding monsters of the pyromaniac, he didn't dare think about them yet. He believed it would be like serving himself on a platter. After all, those creatures could definitely launch long-range attacks, rendering his special abilities useless. He then asked, can white paper withstand the pyromaniac's one-movement spells? Theoretically, yes, but I'm not sure if pyromaniac's spells exceed a certain level. Aurora's reference standard was warlock. Upon hearing this, Lumian became excited. If I could, wouldn't I be able to simulate the funnels one you mentioned? Huh. Aurora was puzzled. Lumian explained his idea in detail, I can summon a group of white papers and form a contract with them. Then, I can have each white paper carry a fireball. They'll float in the air and attack the target together. Isn't that similar to the description of the funnels? Unfortunately, you can't have a group of white papers at the same time, Aurora laughed. After you form a contract with a white paper, the next time you use the initial summoning description, the same white paper will appear. Can I summon one first and hold off on the contract? Then, I'll summon another until I have a satisfactory number before forming a contract? Lumian hadn't received a traditional education, but instead, a custom one that included Aurora's ideas. Combined with the refinement of years of pranks, he always had creative ideas. Dot. Aurora admitted she wasn't that cunning. She considered and said, I've never tried it before, so I don't know if it'll work. You can try it yourself when you're at sequence 7. However, I think having a white paper beside you while summoning others might cause a conflict. It's unlikely to succeed. The only hope is to directly summon multiple white papers, but there's a high chance that only sequences skilled at summoning can do it. Lumian decided to give it a try when the time came. After all, he had nothing to lose. Aurora scooped up some mashed potatoes. Now, let's talk about how to summon creatures from the spirit world. This is an application of ritualistic magic. Ritualistic magic is magic cast by selecting the date and time, preparing the corresponding materials, and strictly following the format and process. It's often used in prayers and summonings. Lumian nodded. It's to achieve a certain supernatural effect through a ritual? He thought of the various rituals of the Church of the Eternal Blazing Sun, as well as the process of the Lent celebration. Yes, Aurora was very satisfied with her brother's comprehension ability. To put it simply, ritualistic magic needs a target to pray to. It can be the seven orthodox gods, other hidden beings, or even evil gods or devils. It can even be you. When you pray to the orthodox gods, you need to check or choose the date and time they rule over. For example, Tuesday symbolizes the eternal blazing sun, and there is a corresponding sun hour every day. During these times, the probability of success will be greatly increased if you perform the ritualistic magic that targets the eternal blazing sun. However, this isn't very useful. Those who aren't official beyonders have a very low chance of successfully praying to the corresponding orthodox god. Even if you receive a response, don't be happy. This might mean that you have been noticed by that entity. Of course, we also have ways to bypass restrictions. For example, obtaining an item closely related to the target deity. There's no need to pick a date or time to pray to a hidden being or an evil god or devil, but I don't need to tell you how dangerous it is, right? 99% of people who do this don't end up well. Therefore, for wild beyonders, the most commonly used ritualistic magic is to pray to themselves to mobilize their spirituality to complete some relatively complicated tasks. Create charms and beyonder weapons? Lumian recalled the point of knowledge that the lady had mentioned. Aurora nodded. That's right. 
Some mystical medicines also require ritualistic magic. You also missed something. Summoning a creature from the spirit world. She ate some more food before saying, the second step of ritualistic magic is to prepare the corresponding ingredients. If you wish to pray to an existence, prepare herbs, essential oils, powders, extracts, and so on from their domain to please them. Let's use the eternal blazing sun as an example. If you pray to him, you can use sun essential oil, rosemary powder, Buddha's hand, and all kinds of sunflowers. As for praying to yourself, it won't be too troublesome. Although it's best to use the ingredients in your domain, someone like you can even put a cup of absinthe. It's fine even if you don't do so. The third step is to set up an altar. This can be determined by the environment. There's no need for a special holy solemnity. It's mainly because there can't be any miscellaneous items. The most important thing about the altar is the candles. Aurora picked up her knife and fork as she spoke. She stretched out the two items and said, pretend that they are candles. If you pray to a deity, make them with the corresponding symbolic materials. As an example, the eternal blazing sun has the inextinguishable light and the embodiment of order in his name. Out of caution, Aurora paused for a few seconds before continuing, God of deeds and guardian of businesses. There should be the honorific name Father of all life, right? Lumian asked, familiar with the preaching. Aurora shook her head. That's just a title used by the Eternal Blazing Sun Church when proselytizing. It's beyond him in mysticism. If it was really part of his name, it would mean something big had happened. She didn't give any more details, unsure herself. She brought the conversation back on track. Anyway, if you want to exorcise the undead, you have to pray to the symbol of inextinguishable light. So, you need to make candles out of different sunflowers. For contracts, use the honorific title of the God of Deeds to make candles with Buddha's hand and other materials. Check my witchcraft notebook for more options. In ritualistic magic, we can only place two candles at the spot corresponding to the deity. This is because in mysticism, zero represents the unknown or chaos. It symbolizes the state of the world before it was born. If we don't place the candles, it means that there won't be any effect. One represents a beginning, the first creator, it also accurately pinpoints a particular existence. Two represents the world and various divinities that were produced from the creator's body. Therefore, ritualistic magic can only have two candles to represent the deity. As for which candles to use, it depends on the desired effect. Three represent all things, so the third candle is for us. The two candles in the upper position represent the deity, and the candle in front is for myself, for a total of three candles. If you have an item related to a deity or a hidden existence, you can replace the two candles with that item for a dualistic ritual. If you pray to yourself, leave only the candle that represents yourself. Lumian listened attentively, realizing that as a wild hunter, he could only pray to himself in ritualistic magic before knowing the honorific name of the great existence. Where would he find items closely related to a deity? Let me show you the next few steps using summoning creatures from the spirit world, Aurora said, standing up as she saw her brother finish his dinner. They quickly cleared the dining table. Chapter 47 Truly Illiterate Aurora looked at the slightly stained white tablecloth and smiled at Lumian. If you're the target of ritualistic magic, it doesn't matter if the altar is dirty. But if you want to pray to a deity or a hidden existence, I suggest you change to a cleaner piece of cloth or remove the cloth and wipe the table. Anything works if I'm just praying to yourself, right? Lumian teased. Aurora chuckled. That refers to the environment, materials, and equipment, but the ritual process and incantations must strictly follow the rules of mysticism. She pulled out an orange candle from her pocket. This is a candle mixed with citrus and lavender. It has nothing to do with their domain, I just like it. Aurora waved the candle above the altar. Remember, the candle representing the deity is placed in these two places. It can be empty now. Then she placed the candle close to her. 
remember, this is the location of me. Next, Aurora brought a cup of water, a plate of coarse salt, and a small steel bowl from the kitchen. We need to create a clean and undisturbed ritual environment. Clean in the sense of spirituality. We have to construct it ourselves. Enter cogitation and focus your mind. You can guide the spiritual power out through supplementary items and build a wall of spirituality around the altar. Mystery priors and seers find this simple. Hunters need the help of other items before reaching sequence 7. For example, incense to calm your emotions and make you ethereal, or a crystal ball to help you focus on your spirituality. The meditation I taught you before is incomplete. It's only the first step. It can only gather your thoughts and calm you down. I'll teach you the rest later. Lumian was surprised. Why can I activate the dream's specialness and make the two symbols appear if the meditation method is incomplete? Aurora pulled out a silver dagger. Watch carefully how I build the wall of spirituality. Lumian was stunned and blurted out, Why do you have so many things on you? First, there were various casting materials, a retractable telescope, a miniature ink bottle that stored the spirit world creature, white paper, and candles for rituals. Now, she had taken out a dagger. Aurora sighed in exasperation. Do you think I want to? It's just inconvenient for warlocks. It takes me a long time to alter each of my clothes. Sometimes, I even feel like Doryman. I can take out whatever I want. What, Amon? Lumian asked, not understanding the reference. Aurora hesitated for a moment before replying with a mixed expression, You don't need to know. Lumian suddenly felt a pang of sadness for his sister. Aurora composed herself and reached for the orange candle representing her. In ritualistic magic, candles can't simply be lit. Of course, there are times when ordinary methods can work, but that's not always the case, Aurora explained. The correct way is to extend your spirituality, rub it against the wick, and light it. As she spoke, she lit the candle with a spark of spirituality, and it burned with an orange flame. The dining table transformed into an altar, and the surrounding area was bathed in a deep, otherworldly light. Aurora's light blue eyes had darkened, and an invisible wind swirled around her as she plunged the silver dagger into the coarse salt and began chanting a mysterious incantation. Triple X, Triple X. Dot. Lumian was bewildered as he watched his sister complete the incantation and draw out the silver dagger. She stabbed it into the cup of water and raised it again. Aurora pointed the dagger outward and began to walk around the altar. With each step she took, Lumian sensed an invisible force emanating from the dagger. It was agile and lively, mingling with the air to create an impenetrable barrier. As Aurora completed the circle, Lumian felt as if she had been transported to a different realm. Did you understand the steps? Aurora's voice sounded distant. Lumian nodded truthfully. Yes, but I don't understand what you mean. Aurora could not help but laugh. You're completely illiterate when it comes to mysticism. Literally. That's Hermes. When translated, it's, I sanctify you, blade of pure silver. I cleanse and purify you, allowing you to serve me in this ritual. In the name of Warlock Aurora Lee, you have been sanctified. Lumian scratched his head. It sounds ordinary. That's just the translation. The meaning of the incantation and the language used is what's important, Aurora explained, her eyes lighting up. In Intision, it might sound ordinary, but if you use Hermes, Ancient Hermes, Elvish, Dragonese, or Jotun, you can tap into supernatural powers. That's what sets them apart. Lumian asked curiously, are these the only languages that can communicate with the mysterious? No, there are many other languages in the field of mysticism, each with its own specialties. For example, some are specifically meant for the undead, but most beyonders won't be able to use them unless they want to study a unique and rare domain or perform the corresponding ritual, Aurora explained casually. She went on to explain the incantation. During the sanctification ritual, the penultimate sentence should be in the name of a certain deity or a hidden existence, but as wild beyonders, it's best not to use them to avoid unnecessary trouble. 
As a beyonder, it's enough to use your name to sanctify an ordinary item. Although it won't be as effective as the original version, it can still be used. Lumian nodded, then asked, You came up with my name. Can I use it in the ritual? Aurora replied confidently, Yes. A completely new name wouldn't work, but your name has been in use for several years, so there's a mystic connection. She paused for a moment before continuing, If you're in the wild and don't have many materials, you can complete the ritual with simple salt or clear water. With that, Aurora pulled out a small silver black metal bottle from her pocket. This is my own concoction of essential oil called Wizard of Oz. What sets it apart is that it smells good, Aurora explained as she dripped three drops of light green liquid on the candle representing her. The light of the candle flickered and sizzled, and a faint mist spread out, giving Aurora and the altar an air of mystique. Now for the important part, Aurora said, pulling a small imitation goatskin from her pocket. If you're holding a ritualistic magic that prays to a deity, you need to draw the symbol of what you want on the paper and burn it during the ritual. The first part is a prayer for someone's power. This someone needs to be replaced by the symbol of a deity, an honorific name, or a domain ruled over by them. For example, I pray for the power of the sun or the power of order. Remember, there are always two sentences that correspond to the two candles that represent the deity. The second part is I pray for the God's loving grace. Remember, don't call him by his name. Doing so in a ritual is sacrilegious. The eternal blazing sun can be referred to as God or Father. The third part is what you want to pray for. You must be brief and finish it in one sentence. The fourth part is to give more power to the incantation. For example, sunflower, a herb that belongs to the sun. Please bestow your powers to my incantation. You can choose two to three types based on the materials used. After reciting the incantation, drip a drop of essential oil on each candle and burn the piece of paper that was used to draw the symbol. After the paper is burned, the ritual comes to an end. Then, thank the deity and extinguish the candles in the order of me, followed by God, right to left. Dispel the wall of spirituality. Oh and remember to light the candles from left to right, beginning with God followed by me. Lumian nodded twice in acknowledgement before asking, What about praying to yourself? Aurora chuckled before explaining, The incantation is even simpler. I'll use summoning spirit world creatures as an example. For the first part, there's only one word, I. Remember, you can't use modern Hermes here. It has to be ancient Hermes, Elvish, Dragonese. Or Jotun. The second part is I summon in my name, which can be said in modern Hermes. The third part is the exact description of the summoned spirit world creature. Lumian was curious. What's an exact description? Aurora explained solemnly, it needs to be limited to three lines to help us lock onto the creature we want to summon. For instance, if someone said they were looking for the prankster of Corda Village, Aurora Lee's idiot brother, and a regular customer of Old Tavern, we know exactly who they're looking for because of the specific characteristics given. I get it. Lumian was enlightened. So, if we don't know the target's name, appearance, or address, we can use their characteristics to help find them. Aurora said seriously, that's the principle, but there are many problems when put into practice. For example, when summoning creatures from the spirit world, the first sentence is often fixed. It's either the spirit that wanders about the unfounded or spirit wandering above the world. Its function is to point to the spirit world and clearly state that we want to summon a spirit. The second sentence is also very universal. We don't summon spirit world creatures to harm ourselves, so we must restrict it to friendly creatures. Sometimes, we also add the word weak. This is because some spirit world creatures may be very friendly, but their existence can bring great danger. Considering these circumstances, the description is fixed. The friendly creature that can be subordinated, the friendly creature that can be consulted, the weak creature that can be subordinated, and so on. But based on these two descriptions, the direction is still very broad. It doesn't reflect our needs. Therefore, the third description is very important. You need to use a sentence to clearly explain what creature you want to summon. 
sounds very difficult. Lumian felt a headache just thinking about it. Aurora nodded. Not only is it difficult, but it's also dangerous. When the direction is vague, it might summon a spirit you don't need or a creature that brings danger. Remember, being weak doesn't mean it can't kill you, just like being friendly doesn't mean it won't pose a threat to you. Chapter 48 Knowledge Pursuer Lumian deeply understood Aurora's words. As a vagrant, he knew better than to underestimate anyone. Some adult vagrants suffered massive losses because they looked down on him and assumed him to be weak. As for some almsgivers, they provided food out of kindness but forgot to consider the starving bodies of the vagrants, causing them to make the wrong decisions. After a moment of serious thought, Lumian said, it seems like the description of a creature that can be summoned with relative precision is very valuable. Aurora nodded solemnly. That's right. A notebook that records the corresponding summoning incantations is very precious. Every incantation and commentary on it is exchanged with life, blood, or pain. For example, when I summon white paper, the three lines described it as the spirit that wanders about the unfounded, the friendly creature that can be subordinated, the weak ball that can telepathically connect with me. You have to make countless attempts and experience countless failures before you can piece one together. And every failure implies a huge risk. Is this a description that a normal person can come up with? In particular, the words weak and ball. As Lumian criticized inwardly, he asked, So, you bought this from someone else? No. Aurora shook her head and said with a bitter expression, The mystery prior pathway is different from other pathways. From time to time, it will be chased by a large amount of knowledge. It's impossible to ignore, and there's no way to reject it even if one can't handle it. And when one consumes a potion to advance, the situation of being chased by knowledge becomes even more serious. Although most of this knowledge is useless, there will always be some that are valuable. The incantation to summon white paper was one of them. Lumian understood. Indoctrination from the Hidden Sage? Aurora looked at him in surprise. You know that? Did that lady teach you? Yeah. Lumian nodded. Aurora pursed her lips, lost in thought. From my personal experience, knowledge pursuit isn't limited to the Hidden Sage's indoctrination. My so-called ear ringing does indeed hear his voice, where I gain knowledge, but it always puts me in pain. My head is close to exploding, and I wish I could lose control. But occasionally, especially when I'm not in the best state and am about to lose control, I have an illusion that all the knowledge in the world has come to life. A small number of them will chase after me and rush towards me, but I can't dodge them. This is how the summoning incantation for white paper barged into my brain. When consuming the potion, 99% of the knowledge pursuit comes from the hidden sage. 1% is related to revived knowledge. It's very magical and terrifying. It can scare everyone in the village. As Lumian sighed with emotion, he was thinking for his sister about whether there was a way to resolve the problem of knowledge pursuit or reduce its impact. Aurora replied with a bitter smile, It's precisely because I often suffer such torture that I don't want you to follow the path of beyonders. But in our current situation, it's better to become a beyonder than an ordinary person. To make her brother remember the madness and danger of the path to transcendence, she pointed at her head. After being pursued by knowledge and experiencing pain for a long time, I feel that my mind and personality have undergone a certain mutation. Don't I always tell you that I have a phobia for social interaction, but I am very talkative sometimes? I like to go out and chat with the old ladies in the village and tell stories to the children. Occasionally, I will go crazy and borrow Madame Puales's pony to ride free into the mountains and shout. Being especially talkative is a kind of rebound from prolonged isolation and being unable to return to my true home. The path to transcendence is also a form of oppression. And the occasional madness. At this point, Aurora chuckled and looked at Lumian. You don't think that's just an exaggerated adjective, do you? Lumian fell silent, feeling his sister's smile was self-deprecating, lost, and filled with indescribable pain and struggle. Aurora sighed. During those times, I wouldn't even recognize myself. 
Lumian felt deeply helpless. There should be a solution. Hopefully, let's continue, Aurora said, pointing at the altar. After we sign a contract with the summoned spirit world creature, it'll be easy to summon it again. We can change the last description to contracted creature that belongs to Aurora Lee. That will be very accurate, right? Besides, before the contract is terminated, no one can summon it again. Lumian was concerned. Everyone can only have one contracted creature? Not really. I'm not sure how high the upper limit is, but it's definitely more than one, especially with some special sequences. When summoning, say the first contract creature or second contract creature of the person to differentiate. Aurora spoke the truth. In addition, summoning creatures from the spirit world will consume your spirituality. The more you summon, the greater the consumption. With a hunter's spirituality, I estimate that it can only withstand one contract creature at most. Knowing her brother's personality, she curbed any loopholes that Lumian might find. Every spirit world creature can only stay for a limited period of time after being summoned to reality. The weaker they are, the longer they can stay. You don't have to think about summoning one first. You can summon the next one after your spirituality recovers, unless you choose a very weak one. And only when your spirituality is significantly stronger than it is now. She used white paper as an example. If I didn't let white paper be a vessel for my powers, it could stay in reality for 12 hours. If I share the specialness of my eyes with it and let it do things for me, it can last at most three hours, and my spirituality would be constantly depleted. Lumian was disappointed. He had wanted to form an army of spirit world creatures. He thought for a moment and asked, Can I only summon creatures from the spirit world? Can I only summon spirits? No, Aurora shook her head. We can also summon creatures affiliated with the spirit world, the real world, and the astral world, as well as creatures from alternate worlds or other planets. Regardless of whether they are spirits or not, this is very dangerous. Most of the Beyonders who have attempted this have died tragically, and a small number have mysteriously disappeared. Only the corresponding notebooks were left behind to prove what they had done. Lumian asked curiously, Can I summon something from the real world? Aurora pondered for a moment before responding, In theory, as long as the other party has a close relationship with the spirit world or has reached a certain level, they should be able to hear the summoning and decide if they want to respond. However, such a target is either very special or very powerful. If you want to live well, don't try it. Furthermore, when the summoning target isn't a spirit, the requirements for the corresponding ritual will be even higher. It will require more spirituality, and it might even require a large number of sacrifices. Only then can we open the door of summoning that can be used by non-spiritual creatures. You can barely summon white paper with a hunter's spirituality. If you want to try something more powerful, you can only pray to a deity or a hidden existence. For this, you might have to prepare something filled with spirituality as a sacrifice. Lumian roughly understood the ritualistic magic of summoning. So next, you are going to recite an incantation and complete the summoning? How is that possible? Aurora scoffed. The ritual has been interrupted so many times. How can we continue? In fact, normally, as long as we follow the process, we can resume from any breaks. However, I was mainly explaining and didn't divert my attention to do the corresponding things. You probably forgot. Lumian muttered inwardly but didn't dare say it out loud. Aurora then said, however, I do want to hold a summoning ritual. On the one hand, I want to give you a complete demonstration of the entire process. On the other hand, I want to seek help. Seek help? Lumian asked in puzzlement. Summoning powerful spirit world creatures to help? Aurora explained, among the countless spirit world creatures, only a very small number of them can act as messengers. Private messengers, ah, uh, messengers can be summoned by others based on special contracts. For example, if I have a contracted messenger, someone in Trier can summon it and give it a written letter. It will immediately pass through the spirit world and deliver the letter to me. 
Due to the special connection between the spirit world and the contract, it only takes a second or two to complete the letter delivery. Lumian sighed from the bottom of his heart. Very impressive. It's as fast as sending a telegram. But the thought that crossed his mind was, I want one too. Don't even think about it, Aurora read his mind. It's very difficult to summon a messenger. Unless you obtain an exact incantation, it's unlikely that you can succeed trying yourself. And only a few special sequences can grasp an exact incantation. Even I don't have one. Lumian was disappointed and asked, Are you going to summon a messenger and write a letter to them for help? Yes, Aurora nodded. She's one of the few among us who have gone the furthest on the path to transcendence. She has her own messenger. I don't expect her to save me, but she should be able to give me some advice. I'm afraid it's very difficult. That mysterious lady said that we can only rely on ourselves. Lumian asked curiously, Us? You mean your pen pals? Aurora nodded and asked in confusion, When did I ever mention pen pals to you? Last cycle, no, last last cycle, Lumian answered honestly. All right, Aurora facepalmed. Actually, it's a mutual support organization slowly established by those of us who can't return home. We rely on letters to communicate daily, share knowledge, and solve problems. There will be small-scale gatherings or communication through messengers. She's the vice president of our organization and one of the initiators. Her code name is Hila Dot. Code name? Lumian was a little puzzled. Aurora tersely acknowledged, in the organization, everyone uses code names without exposing their real names. When they write letters, they emphasize that it's a pseudonym to avoid being discovered by the officials. What's your code name? Lumian was very curious. Aurora was silent for a moment before she replied with a sigh, Muggle. What does it mean? Lumian was puzzled. Aurora's eyes darkened as she replied, ordinary person without superpowers. Lumian knew that his sister wanted to become an ordinary person living back home more, so he quickly changed the topic. What's the name of your organization? Aurora's expression became complicated. Originally, everyone wanted to give it a classy name, but considering that we would write letters every day, a name that was too conspicuous would attract the attention of certain forces. Therefore, in the end, we decided on a name that sounds like a group of animal lovers. What is it? Lumian pressed. Aurora replied in embarrassment, the curly-haired baboon's research society. Chapter 49, True Cogitation Lumian couldn't help but suppress his laughter at the name of the curly-haired baboon's research society, but he managed to hold it in. But even if he held it in, he couldn't help but say, those who know will understand that you're studying curly-haired baboons. Those who don't know will think that a group of curly-haired baboons are doing research. Of course, he was only joking. Aurora rolled her eyes at him. We often tease ourselves as a group of curly-haired baboons being studied. Seeing that his sister was in a better mood, Lumian asked, are all the members of your research society beyonders? Not all of them, Aurora answered briefly. But some gatherings can't be attended by ordinary people. She didn't say why they couldn't participate. Who's the president? How many vice presidents are there? Lumian asked. Are you doing a census? Aurora snapped back. Huh? Lumian was confused. Lumian was confused and realized that Aurora didn't like him asking too many questions about the curly-haired baboon's research society. Aurora pouted and exhaled. The president's code name is Gandalf. There are a total of five vice presidents. All right, I'm going to summon Gila's messenger. Lumian was puzzled and asked, Aurora, ah, uh, grande sir, didn't you say that you only know the code name Gila and don't know her exact name? How are you going to summon her messenger? He remembered that his sister had just mentioned that by changing the last sentence of the summoning incantation to the messenger that belongs to so and so, he could very accurately pinpoint the target creature. However, she didn't know who so and so was. Excellent, Aurora praised him and said, to be able to discover the problem is an excellent learning quality. Let's put it this way. 
It doesn't matter what name you use when you sign a contract with a spirit world creature. The contract will automatically extract a bit of your true aura from you, allowing the two parties to be related. However, remember, you can only use the name written when you sign the contract in the future. Changing it to your real name will be ineffective. Lumian pondered seriously and said, got it. The key is the aura and connection. The name when signing the contract is only equivalent to the incantation used for the subsequent summoning. It doesn't matter what you write. Yes. Aurora nodded. Lumian suddenly laughed. Is there such a situation? Let me say hypothetically. Grande sir, you obtained an exact incantation and summoned a messenger. You signed a contract with it in the name of Aurora Lee. After that, you taught me that incantation because you loved your younger brother, which is me. As for me, I successfully summoned another messenger. However, when signing the contract, I used Aurora Lee's name to sign it for fun. Then the question is, which one will be summoned with the description of the messenger that belongs to Aurora Lee? Aurora's face turned livid. I don't have a messenger. How would I know? She exhaled and calmed herself down. This is actually a confusion caused by having the same name. Compared to ordinary contracted creatures that can only be summoned by oneself, it's indeed easy for a messenger that can be summoned by others to have such problems. However, because I don't have a messenger, I'm not sure if there's a special mechanism to avoid such mistakes. I can only use my knowledge to attempt an analysis. First, very few people have a messenger. The probability of having the same name is so low that it's almost negligible. Second, if there's an overlap in names, you can place an item with the messenger's owner's aura in the summoning ritual and use it to accurately lock onto them. Third, if you're really afraid of having the same name, you can make your name longer when signing a contract. For example, Lumian Torres Ari Lano's Arthur German Sparrow Lee. That way, you probably won't have the same name. But it's very likely that I'll forget this name after signing the contract. It's too difficult to remember, Lumian muttered. Also, why did you add the name of the pirate hunter and great adventurer? Because I like it. Madame Force Wall's adventurer series is a classic, Aurora said confidently. She turned around and tidied up the altar, preparing to officially hold the summoning ritual. At that moment, Lumian thought of something and shouted, Wait a minute. What's wrong? Aurora turned around, looking confused. Lumian asked seriously, Does the messenger count as an outsider? Dot. Aurora was confused at first, but quickly figured out the problem. She deliberated and asked, You mean that as an outsider, the messenger will fall into a cycle after coming to Cordu and won't be able to leave? Without waiting for Lumian's reply, Aurora came up with a new theory. No, the situation will be worse. It's a contracted creature. After receiving the letter, it will immediately go to Gila. It's equivalent to leaving Cordu. That will cause a restart. After that, it will instinctively attempt to leave again and again, while we restart again and again. We won't have time to investigate the key to the loop. Lumian couldn't help but imagine the scene his sister had described. Just as he opened his eyes to see his familiar bedroom, he would open his eyes again to see the familiar bedroom. Only to open his eyes again to see the familiar bedroom. He would repeat this action countless times, and the root cause of this was that a certain messenger was in a hurry to go home. Aurora raised her hand to cover her forehead. I can't even imagine what kind of changes will happen then. After sighing, she analyzed seriously, from the current situation, the departure of living things from Cordu and the surrounding area will cause the loop to restart, and inanimate objects won't trigger the restrictions. The telegram and the letter that were sent are proof. If that's the case, spirits definitely won't do either. From the looks of it, I can't summon the messenger. Lumian suddenly figured out why the lever blue could maintain its state of having its words cut out. The piece together notes had left Cordu, making it no longer affected. Since it couldn't return, it naturally couldn't return to its original state. He shared his speculation with his sister and asked, The problem with Lever Blue has been solved, but how did that letter get sent? There's definitely no way to send it out during the loop. 
The moment the messenger leaves Cordu, it will cause a reboot. And if it's before the loop, I have no impression of it. What about you? Neither do I, Aurora thought for a few seconds before jokingly scolding, you idiot, you almost led me astray. It's easy to send the letter in a loop. Lumian looked at his smart sister and asked, huh? Aurora chuckled before explaining, there's no need for a postman to send the letter, nor is there a need to hire a messenger. When we discover an abnormality and don't want to alarm those who might be problematic, the best choice is to find a wooden box and place the distress letter inside. After sealing it, we will throw the wooden box into the river outside the village and let it float downstream naturally. When the other villages and even the people of Darij pick it up, they will help us deliver it to the officials. You said that our last cycle confirmed that the loop contains a small portion of the river that can be reached. That's right. Lumian exclaimed, pressing his palms together. He thought of another question. Will the fish in the river cause a reboot? I don't think so, Aurora replied after thinking for a moment. These creatures without any intelligence are very sensitive to invisible restrictions. Or rather, they're more prone to invisible influences. There's a high chance that they'll instinctively stay away from places that might cause a reboot. What about your white paper? It has no choice but to leave the real world after 12 hours. Lumian felt that this would also restart the cycle. Aurora looked around and said thoughtfully, I suspect that the loop not only includes Kordu and the surrounding mountainous areas but also the area that corresponds to everyone here in the spirit world. You probably don't know that there are actually more natural interactions between the spirit world and reality. If you don't include the corresponding spirit world, it might restart every now and then, but the current situation is clearly different. As my contracted creature, white paper has a direct connection with Kordu. The spirit world at Rome's is most likely included. I still don't know enough about mysticism. Lumian didn't ask further. Aurora demonstrated the ritualistic magic process again and dispelled the wall of spirituality. In the formless wind that suddenly blew, she said to Lumian, It's already dark. I'll teach you true cogitation and the way to activate spirit vision. Okay. Lumian replied, showing that he had his sister's full attention. Aurora explained, You've long grasped the first half of cogitation. Let's start from the second half. When you imagine the sun, retract your spirit and enter a relatively calm state. Let your mind be slightly empty. Draw an outline of something that doesn't exist in reality to replace the sun. Keep drawing and repeating until your body and mind obtain peace. Your thoughts will have a feeling that they are floating. Lumian didn't quite understand. Something that doesn't exist in reality? Aurora took out a pen and paper and drew a few strokes. Look, is there anything like this in reality? The paper had something very abstract on it, like a ball with eyes and a cross on its face. Doesn't it exist once you draw it? This drawing is in reality. Lumian felt that her sister's explanation was wrong. Pictures and imaginations aren't real. Aurora rolled her eyes. As her younger brother's teacher, she had to suffer this kind of anger often. Lumian acknowledged her comment tersely. Then I'll try using this picture of yours. He pulled up a chair and sat down. He leaned back and focused. The crimson sun quickly outlined itself in his mind, gradually calming him down. After a while, because he was in reality, he did not hear the terrifying and mysterious voice. He could calmly use the pattern that his sister had casually drawn to replace the sun in cogitation. The ball with eyes and a cross quickly appeared in Lumian's mind. As Lumian repeatedly outlined it, his body and heart became more and more peaceful, and his thoughts gradually felt ethereal. He saw that there was a faint gray fog around him. There were many indescribable, non-existent things, and dense colored blocks mixed together. And high in the sky, perhaps deep in the depths, there was a clear light. There's no hurry. The probability of a hunter succeeding in cogitation on their first try is very low, Aurora consoled her brother. Just as Lumian was about to report to his sister that he had successfully entered a cogitation state, he suddenly felt something watching him from the depths of the gray fog in an infinite height. This seemed to be an illusion, 
but it made him break out in a cold sweat. He felt an inexplicable fear and immediately left the cogitation state. Chapter 50 Observation Aurora had intended to reassure him that non spellcasting sequences usually took several attempts at cogitation to succeed. Some even had to practice for five or six days, or even more than half a month. However, when she saw her brother open his eyes, she noticed that Lomian's forehead was drenched in cold sweat, and fear was evident in his eyes. What's wrong? Aurora asked, concerned. Lumian took a couple of deep breaths. The more he thought about it, the more frightened he became. I successfully cogitated. My mind seemed to float, surrounded by a myriad of colors and an indescribable faint gray fog. There were a few particularly bright and pure beams of light up above. No, it might not have been the sky. It could have been far away. I can't be certain. From your description, it seems like you succeeded, Aurora explained. What your astral projection sees or senses is the spirit world. There, many concepts of reality either don't exist or are intertwined. That's why you feel like you're high in the sky yet far away at the same time. Those seven lights are the seven lights of the spirit world, mentioned in ancient texts. They're believed to be near deity level and omniscient. Moreover, they're considered relatively friendly hidden entities. If you can grasp their complete honorific names, you can pray to them. Unfortunately, I don't know them either. Those indescribable things that roam everywhere belong to the spirit world, but you didn't seem to see much, nor did you perceive them clearly. This is likely a limitation of the hunter sequence. Your spirituality isn't high enough. Hmm, activating spirit vision later will probably prove difficult. The final effect certainly won't be impressive. Still, it's better than nothing. She had been monitoring her brother's condition, ready to intervene and assist him at any moment. Seeing Lumian gradually return to normal, she finished what she needed to say in one breath and asked, But what you saw shouldn't have scared you. Aren't you known as Bold Lumian? Lately, you've experienced a time loop, people turning into sheep, men giving birth, and Madam Knight's patrols. How can ordinary spirit world creatures frighten you? Lumian's forehead veins twitched at his sister's words. He didn't want to recall anything, especially anything related to Madame Puali's. He exhaled and said, I sensed something deep within the spirit world, or rather, extremely high up, observing me. Just being watched by it terrifies me. I couldn't help but exit the cogitation state. Aurora's eyelashes flickered as she thoughtfully said, I suspect that it has something to do with the two strange symbols on your chest you mentioned. They involve some hidden entity. They might point to the source of Korda's loop, or they might represent the special trait that allows you to maintain your clarity and strength in the dream and the loop. As a hunter, you succeeded in complete cogitation on your first attempt. It's highly likely that the two symbols influence this. Lumian nodded as he listened, agreeing with his sister. This realization left him somewhat disheartened. In that case, I can't cogitate. As soon as I succeed, I'll be watched and forced to leave that state. Besides, I don't think being constantly monitored is a good thing. Do you think you aren't being watched now? Aurora couldn't help but laugh. It's just that you can't sense it without being in a state of cogitation. Since there's no way to evade it and you're bound to suffer damage, it's better to make more attempts to increase your resistance, allowing you to spend more time in cogitation. In the future, when facing certain situations, this might give you an edge. Of course, before becoming a Sequence 7 pyromaniac, hunters don't need deep cogitation. It's best to wait for your spirituality to improve before trying again. Why does that sound a bit depressing? Lumian had already composed himself and mocked his predicament. Since I can't resist, I might as well enjoy it. Aurora scoffed. In our current situation, I'd rather have a unique trait like yours. Even if it means facing numerous unknown dangers and challenges, at least I can retain my memory during the next cycle. I wouldn't need you to remind me, sparing many details. She then looked out the darkened window. It's time to teach you how to activate spirit vision. Keep sitting and attempt cogitation again. 
you don't have to enter a state where your thoughts are floating. Although that would be more conducive to activating your spirit vision, aren't there hidden entities watching you? Yeah. Lumian leaned back in his chair, relaxing his body. He first envisioned the sun in his mind, then swapped it out for the ball his sister had sketched haphazardly. He didn't repeat the outlining process, stopping only when his body and mind were serene. Aurora monitored his condition, offering a soothing voice. Lift your hands in your current state and place them in front of your eyes. You can open your eyes now. Lumian kept his cool as he slowly opened his eyes. At some point, his sister had snuffed out the kerosene lamp, casting the first floor into darkness. The crimson moonlight outside the window was the only thing illuminating the outlines of objects. Once his eyes adjusted, he could barely see his hands. Point your index fingers at each other without touching. Then, concentrate on the back of your hand, which can be the back of the opposite point, Aurora instructed. After completing this step, slowly move your fingers to keep them facing each other without touching. And remember, they can't leave your sight. Lumian followed her guidance, focusing his gaze on the empty space beyond his hands as he moved his fingers. Despite repeating the process countless times, he saw no changes. Soon after, he couldn't sustain the cogitation state and snapped out of it. See anything? Aurora asked. Lumian shook his head. It's harder for hunters. Don't stress. If it doesn't work now, it'll work later. If it doesn't happen today, it might happen tomorrow, Aurora consoled. Don't fret. Regular folks with high spirituality can activate their spirit vision after professional training, let alone beyonders. But the results vary. If this loop fails, I can try again next time, but if that doesn't work, there may not be another chance. Lumian thought to himself. He was patient and resilient. After resting and regaining some strength, he tried again. After multiple attempts, he finally saw a fiery red dot emerge from the void between his index fingers. Success. Lumian was thrilled. He turned to his sister. But then he saw a red light radiating from Aurora's body, encompassing it entirely. Didn't you say you could see the different colors of the ether body? Lumian asked, confused. Aurora asked excitedly, did it work? Lumian nodded and recounted his experience. It's a success, Aurora breathed a sigh of relief. You're impressive. It's probably due to your special enhancement. Other hunters would need at least two weeks of practice, and some might have to reach sequence eight before they can activate their spirit vision easily. You can only see a vague ether body. The red color means I'm healthy. You won't be able to see much else with your soul body's current strength as a hunter. She pulled out a tiny ink bottle and unscrewed the cap. Let's see if you can see white paper. Lumian focused and saw a transparent bubble emerge from the bottle. It was similar to the bubbles he made while blowing soapy water, about the size of a fist and tinted red by the moonlight. He could barely keep track of it and feared losing sight if he blinked. The bubble floated towards Aurora's palm, which she scratched with her thumb, causing it to contract and expand. Lumian composed himself and reported what he saw to his sister. It's blurry. Aurora shook her head. A hunter's spirit vision is limited. You can only perceive basic ether body concepts and creatures like white paper. Most things are invisible. It's better than nothing, Lumian replied with what his sister had just said. Having never experienced a stronger spirit vision, he was rather content with his current situation. Aurora instructed Lumian to use cogitation to stop his spirit vision from deactivating and to establish simple activation and deactivation triggers. Lumian practiced repeatedly until he mastered the method but never succeeded in the express key Aurora mentioned. He only vaguely understood the concept. Take a break. We'll monitor the deputy padre later for any anomalies, Aurora advised, noticing Lumian's pale face from depleted spirituality. She urged him to rest. They ascended to the second floor and lit the lamp in the study. Lumian dozed off in a recliner while Aurora read, waiting for night to deepen. 
Lumian quickly fell asleep in the recliner, while Aurora casually read her book, waiting for the night to get deeper. Lumian eventually fell asleep and forced himself to remain sleeping instead of exploring the dream world. Aurora woke him up shortly after. We can observe the deputy padre now. Okay. Lumian sat up and faced his sister. Aurora opened a miniature ink bottle and stroked white paper with her right hand, her eyes darkening. With the aid of the contract, she recited in Hermes, My contracted creature, bear the uniqueness of my eyes. Lumian couldn't understand or see anything without his spirit vision. He waited patiently. In mere seconds, Aurora withdrew her hand and sat down. White paper is on its way to the deputy padre's house. Lumian inspected the scene and noticed that his sister's eyes reflected trees swaying in the dark, not the study or himself. The trees were left behind swiftly. That's what white paper sees. Lumian realized. Aurora took out a mirror coated in mercury and sprinkled it with light white powder. The powder quickly bloomed with light, covering the mirror with an aqueous layer. In the water, the deputy padre, Michel Garriga, appeared. White paper had reached the target's room and peered through a glass window. Michel Garriga slept soundly, his eyes closed and breathing steady. Aurora and Lumian waited patiently, observing from all angles with white paper. Suddenly, Michel opened his mouth slightly, and a blurry, transparent figure emerged. It was a lizard-like thing.